Entertainer Dolly Parton talks about literacy issues. At about 7.40 a.m., a hearing on the fiscal year 2001 budget for the National Endowment for the Humanities. Tomorrow morning on our companion network, C-SPAN, a Senate hearing on oil prices and the Clinton administration's response to rising energy costs. You can see live coverage beginning at 10 Eastern. Next, a hearing into subpoenaed White House email. A House panel is investigating the discovery of email, which had not been archived as required by law, and then provided to investigators looking into White House matters. The House Government Reform Committee, led by Indiana Congressman Dan Burton, heard today from employees of Northrop Grumman, who managed the White House email system. Also testifying, the director of the White House Office of Management and Administration. It's seven and a half hours. This portion runs one hour and 50 minutes. Good morning, a quorum being present. The Committee on Government Reform will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses written opens, opening statements be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that a set of documents which may be used as exhibits in today's hearings, which have been shared with the minority staff, be included in the record. Reserving the right to object. General will state his reservation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we're not going to object to this, but I understand that the staffs are still going through these documents to be sure that uh, there are the redactions that uh, um, are going to be important for uh, uh, privacy reasons. So if, uh, if the gentleman would permit, I'd like to ask if he would uh, amend his unanimous consent request to have these documents released after the staffs have had an opportunity to review them for redaction purposes. What's that? I, I think that that's in order and without objection, we will adhere to that. In fact, I think we have after being reviewed for redactions is in the, in the statement. So, but yes, there's no, obje without objection, so ordered. I also, I also ask unanimous consent that questioning in this matter proceed under clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14, in which the Chairman and Ranking Minority Members allocate time to members of the committee as they deem appropriate for extended questioning not to exceed 60 minutes, equally divided between the majority and the minority, and without objection, so ordered. Today, we are meeting to hear testimony about the White House's failure to produce documents to the committee. As I'm sure everyone understands by now, there was a computer glitch, an error. As a result, incoming emails at the White House weren't recorded for a two and a half year period. They weren't searched in response to our subpoenas. They weren't searched in response to Justice Department subpoenas. They weren't searched in response to the independent counsel subpoenas. Now, some might say, so what? An error was made. What's the big deal? That's the question I want to address in my opening statement. The big deal is not that a computer technician made a mistake. Mistakes happen. They happen in my office and they happen in every office. The big deal is how the White House reacted to it. They basically had two choices. They could face up to the problem, tell the Justice Department and Congress what happened, and get it fixed. Or they could throw a blanket over the whole problem, ignore it, and hope nobody would find out. From the interviews we've conducted and the correspondence we've received, it looks like they chose to cover it up. I hope that by the end of this hearing, we'll be able to make a better judgment. Before I go any further into this email problem, I want to put this issue into perspective. This isn't the first time that this committee's had problems with cooperation from the White House. When we began our investigation into illegal fundraising in January of 1997, we sent the White House a document request. They ignored it. In March of 1997, we sent them a subpoena. They refused to honor it. 
In May of 1997, we came within days of holding the White House counsel, Charles Ruff, in contempt of Congress for not producing documents. Only then did they comply. In June, Mr. Ruff sent us a letter certifying that they had complied with our subpoena. Then in October of 1997, somebody found out about the White House videotapes. Ten months after our original request, a bunch of red-faced White House lawyers had to turn over several hundred tapes of the President at controversial fundraising events. Their game plan was very clear. Stall, delay, run out the clock. And it wasn't just the White House. The day after we approved our interim report, two years after we started our investigation, 10 boxes of Democrat National Committee documents magically appeared on our doorstep. So as you can see, there's a history here. And by the way, it didn't start with me. Before me, Chairman Klinger had exactly the same experience. Two and a half years of emails. Let's turn our focus back to the emails. A group of Northrop Grumman employees runs the White House email system. In May or June of 1998, they realized that they had a problem. A server was mislabeled. Two and a half years' worth of incoming emails were not properly preserved. They weren't searched when subpoenas came in. White House staff was informed. On Monday, June 15th, two White House staffers called them into a meeting. We have interviewed the Northrop Grumman employees who were at that meeting. It was 21 months ago. They don't remember every detail, as you might expect. Some remember one part of the conversation, some remember the other parts of the con conversation. But their accounts are basically consistent. When the interviews were finished, two important things emerged about that meeting. First, they were all told to keep this problem secret. Second, some felt intimidated. One Northrop Grumman contractor recalls being told that there was a, quote, jail cell with his name on it, end quote, if he told anyone. One woman was afraid that her security clearance would be yanked and she'd never be able to work again. Another woman refused to tell her boss what she was working on. She was almost fired. She told her boss, quote, I'd rather be insubordinate than go to jail, end quote. They held secret meetings about the problem in a park and at a Starbucks coffee place so they would not be detected. These Northrop Grumman contractors are here today, and I appreciate their being here today. They're going to testify on the first panel. Obviously, this is going to be uncomfortable for them. They've, they're here under subpoena. They're not here because they want to be. They're here because they have to be. To each of you, I'm very sorry you're put in this position. But it's important that we get your views on what happened on the record. I also want to thank the Northrop Grumman Corporation and their attorneys. They've been very cooperative. They've given us documents, they've made employees available for interviews, and they've been very helpful. Why the secrecy by the White House? Why was it so important to keep this under wraps? There were two White House officials involved in the meeting. Laura Crabtree is one, Mark Lindsay is the other. We tried to interview them. They declined to talk to us. We have some pretty basic questions to ask. Why was it so important that this information be kept secret? What are their accounts of the meeting with the Northrop Grumman employees? Who did they talk to when they found out about the problem? They've both been subpoenaed, and they're scheduled to testify on the second panel. I'm sorry they refused to talk to us, but we have questions and we'll ask them today. Beth Nolan, the White House counsel, will testify on the third panel. She wasn't the White House counsel in 1998 when this problem came to light. She took the job last summer. Regardless of who was the White House counsel, we have a serious issue to deal with. The White House counsel's office has known since sometime in 1998 that they were not in compliance with subpoenas from us, the Justice Department, and the independent counsels. They were not in compliance with our subpoena in the illegal fundraising investigation. This computer problem began in the summer of 1996. The second half of 1996 was a critical time period during the, for this scandal. We were never informed. They were not in compliance with our subpoena in the investigation of why the president freed 16 Puerto Rican terrorists. We were never informed. 
Let me read a passage of a letter we received from the White House Counsel's Office on October 27, 1999. This was over a year after the email problem was discovered. Quote, we have been in the process of searching archived emails for materials responsive to the committee subpoena. In close, please find responsive documents. Now, how could they give us all the responsive documents if they knew the emails were there, but they hadn't gone through them? They were not in compliance with our subpoena in the Waco investigation. We were never informed. Let me read a passage from a December 3rd, 1999 letter. Quote, due to the number of requests for information from investigative bodies, the search of archived email messages has taken longer than expected. I anticipate that we should complete the search by the end of next week. If we locate any additional responsive materials, we will promptly provide them to the committee." End quote. And yet all of these emails that they knew about, hundreds of thousands possibly, were not reviewed. It's pretty clear that if we didn't find out about this problem independently, we were never going to be told by the White House, nor was the independent counsel or people at the Justice Department. Now that's a big deal. Complying with subpoenas is not optional. It's mandatory. The White House Counsel's Office has an obligation to comply. If they can't, they have an obligation to tell us why. And it's not like we inundated the White House with subpoenas. Not too long ago, a White House spokesman told a bunch of reporters that we had sent them something like 700 subpoenas. Last year, I sent the White House a grand total of two subpoenas, two. And it's not just us. The White House received subpoenas from the Senate. They received subpoenas from the independent councils. They received subpoenas from the Justice Department. Were other people informed that hundreds of thousands of emails were not reviewed? These are the issues that we want to raise today with Ms. Nolan. Finally, we have a Justice Department witness appearing with Ms. Nolan, Robert Raven, the Assistant Attorney General for Legislative Affairs. As everyone knows, we've been following the Justice Department very closely. We've been watching every step of the way since the Attorney General refused to appoint an independent counsel in the campaign fundraising investigation. What we have seen from the Justice Department has been very discouraging. A search warrant for Charlie Tree's home was quashed. The FBI wanted to go search his home and go through his files because they thought some were being destroyed. And yet, that search warrant was quashed by the leaders of the Justice Department, including Janet Reno. The president was not questioned about foreign money connections. The vice president was not questioned about the Shilai Temple or foreign money connections. Democrats get lighter sentences when Republicans get the book thrown at them. When we interviewed the Northrop, Grum Northrop Grumman employees, we realized that no one had been questioned by the Justice Department about the missing emails. That was March the 7th. This whole issue had been on the front page of the newspaper, so I wrote a letter to the Attorney General. I asked them why they weren't doing anything. It wasn't until after they got my letter that the Justice Department and the Attorney General contacted the first witness. Is that the way the Justice Department works? Do they wait until we're on to them and then they do something about it? One thing that's uh, of great concern to us is that the Justice Department is on both sides of this issue. Justice Department lawyers are representing the White House in civil suits over the matter. They appear to be working with the White House to delay production of these emails. At the same time, the Campaign Finance Task Force should be trying to get them. At this point, I don't think anyone has any idea what's in these emails. But I get the impression that the Justice Department really isn't all that interested. When the Attorney General found out about the missing Waco tapes, she sent U.S. Marshals to seize them from the FBI and Louis Free. Now it looks like the White House hasn't complied with the Justice Department subpoenas, and nobody even asks about them until I sent them a letter. I wonder why they didn't send the U.S. Marshals over there, like they did to the FBI. Well, that concludes my remarks, and I ask unanimous consent that my two letters to the Attorney General be entered into the record without objection so ordered. I've also exchanged letters with the White House counsel, Ms. Nolan, and I ask unanimous consent to enter those in the record and without objection, so ordered. And I will now yield to Mr. Waxman for his opening statements. Then we'll move forward with the first panel. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased you're holding today's hearing. It will provide us an opportunity to explore whether there was any wrongdoing 
in the attempt to coordinate the automated records management system known as the ARMS system with the Lotus email network. We are all aware that during the past few years, many false and reckless accusations have been made about this administration and officials that work within this administration. We should not repeat those mistakes today. Instead, in evaluating the ARMS Lotus interface, we must investigate whether certain acts were the result of sinister motives or simply routine mistakes. Serious accusations, some involving potential criminal conduct, have already been made about the <coughs> ARMS Lotus interface, so it's essential that we do our best to clarify the record and understand the facts and then let the facts lead us to conclusions rather than start with conclusions and then find out if the facts support those conclusions. We have already learned, for instance, that no one in the Clinton administration ever suggested that specific emails or category of emails be excluded from the ARM system. That's a fact. We have also learned that no one in the Clinton administration designed the system or had any role in creating the ARMS Lotus interface or the interface, net, uh, interface defect. And that's a fact. Moreover, we know that no one in the Clinton White House even knew before June 1998 that some emails were being ex excluded from the ARMS Lotus interface and consequently not being submitted to Congress or the Department of Justice. What else do we know? We also have learned that the White House has provided Congress with over 7,000 emails pursuant to congressional requests. They have given us 7,000 emails, and some of those emails were embarrassing to the White House, yet they've submitted those emails. Some of these emails have been repeatedly used by the chairman and other Republican leaders as evidence of White House wrongdoing. The production of those emails would seemingly put to rest the question that the White House was trying to keep damaging information from the Congress. If they were trying to do that, you wonder why they submitted emails uh, among the 7,000 emails that have been used against them. Well, by the end of today, and this may be a long day's hearing, but it's an important one, we will be in a better position to answer three remaining questions. First, did any White House employee make any improper threat to any of the contract or subcontract employees of Northrop Grumman? Second, did anyone at the White House try to impede the efforts to fix the problem created by a contract employee? And finally, why didn't the White House notify this committee and other investigators when the arms Lotus interface problem was discovered? These are important questions, and I hope we'll get answers to them. We will likely receive conflicting testimony on whether threats were made, so we will have to evaluate the credibility of the witnesses on this point. We will also have to evaluate what involvement, if any, the President, the Vice President, or other senior White House officials may have had with this issue. From what we know now, however, it appears unlikely that anyone at the White House tried to obstruct efforts to repair the ARMS Lotus interface. And I believe that Beth Nolan, who will testify at the end of today's hearing, may have a reasonable explanation for the delay in the White House's notification of Congress about the ARMS Lotus interface problem. I look forward to listening to today's witnesses. If it appears that any wrongdoing has occurred regarding the ARMS Lotus interface, we should take appropriate action. By the same token, however, if we should also be sure uh, if in finding the facts that there is a reason to correct the record, if there is no evidence of wrongdoing, I hope that action will be taken as well. Let's let the facts speak for themselves. Let's try to find the facts as best we can where conflicting testimony may be uh, leading us in different directions. And let us try to keep to this issue of the, uh, of the arms Lotus interface to understand what, uh, if any, uh, justifies a congressional hearing and uh, leads us to facts that will be useful in our ongoing investigation. I yield back the balance of my time.
Thank you, Mr. Waxman. I understand a vote has been called on the floor. I want to apologize to our first panel, but uh, in, in order to have consistency in the in the hearing, I think probably we ought to break real quickly for a vote and ask all the members to come back as quickly as possible so we can get on with this. So we'll stand in recess to follow the gavel. Yeah. The committee will reconvene. We'll now welcome our first panel to the witness table. Steve Hawkins, Robert Haas, Betty Lambeth, Sandra Golis, Eamon Selena, Salim, John Spriggs, and Daniel Berry. Would you please stand and raise your right hand, please? Could I leave anybody out? I guess not. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, Sophie God? I do. Man. You see. Uh, first of all, I, I, I want to restate that uh, I know that you would probably be rather playing golf or working or doing something else today. Uh, this is a very important hearing and we do appreciate your cooperation and your being as factual as, as is humanly possible. Uh, do any of you have opening statements you'd like to make? Mr. Salim? Oh, Ms. Salim, I'm sorry. Did you have an opening statement? Yes, sir. Okay, you're recognized. Would you pull the microphone as close to you as possible? Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, my name is Iman Salim. I'm a subcontractor working as a Lotus Notes developer under the executive office of the president, main contractor, North of Grammon. I have held this position since May of 1998. I'm a member of the Lotus Notes team basically responsible for the analysis, development, and support of Lotus Notes applications. I understand that the committee would like me to describe the events surrounding the mail 2 problem, and I'm appearing here voluntarily at the committee's request to do so. One of my first tasks at the EOP was to work on the upgrade of Lotus Notes. During my work on this project in June of 1998, Bob Haas, Bob Haas and I stumbled upon what we thought at the time was a flaw in the records management scanner process. It was a very technical typographical type error committed by a prior contractor before Northogram and was retained. We found quite by chance that inbound email messages were somehow not being picked up by the scanning process of the records management system called ARMS. The scanning portion of ARMS is responsible for looking at email files and sending inbound email messages through several processes, ultimately ending up on the VAX computer where searches of those emails by government employees occurs. Immediately after the discovery of the problem, we reported our findings to our immediate supervisor, Barry Lambert, who directed us to put our findings in writing. In the days that followed, it was determined that the problem was specific only to the Mail 2 server. The Mail 2 problem, therefore, affected approximately 500 users, most of whom worked for the White House. The problem affected only those emails inbound to the White House from outside by way of the Internet to Mail 2 server users. Outgoing emails sent from Mail 2 users at the White House were not affected and were records managed according to established procedures. The Mail 2 server problem had originated sometime during October of 1996 when the contractors prior to North of Grammon built a new email server called Mail 2. When the contractors personnel named the Mail 2 server, they used an uppercase M and lowercase letters for the rest of the name. Following its creation, however, the individual mail accounts on the Mail 2 server were assigned the name Mail 2 using all capital letters. When the case-sensitive ARM scanner process ran on the Mail 2 server to perform its comparison of the names, the comparison failed since the names did not appear in the exact same case. Therefore, none of those accounts on Mail 2 were scanned. 
Inbound emails were not sent to the VAX, and as a result, inbound emails were not records managed. Outbound emails were automatically records managed without the need for such scanning. That is why outbound White House emails were not affected by this error. A few days after the discovery of the problem, sometime between June 15 and June 18 of 1998, Barry Lambert, John Spriggs, Sandy Golas, Bob Haas, and I were called into Laura Crabtree's office for a private meeting. My recollection is that in this meeting, Laura Crabtree told us that Mark Lindsay had instructed that we were not to discuss the problem with anyone, including our spouses or our family. We were told that the incident was considered sensitive and that we should take it very seriously. I do not remember hearing the word jail, and I never felt threatened. In my mind, this was simply a technical issue that needed a technical solution. My understanding was that this issue would remain with this small group only temporarily until the Office of Administration had the chance to manage the situation. On June 19, 1998, one week after the Mail 2 problem was discovered, I left the country for three weeks on a pre-planned vacation. After my return, I had little contact with the Mail 2 issue except for attendance at some technical meetings regarding the problem. In the beginning of November 1998, the group met to discuss a technical solution to the MIL-2 problem. We focused on how to stop the bleeding, which meant that we wanted to find a way to properly manage inbound emails that entered MIL-2 from that point forward. On November 22, 1998, John Spriggs and I executed a program which artificially marked all unmanaged emails as record managed on the 394 active users who were located on Mail2 at that time. After that was completed, inbound emails on the Mail2 server were therefore properly scanned by arms and were records managed. All unmanaged emails that entered Mail2 between the inception of the problem and November of 1998 became part of a separate email reconstruction project. Several months later, in April of 1999, I discovered another problem with the records management system. I found that all users with a first name that started with a D, such as Doug or David, were not being properly scanned by arms. This problem affected not just Mail2, but all the Lotus Notes mail servers. This problem was corrected on June 1st, 1999. Soon after this correction, I created an audit agent that monitors all email accounts and reports on a timely basis if there are any records management issues. This was done so that any future problems will be detected and solved in a timely manner. Mr. Chairman, that is my recollection of the events concerning discovery of the Mail2 system error. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Salim. Uh, Mr. Haas, did you have an opening statement? Chairman, may Ms. Lambeth give her statement now? Uh, we, we, uh, if Mr. Haas has no objection, we'll go with Ms. Lambeth. Ms. Lambeth. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Mr. Chairman, I... Is that good? First... First of all, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and the and your committee to have this opportunity to testify on the uh, lost and hidden emails that occurred in the um, Clinton-Gore White House. Um, when Salim, uh, Ms. Salim, and um, Bob Haas informed me, I did take this information to my immediate supervisor um, in the White House, which was Laura Crabtree. Laura did understand the legal technicalities and the severity of these lost emails and um, said that she would like to go talk to Mark Lindsay. Laura did come back to me and say that Mr. Lindsay had told her to tell me and my staff that if any of us spoke about these issues, about this particular project, which we now named Project X, um, we would not only lose our jobs, we would be arrested and we would be put in jail. Um, Ms. Crabtree then relayed those messages on to my staff, um, which had been relayed to her by Mr. Lindsay. I had also asked Ms. Crabtree uh, and basically said that, you know, it's not that I dispute what you are saying, is I would like to hear this directly from Mr. Lindsay, and she agreed that this was appropriate. Um, I later that day met with Paulette Chacon, who was also um, aware of the situation. Paulette and I went upstairs and I met with Mark Lindsay. 
um, that afternoon quite late. Mr. Lindsay did in fact reiterate everything that Ms. Crabtree had told me that he had been instruct or that he had instructed her to tell. And that was if I or any of my staff relayed this information to anyone, spouses, they specifically named Steve Hawkins, who was the program manager for Northrop Grumman, Jim Wright, who was the co-tar for EOP. But if we, re if we um, spoke to anyone that we, not just me, whoever relayed the information, but that we would all lose our jobs, we would be arrested and we would be put in jail. And this is quite significant because if you are arrested or you're removed from any agency, and we've gone through a 15-year security clearance, that our security clearances are stripped from us, and this is one of our fears also, as our security clearances are stripped, and in this town, as you can appreciate, that makes us unmarketable. But basically then, um, I do want you to understand that I was a subcontractor to Northrop Grumman. I was the manager. I was in on the proposal that Northrop Grumman did to EOP from the very beginning. I was one of the key um, people in that proposal. I did the, um, did the orals, and um, I had a great staff under me that was all Northrop Grumman, um, except for Ms. Salim, who was with another contractor. And uh, we went forward to try to do our very, very best on this particular project. When I was um, informed later uh, about some of the, the emails that were included um, in the findings, uh, it did come up that there were emails from Lewinsky, from Filegate, um, had to deal with Vice President Gore's um, campaign contributions, the, um, the trade seats, et cetera. So there were some very significant issues that were before um, the government at that time that were quite evident in these uh, lost emails. Um, we did meet, as was stated. We felt, uh, felt some pressure from various people around. We. Um, we did meet um, privately, we did go to the park, we did sometimes go across the street to Starbucks and, and speak in generalities. Uh, somehow along the way, um, when we came out of one of the meetings, um, Sandy was basically um, asked to do work on a project by the COTAR and the COTAR Excuse me, would you identify Sandy? We don't, we Sandy Golos, Ms. Golos, sorry, who's also on the panel, sorry. Um, and he asked her to work on a particular problem. She informed him that she could not at that time because we had a special project. He asked her what it was going along with what we had been told. She did not tell him. It is my understanding that at that time she was taken down to Steve Hawkins, who um, also asked her the same question. She refused to tell and was threatened at that time by Mr. Hawkins with loss of job and um, being fired also. I was called at that time. Um, I was in the doctor's office. Um, I was called by Mr. Haas. I talked to Sandy who was extremely upset. I've never seen Sandy that upset. She's a very uh, level-headed person. I spoke with Sandy. She told me what um, had gone on. I told her just to hang tough, I would be back. I, at that time, called Steve, talked to Steve, asked him some questions, basically told him that if, um, if he had some issues with this whole thing, he needed to address me, but I did not want him interrogating my staff or putting them under undue pressure. I then left the doctor's office in Vienna, went back downtown to uh, EOP, uh, addressed Steve, I found Steve, he basically said he had nothing else to say to me, that I was insubordinate, and that I could not refuse to tell him, um, and, and things that he would get me off the contract, which did take place in July of 1998. Um, Along with it having 
become apparent that the White House was not going to proceed and, and let anyone know that, these, um, that this issue had occurred. There, there was definitely a stalling, a delay, and the reason that I say that is I kept asking for meetings. I couldn't get meetings. I was asked to come up with how much time was required for an individual to search these records, what equipment would be needed. I gave all of these facts, turned all of this over, and every time I asked what was to happen on this, where we were going, I could get no answers. Um, also, when it became very evident that I was going to be removed from the contract, um, there was, uh, Northrop Grumman had done a reorganization. All my people were put out under different managers, so therefore they could no longer work as a group on this particular issue. They, um, they were approached by some of the government people to that I needed to remain there because of the knowledge, et cetera. That was, that was turned down, uh, which was their, their privilege to do that. However, in doing so, it has another significant consequence, and that was the fact that with no manager there, they basically had no one to get direction from. By being spread out amongst other managers now, they had no one, cert, uh, no one person to go to with these issues or that was aware of all of the tasks that they had to do. So it made it a little bit more difficult. They had brought in another person, um, Jim Webster, from the same company that Iman works for to take my place. Um, I think that there was from what I had heard, that there was some resistance to opening up to him, and I wasn't told until the last day that I was there that I could even talk to him about the project. Um, and Mr. Webster, to my knowledge, only stayed a few weeks and then left the project. So they basically were with no supervision as far as having a manager. Okay. I think, uh, Ms. Lambert, that we pretty much covered the, the basic problem and we'll get back to you in just a few minutes with okay. some questions. Mr. Haas, did you have some comments you'd like to make? Yes, sir. Good morning. My name is Robert Haas. I was asked to come before you today to talk about what's been called the mail two problem at the White House. I do so voluntarily. I have worked at the executive office of the president for the past nine years. I have worked for Northrop Grumman since November when in 97 when they were awarded the contract to provide computer information services at the White House complex. I am a Lotus Notes administrator. Lotus Notes is the email system that is currently in use at the White House today. Northrop Grumman administers the records management system for certain agencies in the EOP. On June 15th, uh, 1998, I was called to a meeting in the office of Laura Crabtree a civil servant for IS&T of the Office of Administration. During the first part of the meeting, Mark Lindsay was on a speakerphone addressing the group, which included, in addition to myself, Ms. Crabtree, John Spriggs, Sandy Golis, Iman Salim, and Betty Lambeth. Mr. Lindsay told us that the discovery of the mail tube problem was to be treated as top secret, and that only Ms. Crabtree, Ada Posey, and Mr. Lindsay himself could authorize the group to talk to anyone else. Mr. Lindsay specif specifically told us not to talk to Steve Hawkins, the project manager for Northrop Grumman and our ultimate supervisor on the site. Mr. Lindsay hung up after about five minutes and Ms. Crabtree uh, told me that I could not tell even Ms. Virginia Puzo anything if she asked. In a somewhat flippant way, I asked what would happen if I did tell her or my wife and Ms. Crabtree responded that there would be a jail cell with my name on it. Overall, my impression of the meeting with Ms. Crabtree and Mr. Lindsay was very serious about their warnings. I'm not a lawyer and did not know one way or the other whether there was any basis for their threats. But I did take to heart their instructions and tried to obey them carefully. This is a brief summary of my recollections of the discovery and the report of the mail two problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Truss. Uh, Mr. Barry, did you have a comment you'd like to make? Yes, sir, I have a brief statement. Would you pull the mic close to you? Those mics don't pick up as well as we'd like. 
Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I want the committee's record to show that I am Daniel A. Barry and I have been employed by the Executive Office of the President, Office of Administration, since June 1992. My current title is Deputy Data Center Manager slash Electronics Records Manager. And I have responsibility for the records that are received by the Automated Records Management System, ARMS, and for the overall system administration of ARMS. I'm here today at the request of the Chairman and will be pleased to answer any questions that you may have about the ARMS system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Any others uh, like to? Yes, sir, Mr. Hawkins. Good morning, sir. Morning. My name is Stephen Hawkins, former uh, program manager for Northrop Grumman at EOP. I am uh, here voluntarily before this committee to uh, prevent or provide facts uh, pertaining to this uh, matter today. I wasn't going to give an, er uh, an opening statement, however, I have to uh, uh, contradict uh, several statements made. As a manager uh, under a government contract, we have strict rules of uh, business uh, etiquette to, to work by. Uh, Ms. Lambu said she worked directly for Ms. Crabtree. That is incorrect. Her manager was Bob Whiteman. At no time was the records management group unmanaged during the tenure of Northrop Grumman. I would also like to say that uh, Northrop Grumman employees were called to unauthorized meetings because of Ms. Lambuth. Repeatedly during the time of employment at EOP, Ms. Lambuth was count counseled by her manager, by me, and by her C-exec management for failure to comply with management directives. And I find it appalling that she is trying to make allegations that Northrop Grumman failed to manage the notes group at any given time. They had strict supervision. Mr. Bob Whiteman was that manager. And throughout the contract, Ms. White, uh, Mr. Whiteman and Ms. Lambuth were both counseled to make sure that they followed the terms and conditions of the Northrop Grumman contract with EOP. I had a lot of difficulty in that area, especially with Ms. Lambuth wanting to work very closely with government employees and failing to follow the Northrop Grumman program management's directions and the term and conditions of the contract. Thank you. Any other opening comments? Well, then I will start. Uh, did you have some, I'm sorry, Mr. Spriggs, go ahead. After, you're, you're welcome to make an opening comment. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is John E. Spriggs, Jr. Since September of 1996, I have worked on various contracts for the Information Systems and Technology Division of the Office of Administration within the Executive Office of the President of the United States. Since December of 1997, I've been employed by Logicon, a Northrop Grumman company, and have served as a senior systems integration engineer on their Executive of the Office of the President contract. The systems I help maintain include, but are not limited to, uh, a dozen or so EOP uh, electronic mail gateways and mail servers, the EOP.gov and WhiteHouse.gov internet servers, um, components of the White House and EOP access verification systems, uh, internet email servers for both the President and the First Lady. I maintain ser mail servers and gateways also for the Office of the Vice President newswire servers for the White House press office and the EOP community, as well as three Lotus Notes records management servers. I appear voluntarily uh, and have voluntarily testified before the Senate Government Affairs Committee on these topics. I do not have firsthand knowledge of all the facts in these matters, and many aspects are technically complex and clouded by the passage of time and the intervention of other events. To the best of my knowledge, my actions and those of my colleagues were properly supervised and directed. They were law-abiding and within the scope of the existing Logicon contract. The Executive Office of the President of the United States is indeed a challenging place to work. I appreciate more than I exp can express in these remarks the dedicated service that is rendered daily by the men and women who labor there whether they are volunteers, contractors, civil service employees, or presidential appointees. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee. 
Any other comments from any of the members? Let yes, me. Your Honor. May I make a statement in a, uh, insofar as my client was attacked, a brief statement of order? Of, uh, uh, order no, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah. I understand the point of order. The legal counsel uh, can only confer with their clients. We do appreciate your the, being the here. The point is that Northrop Grumman I understand, but she can, she can speak for herself. All right, I'll let make, her speak for herself. You, you can make the comment, uh, but let, let me, uh, uh, before we get into a discussion and debate about that, we, we can get to that when I ask you questions, Ms. Lambeth, because I think we need to start the questioning now. Any other members want to? I, I already, hey, I'm running the meeting. I do, I, do, any, do you have a comment you'd like to make, Ms. Gullis? Hi. My name is Sandra Gullis. I, I'm appearing here voluntarily. Um, I'm. I manage the VAX systems at EOP. I handle all the records management uh, applications on the back side. Um, I don't deal directly with the Lotus Notes applications. However, I've been involved with the mail to issue and I'll answer any questions you have for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments? If not, we'll start the questioning. First of all, let me make a comment. I, I understand there may be some personality conflicts and some personnel conflicts and some disagreements on management. And that is not the major concern that I have as chairman and I think as most members have, and I'll let them express themselves when they get to the questions. My big concern is we subpoenaed documents from the White House. The Justice Department subpoenaed documents from the White House, as did the independent counsel. These documents were important for a number of investigation, the file, Gate, so-called file gate investigation, the travel office investigation, Waco, the campaign finance investigation. Now, this started, as I understand it, in September of 1996, when there was a glitch in the computer operation. The big problem about the campaign finance investigation was going on at that time because there was questions about campaign contributions coming in from China, Macau, Indonesia, Taiwan, Egypt, South America, and elsewhere. And so these emails could be very relevant to that investigation, as well as the other investigations. So I hope during this conversation we're going to have, and I hope it's more conversational than, and, and not acrimonic, acrimonious, because obviously when you have a lot of people working in an office, you do have these problems, even in my office. You know, I'm always right, the employees are always wrong, but that's the way it goes. But the fact, the, the facts we want are these. When did you find out that there was a glitch? As I understand it, it was in 1998. There was a meeting called. And what I want to ask you in my first question, and I would like to go right down the line, is what happened at that meeting with Ms. Crabtree and Mr. Lindsay on the phone? So those who were at that meeting, the first question I want to ask you is, and I want your answer to be as succinct as possible. What do you recall happening? Now, Mr. Haas, I think you've pretty, been pretty clear. We understand that you said that Mr. Lindsay was on the phone. He said this was top secret and uh, to keep your mouth shut about it. Now, during, during that time that he was on the phone, there was no threat made other than this was top secret and to be kept quiet. Is that correct? That's correct, by to, Mr. Lindsay. To your recollection. That is Now, Ms. Crabtree, when you hung up the phone, when he hung, hung up the phone, you said, well, what would happen if I told my wife or somebody else? And she said? Oh, that there, would, there could possibly be a jail cell with my name on it. And you recall that vividly? Yes. Okay. Now, who else was in that meeting? Ms. Golan? What do you recall about the meeting? Well, most Hold the mic of, close to you. Most of what Bob remembers, I uh, remember the conversation. Mr. Uh, Lindsay was called and put on the speakerphone. I remember him talking to us and telling us it was very important that we didn't take the information out of the room, that we shouldn't discuss it with anyone. After the conversation, I don't remember who said it. I do remember the word jail being used because I later relayed that same statement to Steve. Okay, when you relayed that to Mr. to Steve, Mr. Hawkins, t tell me how you related. Well, he was um, trying to get me to tell me what I was tell him what I was working on, and I was standing behind the table, and I, he said, "You're bordering on being insubordinate." And I said, "If it's a choice of being insubordinate or going to jail, I guess I'll have to be insubordinate." So, so you did feel a threat. Somewhat, yes. Okay. 
<laughs> uh, who else was in the meeting? Ms. Saleem, what do you recall? Um, I recall going into Laura Crab, uh, Ms. Crabtree's office and being told, uh, Laura basically told us that she had reported this problem to Mr. Mark Lindsay and to uh, the director of OEA at the time, Ada Posey. And uh, she told us that so far only them three and us knew about this problem. And she asked us, I remember very clearly and vividly, her telling us not to discuss this problem with anyone, to include our families and spouses, which at that point, that's what I found a little bit uh, strange, which uh, being, you know, being told not to discuss this issue with anyone, um, I remember uh, being it uh, uh, very serious. They told us it was a sensitive matter. Um, basically, my understanding was uh, that we weren't to discuss this problem with anyone, but my real understanding was that they were, until they could manage the situation, it, uh, my, that was my understanding, that they would appreciate from us not to discuss this with anyone, and my feeling was that until they could, until this could manage the situation. But they did ask you to, that they indicated it was top secret and did you feel threatened? I did not feel threatened. I did not feel personally threatened by this. And they, I did do, they tell you it was top secret and to keep it quiet? They, I don't remember the word top secret. I don't, I don't recall the word top secret. What I do recall is being told uh, that this is a sensitive matter and to keep it confidential, basically not to discuss it with anyone. Including your husband or anybody? Correct. So they, they did ask you not to even tell your spouse or anyone? Correct. Okay, so they, so they did want you to keep a lid on it? Correct. Okay. Ms. Lambeth? Um, oh, Mr. Spriggs, we'll just go right down the line. Mr. Spriggs? I was there. Yes, I was there. Um, similar to Iman, um, I did not hear the word jail um, in the reference to uh, uh, not telling your family, your wife, uh, your spouse. Uh, my attention picked up more on that, uh, more of a concern about not talking about uh, that with my wife. Another reference to um, we, we typically have a lot of hallway conversations. Uh, there, there are always people that are around that, that come through our office. So uh, again, Ms. Crabtree was specific about hallway conversations, keeping those under control. Don't, don't talk about this as well. But again, no, I don't specifically remember a reference to jail either. Well, uh, uh, but you do recall and I'm not, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you do recall that they said this is something that's very sensitive, should be kept secret, and don't even talk to your spouse about it. That's correct. Okay. Uh, again, I, not the word top secret, which you'd characterize or someone characterized, uh, much more like what Iman was saying, and my remembrance was extremely sensitive. Uh, it will we'll keep a lid on it till we find out more about this. The major thrust from, from my point of view was that the, there was a point of contact or points of contact that were specifically mentioned to us uh, any information that we were to get or, or give to the government was to be done through Betty Lambeth uh, and Laura Crabtree that any instructions that we were to receive would come through Laura and Betty to us so that was our clear if you would uh, line of, of, of authority as far as we knew that and, and again the specific reference to Steve Hawkins and all also to uh, Jim Wright were made, so there was no but They there was didn't no want ambiguity. Mr. Hawkins or Mr. Wright to know about it? That's correct. Specifically, okay. those people, they did not want us to talk to about it, and so, again, the, the names were specifically mentioned. Okay. Well, f from those of you who have answered so far, you're pretty consistent. They wanted you to keep this very quiet. There's some difference as to whether or not there was a threat of jail. Some of you remember it, some of you don't. There's also uh, 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 some question about the word secret, but I think all of you had the same impression. This was very sensitive and you were supposed to keep it quiet. Is that correct? Okay, right. they've all answered in the affirmative. Ms. Lambeth. Yes. Um, Hold the mic close to you, please. Well, I obviously had more meetings on this whole issue um, than the rest of my staff did um, in informing and 
I apologize if I said that Laura was my direct supervisor. What I meant to say was she was my direct government supervisor. Well, okay. we're, 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 what we're really interested in, Ms. Lambeth, is what went on in that meeting, what went on the conversations between you and Ms. Crabtree and Mr. Lindsay. Those are the things that are so relevant to what we want to find out because those documents have been subpoenaed by several agencies of the government. They were obligated to give them to us and keeping that quiet is very serious. So we need to know what was said by right. Ms. Crabtree and Mr. Lindsay too. Okay, what, what um, I apologize, but what I was trying to say was I had more than the one conversation that my staff was in. So some of this is going to mold in together. Sure, sure. But um, I was told by s a couple of different people that we were not to talk to anyone the names of Steve, the Kotar, Jim Wright were mentioned. We were not to talk to our spouses, anyone other than those of us that already knew about this particular project, and then anyone else that they gave us permission to talk to. Um, they did tell me that if any of us did talk about this, they basically threatened us that my staff would be fired, would go to jail, uh, would be arrested and go to jail. And that was made very clear more than one time. By, by whom? Um, Laura Crabtree related first as being said by Mark Lindsay. That afternoon when I went up, or the evening when I went up and talked to Mark Lindsay, Paulette Chacon was there. Mr. Lindsay reiterated the same thing that I had been told by um, Laura Crabtree. And um, so I was told by Laura, for Mr. Lindsay, and then by Mr. Lindsay himself. Let, let me ask you this now. As I understand it, uh, a number of you, maybe all of you, uh, met uh, at a park and talked about these issues or met at, uh, uh, where was that, Starbucks? Starbucks? Is this a commercial for Starbucks? <laughs> uh, but met at Starbucks and talked about these. How many of you met at those different meetings? Can you hold your hands up? So all of you that were involved in the meeting. Why did you feel, and any one of you can answer, we'll let each one of you answer, why did you feel it was important to meet outside the White House to discuss these things at either the park or Starbucks? And you can just go right down the line. I just make your comments as brief as possible. All right. Um, again, we're, we're talking in the June time frame, so uh, there were basically, there's a lot going on at the, at the uh, executive office of the president. Uh, there are, with the office arrangement that we have, there the, it's quite easy for people to be overhearing conversations. Uh, my office is very much of a uh, um, central place, if you would, for people to come to. I, I, as I said in my opening statements, uh, I got a, I'm responsible for a lot of different things. So people are always coming around me and, and this, the, my colleagues. So if we're going to talk about this stuff and keep it under wraps, then we, we have to be careful as to where we are. Um, Ms. Uh, Lambeth's office is, was quite small. Uh, even closing the door, uh, we get into rather animated discussions at times, and uh, so it, it became obvious that we needed to get to a place where we could talk about this. Uh, given that it was nice outside, there were opportunities for us to go out to the park uh, only once, I believe it was, maybe twice. Um, the question of Starbucks, uh, my colleagues, uh, particularly Ms. Lambeth at the time, uh, drank uh, Starbucks coffee and she liked to go over there and get it. Uh, I'm a McDonald's person if I'm going to get my plug in here. <laughs> so I, I would go over to McDonald's and get my soda. Uh, and so we would talk about this, again, trying to keep uh, some level head about all of this, getting away from the hubbub of activity that we have within, within the office. But, but the point is that uh, you felt it was necessary to go to someplace private because of the, of the uh, level of concern that was expressed to you by Ms. Crabtree and Mr. Lindsay. That's correct. Uh, to amplify just a little bit more, uh, there were actually meetings where we would go to uh, the second floor of the new executive office building. Um, that room is typical. It's a very large room for um, divisional parties or, or presentations by the divisional chief or whatever. Uh, we would actually go to that room. Uh, we would know 
basically who was there. Uh, we would be able to talk openly. There was, it was a large enough room that, again, just the, the, the team of people being there. Uh, so we felt fairly comfortable that we were keeping to the, the assignment, which was to keep it under 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 wraps and okay. keep quiet. About I think it. That, that is that is that pretty much what all of you re recollect, Ms. Crabtree. Do you recollect any more, or, or Ms. Uh, it's Lambeth? Lambeth, I'm sorry. Do you recollect any more? No, that's that's, that's basically it. it. When we would meet on the second floor, sometimes. Um, because the smoking area was on the balcony outside, we had a lot of people staring in, and, and Jim Wright happened to be one of those um, people that would look at us with um, questioning eyes at some sometimes. Well, I, so I we we, uh, <laughs> we uh, felt um, a little bit better going off premise. Okay, uh, Mr. Hawkins, I, I understand that uh, you're one of the most senior Northrop Grumman employees that were on site. When did you first become aware of, of, of this situation? Uh, it was uh, in June, uh, July time frame. I don't know exactly. Uh, June or July of? 98. 98. Uh, Mr. Jim Wright, the COTAR, uh, contracting officer technical representative, uh, was the person who could authorize Northrop Grumman to work on EOP. He came to my office extremely displeased and um, after uh, two or three minutes of peeling him off the ceiling because he said that, it, that Northrop Grumman employees were working out of the scope of the contract. I uh, got him to calm down, then he gave me the facts that uh, he walked to Ms. Golas's office and she basically said she, she couldn't tell Mr. Wright what she was working on and he felt that that was uh, inappropriate and he also thought that was a violation of our contract and therefore he asked me to investigate and I told him I would. And that was the first time. Did, uh, did, I'm going to yield to my colleague here in just a minute, but did, uh, did, uh, when did you find out that they felt like this uh, was something, some felt that was, they were threatened and some felt like that they uh, uh, had to keep a, a, a lid on this because uh, uh, there might be repercussions? Well, uh, once I uh, asked uh, Ms. Golas to come to my office, uh, she was very nervous, uh, to say the least, uh, very uh, fidgety, and when I asked her uh, what she was working on, she just totally came unglued and told me that it was basically none of my concern. Uh, I said, well, you've told that to Jim, now you've told that to me, and that's pretty serious in the government contracting world that uh, being cited for working outside the scope of the contract, I needed to have that information. Well, I gave Ms. Golas 30 minutes to go back to her office, think about her position. I did tell her the consequences would be insubordination. Within uh, a short period after uh, she left my office, uh, the uh, three individuals being Sandy, uh, Bob Haas, and uh, John Spriggs came to my office, and that's when I, I first knew uh, that there was a problem. They felt uh, very uncomfortable talking about it. Bob more so uh, saying that he was threatened would you and, use her last names? Because oh, excuse me, Bob Haas. Bob Haas, okay. Felt that uh, he was very threatened uh, with what had, had gone on. Uh, Mr. Spriggs, uh, being very calm, uh, he said he was concerned. Uh, all three employees uh, I would characterize as being extremely nervous of the situation. Uh, at that time, uh, they requested that they seek uh, legal counsel from Northrop Grumman, which we did. and. Okay, I think, I think that pretty much uh, answers where we are. Mr. LaTourette, I'll use you the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to uh, reiterate, first of all, the, the Chairman's remarks that how pleased I think everyone on the committee is that so many of you came voluntarily uh, to this hearing. I was at a meeting yesterday with uh, Senator John McCain, who until recently was running for president. And he was making some observations. As you know, he's a, a champion of campaign finance reform. And he was making some observations that uh, he was glad that the Vice President of the United States, Mr. Gore, was now a, a disciple of campaign financing reform and has learned his lessons from experiences that occurred out of the Buddhist temple fundraiser in, in California. But he went on to say, and something that struck me was that, that in order to prove that reformation, perhaps the Vice President should call for a complete independent review uh, of the campaign fundraising abuses of the 1996 uh, election season. And the word independent struck me, uh, because in this case, the subject of this hearing, as the Chairman said, you had the Justice Department on both sides of the issue. Uh, they should be interested in, in these emails on the basis of all of the subpoenas that went to the White House, but they're also defending in civil litigation against the production 
uh, of these emails. So since that request hasn't been forthcoming, this committee and other committees of the Congress, we sort of slog along and we don't always uh, get the best reputation. And, and uh, the reason for that is that people come before the committee and they supply information to the committee about what they've seen or what they've heard or what they've experienced. We schedule a hearing. The chairman usually lays out in his opening remarks what the hearing is going to be about. Uh, and then the hearings don't always live up to their expectations uh, because uh, people leave the country, some people die, uh, records disappear, and a couple years later they show up on coffee tables in people's houses and we can't, we can't figure out how that happens. Uh, and then that invariably leads the, uh, the members of the minority, particularly our distinguished ranking member, to say something like, here we go again. Uh, and, and my favorite in the last couple hearings was uh, something along the line of the chairman was wrong that Mr. Wang said about Mr. Wong, just because of its alliterative uh, quality, if nothing else. And so I'm glad you're all here. Um, but there are some discrepancies uh, in, in what it is you've, you've presented to us. And I, I would like to start with those. And Mrs. Lambeth, uh, I'd like to start with you. Uh, I've been supplied with, a, uh, uh, I believe, an affidavit that you've executed. Um, and uh, I want to read you a couple paragraphs and see if you still affirm to that today, and then it involves a couple of your cohorts here, Mr. Haas and, and Mr. Berry in particular. Uh, I'd like to read you this paragraph. A contractor for Northrop Grumman, uh, whom I supervised and who examined this group of emails, told me the emails contained information relating to Filegate, concerning Monica Lewinsky, the sale of Clinton Commerce uh, Department trade mission seats in exchange for campaign contribution, and Vice President Al Gore's involvement in campaign fundraising controversies. Did you attest to that under oath somewhere? Yes. And do you still stand by that today? Yes, I do. Okay. Yes, I do. Okay. And the, the contractor for uh, NG that you supervised, is that Mr. Haas? Yes, it, it is. Mr. Haas, after the, this mail two problem was dis de determined, and basically, as I understand it, a server was offline and, and not being subject to capture in the ARM system. Is that so? E emails coming into the White House weren't being captured by the ARM system on this mislabeled, or you had small type mail two as it's opposed a, to. That's a simplistic, yes. Well, I'm a simplistic kind of guy, <laughs> and so you're going to have to bear with me. So, was Mr. Haas. Uh, tasked with the responsibility after this problem was discovered of performing a manual search uh, of these tapes? Yes, he, he was um, actually tasked with a couple of different things. One thing was uh, we were trying to determine um, the number of ta uh, messages that were involved and how much time was going to be required to do that. The other thing that we had to try to figure out was since we were being in this contract, we were supposed supposed to sorry, we were supposed to um, support all messaging, all of the arms, etc., plus some other duties that Bob had. That how much time this would take, so that it, taking him away from some of the other duties, who we could you know, who we could transfer those to, um, amount of time, et cetera. But yes, he did do some searches. Okay, but, but my specific question has to do with, is it your recollection that you were informed by Mr. Haas that the emails contained in this these mis misdirected mail to servers contained information or emails or documents relating to all of these ongoing yes. investigations in the United States Congress? Mr. Haas, I, I turn to you now, sir. Did you, did you have a responsibility to, to go through and search the the backup tapes that, uh, that have become the subject of this hearing? First of all, let me make it clear. I have nothing to do with the backup tapes. Okay. I believe what was Lambeth is referring to me searching was the mail servers and the current mail files that existed on those servers at that time. I was charged with uh, one task of finding all the iterations of, of people that had not been managed during that period of time once we figured out what the, the failure was. And upon doing that, I was to open every mail file, go to a particular view which held those documents uh, in a single view, write down a count, and try to find the date of the oldest document in each person's and present that list. It was a list of some 525 uh, mail files that were involved at that time. Uh, Shortly after I got in the middle of this, it was taking several weeks to go through because I was manually doing it with my eyes and my fingers, um, I was asked to look in a couple of specific mail files for particularly Monica Lewinsky uh, was the sender. 
and upon finding a cat. Who gave you that instruction? It, it, every instruction I ever received was from Betty Lambeth. Okay, that was you. the agreement uh, in thank the office. You. Okay. Anyway, uh, I found a large cache of uh, documents in one mail file and I think uh, four documents in another mail file. I then notified her of that. At no time, other than I was asked to test two documents from the Monica Lewinsky cache to verify that the anomaly Mr. Uh, Barry had reported during the original Monica search, uh, he was stated he saw incoming, it appeared to be a conversation, but they only had the one half of it. So we took a trial time, they could tell me exact time of day on a particular day, and I looked in that cache and found the corresponding replies outbound, uh, I mean, Sorry, we had the outbounds, but not the inbounds. And I, I found the corresponding. So I looked at two documents of the Monica Lewinsky just to verify there was a conversation going on and here was the other half. At no time did I look at any other documents in any other mail files, nor have I ever mentioned that there was any involvement with FileGate or any other document. It is my practice as a uh, systems administrator there to never read the mail from other people because it's detrimental to my job, my, my sanity, if you will, to do that type of activity. And it's not within the guidelines of my job to do. I don't need to read your mail to fix your mail file. I would hope not. And, and so, Ms. Lambert, that, that conflicts with your recollection of the events. Is that a fair observation? Yes, that does conflict. Okay. Uh, uh, going back to you, Mrs. Lambeth, the... the can, can, can I follow up just one second? Uh, Ms. Lambeth? Yes, sir. Can you yes. elaborate for Mr. Latourette and the committee exactly what made you believe that there were sale of trade mission seats, that the vice president was involved in campaign fundraising and so forth. Can you, can you go into that in some detail as quickly as you can? Because if there's a conflict here, we need to resolve it. We need to find out, you know, if somebody's either misinformed or has forgotten. Right. Thank you, um, first of all, Bob is right. We do not read anybody's email message, so I want that on the record. But we do find certain information when we um, do searches. And um, there are other people that um, basically were also told that there were records with Filegate, the trade mission seats, um, Vice President Gores, et cetera, but um, in Monica Lewinsky. And Bob was asked to search at one time specifically for Monica Lewinsky. To the best of my knowledge, as I reported before, I was told that there were emails in there that was not only from Monica Lewinsky, but the trade, the uh, campaign contributions, um, and um, various other things. And we... Um, this can also be verified by Ms. Hall, and Ms. Hall is here in the, in the room, that she was also told this. If, if, well, I'll let Mr. Lottery yeah, if, if I can, I mean, we, we, we've talked to Mr. Haas, he's here. And so where else did this information come to you uh, that, you're, that you're now describing for us? How, how do you know this to be so? In other words, what you're telling us and what you've sworn to in an affidavit under oath, how do you know this to be so? To the best of my recollection, this was what I was told I, by Mr. Haas. Okay. I, I then want to go to another paragraph in your, uh, in your affidavit, and that is that the Clinton White House considered but did not call Daniel A. Barry, and that's the, the gentleman almost at the end of mm -hmm. the table, back from vacation uh, to talk to him about Project X. This was called Project X, I guess, at some yes, time. Yes, it was. And then the Mail 2 server reconstruction project was called Project X. Is that... This, this whole mail issue was okay. Project X. All right, and, and specifically, there was a discussion uh, to, to maybe call him back from vacation because he was anticipated to be giving testimony or, or a deposition for uh, um, somebody, Congress or somebody else. Right. But, but they decided against that? Yes, we were, it did come up in the conversation. Um, with with the who? government. With, with who, if you could, just so we know who's, what conversation did it come up with? Who was doing the talking? Were you there? I was there. And who was talking? Uh, Ms. Crabtree. Okay. I do not remember whether Mr. Lindsay was there or not on this particular one, but there was another government um, official there. 
and there was some discussion about whether they should get Mr. Berry back off of vacation because, in, because he was going forth to um, do testimony and what I was told or what I heard was a congressional testimony um, relating to arms and they didn't know whether to get him back, inform him of what had been discovered or not and that they would come up with a decision on that. It was later told to me that uh, they in fact chose not to tell Mr. Berry. Okay, and you, you go on to say that as a result, Mr. Berry did not have relevant information about the, the missing emails whenever he presented testimony to whomever he was requesting. That's correct. That's your belief? Yes. But Mr. Berry, let me, let me turn down to you. Um, I have a uh, declaration that you gave apparently in a, a civil action called uh, Alexander versus the FBI et al. Uh, and that declaration is uh, dated and signed by you on uh, July the 9th of 1999. Do you recall giving such a testimony, such a declaration? Yes, I do. And specifically, you were being asked to, to give information uh, because you're the computer specialist in the EOP uh, that has, uh, you're, are you the supervisor of the automated retrieval system or the arms program? I'm the program manager of the arms system. And, and specifically in paragraph four, and it's, it's a, uh, marked uh, exhibit GR1. I don't know if you have that with you, but are you, would, you, would you like a copy of it? I don't yes, want, please. I don't want to trick you. Can somebody get him GR1? But let me read you paragraph four, and then if you need to see the thing, then we'll just take a minute and you can ask, answer the question. But in paragraph four, as I reviewed it, <clears throat> it looks like you were giving testimony in, a, uh, in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia relative to the, uh, the armed system uh, and the retrieval of and reconstruction of emails, but, but nowhere in there, uh, at, at least in July the 9th, 1999, do you talk about the fact that there's this whole body on the Mail 2 server that, that's out there? Uh, and I, I suppose in this lawsuit you're being asked, I, I think this is the Filegate lawsuit, if I remember correctly. I believe that's correct. Okay. Uh, let me, uh, can we, can somebody take a mic copy maybe so we can? Don't waste so much time. Thank you, Mark. I, I was referring to paragraph four, which is a specific reference to the, the arm system and the reconstruction of emails. Um, were, were you aware in July of 1999 of this file or this uh, Project X or the, the fact that we had a problem with the Mail 2 server? I assume you were since you found he, that. Yes, I was. Okay. Uh, why is it then that in response to, were you subpoenaed in this, in this proceeding to give a declaration? Actually, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know if I was or but, not. But regardless, you gave testimony Correct. under oath in lieu of showing up, I guess. Um, and I would assume that the inquiry was whether or not, uh, well, it has to do with the file gate, that, that whole business about where FBI files from former Bush White House employees were ordered up by a bar bouncer from Pittsburgh, but nobody ever looked at them because they were kept in the refrigerator or whatever there was the testimony. But I, but I assume that the question was whether or not there were any missing emails uh, in the arm system or any any records at the EOP that could be retrieved relative to that issue. Isn't that the, what they were asking you about? No, I, I, I don't think so. Um, my whole involvement with the uh, Alexander case, which is what I had known it as, this th sure. what I had given, uh, uh, actually this is the third uh, declaration that I had given in this case, and I gave a deposition in this case as well. Um, to me, the questions that I was being asked and the, the declarations that I was giving had all got to do with searching of email. What was searchable, how it could be searched, how long it would take to search it, um, that type of thing, and particularly the ARM system. It all focused on the ARM system because that's what I do. Okay. And um, it also, the, it focused around the reconstruction project which had to do with reconstructing email from the system that we had prior to the ARM system going online, which was the all-in-one system. And I was the project manager on that reconstruction project as well. And so, to me, um, my involvement, like I said, was, you know, how difficult it is to search, how searches can be co uh, conducted, how long it takes, what kind of searches we can do, and a status report on the reconstruction effort. That, was, that was all it had to do with. 
Uh, my involvement. My time. time has expired. We'll get you some more Thank time later. Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the origin of this hearing seems to have been a February 15, 2000 story in the Washington Times. The headline in the story is, White House Accused of Cover-Up. The first paragraph reads as follows. The White House hid thousands of emails containing information on Filegate, Chinagate, campaign finance abuses, and Monica Lewinsky, all of which were under subpoena by a federal grand jury and three congressional committees, a former White House computer manager says. That's the opening paragraph. It's a powerful accusation. And I want to begin my questioning by asking uh, some questions about this accusation. The issue we're examining today involves what happened to a subset of White House emails. As I understand it, during a two-year period from 1996 to 1998, emails that were sent to the White House, uh, uh, or about 500 White House employees from individuals outside the White House, were not captured by the White House data retrieval system called ARMS. Apparently, this was caused by a technical defect in the ARMS Lotus interface in the White House computer system. So my first question is whether anyone on this panel thinks that the White House deliberately caused this computer problem? Did the White House deliberately design the ARMS Lotus interface so that incoming emails would not be captured? And uh, let me, Mr. Barry, let's start with you. Let's hear from anybody and answer this question. Everybody on the answer this question. I, I'm not sure what the question is. Well, my question is, do you think the White House deliberately caused the computer problem? And did the White House deliberately design the ARMS Lotus interface so that incoming emails wouldn't be captured? No, no to both. That's my, my opinion is no. Mr. Hawkins? I have no comment on that. Okay. Ms. Golis? I don't believe so, sir. Okay. Mr. Haas? No, I don't believe so either. Sonny? Uh, no, sir, I don't believe so. And I would like to add um, uh, something to, to the uh, fact. Uh, the the uh, root of the problem was on the arm scanner uh, s scanning process. Let me interrupt you because I'm going to get to those things, but I just want to get certain points responded to. Did you think the White House caused this problem, and did they design the system so that they wouldn't be able to retrieve some of these emails? No, sir. Okay, Mr. No, Steve. sir. Ms. Lambeth? I don't, I don't think there's any way to really know that. Well, do you know whether the White House designed the uh, ARMS Lotus interface? That was before I was there. I don't know. Oh, so you don't know one way or the other? Right. Okay. Um, I'd like to know um, your understanding uh, that this computer problem, uh, whether it was caused by private contractors or the White House. Mr. Berry? Well, I, I don't think it was deliberately caused by anybody. It was... It was that, nobody seems to say that it was deliberately caused by... Well, I asked about the White House, and nobody in this panel said they thought the White House deliberately caused it. Now, there was a computer problem. Uh, it was caused by something, an error or maybe something intentional. If it wasn't caused by the White House, was it caused by um, private contractors? Well, the, the Notes Arms interface was developed by a government contractor. It was not developed by government staff, to the best of my knowledge. Okay. Well, in a cover-up, people usually try to destroy incriminating evidence. Mr. Berry, were you ever directed to destroy any of the missing emails by anyone at the White House? No. Um, Ms. Salim, were you ever directed to destroy any emails? No, sir. Uh, what about, uh, did anybody on the panel uh, want to tell us that they were instructed to destroy any of the emails? The panel seems to all be shaking your head in the negative. In fact, I understand the... Uh, Mr. Mr. Waxman, please listen to my client. Uh, Ms. Lambeth, do you uh, have some... Uh, well, were, you, were you ever directed to destroy any emails? No, I was never directed to destroy emails, but I know that there were six months of the emails, the backup on the emails that were overwritten. Okay. Now, um, in fact, I understand that uh, not only were none of you directed to destroy emails, in 1998, Northrop Grumman was directed to make up uh, make backup copies of all the emails so that they would be preserved. Uh, Mr. Berry, can you describe how this occurred? 
Um, well, I'm not really sure what, what incident you're referring to, but uh, there are backup tapes of all of the mail servers for a, some period of time. Nobody's really sure what the period of time is or what exactly uh, the, the tape uh, situation is because an inventory has to be done of the tapes. But is it, is it accurate to say that Northrop, Northrop Grumman was directed to make backup copies of all the emails so that they would be preserved? I don't know that. Does anybody know the answer to that? No, sir. Mr. Haas? Uh, the only backup that I uh, that was directed to Northrop Grumman that I'm aware of outside of the normal daily backup that's <coughs> run uh, in an automatic format was prior to us, as we refer to, stopping the bleeding when we set the switches back on the email so we could start capturing email properly again. We made a specific backup of the, all the mail servers for the purpose of preserving the way it was before we set those switches so we could get back into the arms business, if you will, uh, five minutes after that was done. And that, that was the only specific backups that were ordered to be done, and they're done by a server group, well, none of which are present today. So once they found out, or once somebody found out there was a problem, uh, you were told to see if you could do a backup system to correct the problem. It, it's not a backup of the mails. It's a it's a computer-based backup where you just back up the whole disk drive in case uh, of catastrophic events you can restore. We did not back up mail in the sense of mail messages. We backed up the computer disk drives that the mail is on. Okay. But uh, again, that was a, a specific incident that was done as a preservative to the information so that we could go on and reset and start doing uh, arms properly after we had, uh, so we're preserving that. That's two specific sets of tapes that are set aside as part of that inventory they refer to. Thank Any you. other backups are on a normal daily basis and whether they passed or failed uh, successfully, I have no idea. Um, although it appears evident from all your testimony that the White House didn't cause the email problem, and no one has said that the White House sought to destroy any emails. There was a problem with the Arms Lotus interface that may have resulted in emails not being provided to congressional and federal investigators. So I want to find out about the extent of that problem. Uh, when people read articles like those in the Washington Times, they may get the impression the White House has withheld all emails from Congress and federal investigators. In fact, the the members of this committee know this simply isn't true. The White House has, in fact, uh, turned over thousands of emails to Congress. Some of them have been seized on by Chairman Burton and others as serious uh, evidence of wrongdoing. So I'd like to get a sense of what emails we're talking about when we say that certain emails were not captured by this arms Lotus interface. Are we talking about most White House emails, or are we talking about only a small subset of the emails. Uh, Mr. Berry, I'd like to draw upon your expertise with computer systems in the executive office of the president and to ask you to explain the scope of the problem to me. To start with, let me ask you about time frames. The Arms Lotus interface problem was in existence from roughly August 1996 to November 1998. Isn't that right? That's my understanding, yes. And during that roughly 29-month period, how many people were affected by mail to uh, problems? I'm not exactly sure because I don't work on the, the notes side of things, but my, from, here, from what I've heard, it's somewhere between 400 and 500 users. Now, with respect to those people, the mail to problem just prevented incoming email correspondence from being stored in the arms, isn't that right? That's correct. In, incoming external mail, I think there's a, there's a key difference there. I, any internal mail going to those people would have been captured in arms. So we're talking about incoming emails uh, and those are only emails from outside of what? The White House? Outside of the, the White House email system, correct. And uh, that means that an email was written by someone else at the White House or the National Security Council. All that would have been saved by the ARM system, isn't that right? Yes, any mail going to these four, four or 500 users from uh, the notes system within the EOP, actually it's not the White House, it's the Executive Office of the President's system. Um, would be captured in arms. So uh, all the internal emails uh, would have been searched in response to subpoenas and other document requests and provided to this committee and the other investigators. 
That's correct. Okay. And, and also, you know, I, I'd like to point out that um, external mail going to one of these particular four or 500 users that was CC'd or BCC'd to a non-affected 400 or 500 users um, would also have gone to arms. Uh, I understand that you regularly track the number of documents that get put into arms and that you went back and looked at what happened after the mail to problem was fixed prospectively. Uh, now, if the mail to problem was preventing lots of emails from getting into arms, you would expect to see a significant increase in the uh, documents being put into arms after the problem was fixed. So let me ask you, Mr. Berry, did you s see any increase after the November 1998 fix? Well, um, there's, there's a couple of points that need to be made, I think. I, I have been tracking um, all of the records that go into arms, the, the, the numbers of records, by month and by agency since um, 1993. I have all the information all the way back to 1993. And um, I, have, I keep a spreadsheet by month, by agency, on all of that information. And um, I remember uh, I wasn't involved in any of the meetings uh, that, that uh, the rest of the panel were talking about until uh, July of 90, of July 6th of 98. And I remember at, uh, I was involved in a series of technical meetings for about a week and a half after July 6th. And um, I remember, I believe it was Mr. Haas, um, I had asked the question. Well, let me, let me ask you to respond to my question. Uh, okay, sorry. When you looked at the, all these emails, mm -hmm. you kept track of them. The system was fixed prospectively. If there were a lot of emails not going into the system before it was fixed, you would expect to see a big jump in the number of emails after it was fixed. Was there a big jump in the number of emails after it was fixed? Well, there was a jump because we, we have a normal increase in, uh, there's a growth series in, in email, but from what the, the analysis that I have done, um, there was an increase from November to December, which is what you would expect, uh, but it wasn't as big as I had expected given what I had been hearing. That's did, you, did you reach any conclusion about that? I, I reached the conclusion uh, that was in my gut to begin with that yes, we, have a pro we had a problem, and it, it obviously affected some number of emails, but it wasn't as big as the 10% number that I had been given. Or that, that I had been led to believe. Well, let me just again review what we're talking about. Uh, if it's an email that was sent from the any anybody within the White House or Executive Office Building or these uh, White House agent those agencies covered by the system, if it was anything sent by anybody there, th that would have been picked up. Uh, if it was a, an email f internally from one, one person to another within the system, that would have been picked up. What we're talking about were uh, emails from outside of the system to somebody in the system, and uh, but if if that if if that were the case, and one of those emails was sent to somebody inside, and there was a carbon copy or copy directed to somebody else, then that would have been picked up as well in the ARM system, wouldn't it? That's correct. Okay. And if the recipient replied to this email that was received, uh, wouldn't that whole reply and the original email get picked up in the ARM system? If the user had done a reply with history, yes, it would. So there are several ways that emails that were not put into the ARMS uh, initially ended up in the system eventually. Uh, what's more, even if the email wasn't put into ARMS, it may still have been provided to our committee or whoever else was asking for documents. Now, when White House counsel Beth uh, Nolan testifies this afternoon about how the White House responds to subpoenas, She'll tell us that in addition to searching arms, they ask people in the White House or the EOP, the Executive Office of the President, to search their own computers for responsive material. So any emails that were saved by the individual recipients should have been provided even if they were not in the arms. Uh, and any emails from sources that have been subpoenaed, like if there, somebody's looking for a, an email from the Democratic National Committee to somebody in the White House, well, the Democratic National Committee had been subpoenaed for all their emails, so that would have gotten into uh, the submissions to the Independent Council, all the investigating committees and agencies. It appears that we're talking about, uh, in terms of missing emails, uh, a, only a narrow sliver of the total number of White House emails. Mr. Berry, do you agree with that? 
I'm not sure anyone can really tell for sure without going back and actually looking at the stuff, but from the numbers that I have in front of me, it, it, it wasn't as big a problem as I had been led to believe in the early days. Now, the Washington Times article says that the emails uh, were not provided to congressional and federal investigators involved Monica Lewinsky, campaign finance issues, uh, other alleged White House scandals. So I want to ask the, this panel what you know about the content of the missing emails. And as I ask you these questions, there's an important distinction to keep in mind. One issue is whether the emails were captured by the ARM system, and I believe this is called being records uh, managed. Uh, but a second and distinct issue is whether the emails were turned over to investigators. It's possible that some emails may not have been in the arms, but could have been turned over to investigators as a result of other types of email searches. Uh, Mr. Haas, I understand that you conducted a search to determine what kind of emails were not being records managed. Uh, by this, I mean you conducted a search to see what kind of emails were not being captured by arms. Uh, my understanding is that your search involved emails related to Monica Lewinsky. Specifically, I understand that you went into the email accounts of Betty Curry and three people to determine what incoming emails they had related to Monica Lewinsky. Is that right? Partially. I went into several accounts, four, I believe, or five accounts, of which one was Betty Curry and Ashley Raines, and found the cache of uh, Monica Lewinsky documents. I did, however, not search the entire affected group of 525 people for a Monica Lewinsky. I was doing this in a manual process just as you would search your mail file. I went, opened it, and said, show me everything with uh, M.L. Lewinsky on it, and just happened to stumble over those in the four. Beyond that, I was not given any direction, nor do I have the ability to do a massive search of all the mail files on a system. It would take a programmer to write a program to search across mail files. And uh, although I kind of expected I might be asked you know, to have that done later on, it, it never came forward as a request. But I was never instructed to search for anything but that Monica Lewinsky, and it was in the middle of me uh, going through each mail file and counting the number of documents, so it was an interruption to the process, uh, and then I went right back to the process of counting documents. So you were able to find uh, emails that weren't in the ARM system when you looked at the individual uh, individuals who they were listed in the search. particular mail file as not being sent through to arms because they still existed in this view whether they had another means to arrive there what, through the processes that mr barry has described of a bcc to another agency or retransmitted out by the original uh, recipient i have no way of knowing that mr. But Waxman, I would, perhaps we can be helpful here our other client cheryl hall is prepared uh, to testify here today that Mr. Uh, Mr. Haas Mr. browsed Chairman, through uh, other files. Mr. Chairman, I, point of order, I, I know uh, the counsel. attorney is actively involved yes, in and, and I do appreciate his own point of view, but... Stop the clock. Just I thought you are here for the truth. Uh, yeah, we want to hear the truth. Uh, Let me pursue uh, my question uh, so I can see if I can get to it. stop the clock just one second. Let me point of order. Uh, we do appreciate your help very much in, in bringing all this to our attention. Uh, but the counsel, uh, if... if Ms. Lambeth wants to make a comment. She should uh, direct her uh, uh, question or comment or anybody to Mr. Waxman and not the legal counsel. Legal counsel is to just confer with their clients. Yes, that's but a, that's Mr. A Burton, rule. let me address this to you because we brought Ms. Hall. We offered to make her available. Now, I don't understand why your committee won't let her testify here today. Mr. Uh, well, well, we'll 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 confer about that. Uh, and uh, but but pl please confer with your client, Mr. Waxman. Well, maybe we'll want to hear from her, but meanwhile, we've heard from all of these people, and I want to ask some questions just so we can understand more about what, what was going on. So, Mr. Huss, you found a bunch of, of emails uh, about Monica Lewinsky that weren't on the ARM system. Is that right? I, I can only tell you that the mail file I found them in said they were not on the ARM system. Whether they arrived there through a secondary process, I have no way of knowing. So, so they could have arrived there from a secondary process, meaning what? They responded to or copied to somebody? They might have also been... In Anything that, is uh, possible. Okay. Now, the fact that these uh, emails were not in the ARM system doesn't necessarily mean they weren't turned over to the independent counsel, Ken Starr. When the White House responds to a document request, they do more than simply search the arms. 
Uh, they also ask the relevant individuals to search their own email accounts. Uh, these individual searches could have turned up the same emails that Mr. Haas found. Mr. Haas, do you know whether the Monica Lewinsky emails that you found were new emails that had not been previously turned over to the independent counsel? I do not know that, but I can state that with uh, having worked at the agency for nine years and having received those requests for documents over many years, we were instructed we did not have to search our own mail files. Be, be advised, the mail files are not on your local hard drive. You are reaching across the network and looking into the server. That's why the arms process had to be created to take care of the things that you really couldn't do. The search criteria ability within Lotus Notes at our current site is minimal for finding a group of documents. If you were to search your own mail file and look for Monica Lewinsky uh, using the standard search methodology, you would not find what I found. But because of my expertise in the area, I was able to find a, a way to, to locate them in the three files that, I mean, the five files that I opened and find those messages and then collect them together and present them to my management as we requested. So you found that there were emails that were not on the Lotus system or may not have been on the Lotus system, but do you know yourself whether these emails might have been turned over to the independent counsel independently of what was turned over from the Lotus system? The only thing I know is I was asked to print them all out and put them in, uh, onto paper, put them in an uh, expandable folder. I presented them to Betty Lambeth and she uh, informed me that she delivered them to what I think is White House counsel in the old building, handed them off to an unknown person. That, that's secondhand hearsay. The person I handed it off to was Mark Lindsay. The request was that they were printed off, Bob, print these emails off, and I hand delivered them over to the old executive office building to Mark Lindsay, who was over there in a meeting. Thank you. Well, I, I think I know the answer to the question, uh, because my, ask, my staff asked Beth Nolan, who we're going to hear from later, uh, about this issue. And she told us, and I understand she'll testify to this point later, that all the Monica Lewinsky emails you found were du duplicative. Uh, they were copies of emails that the counsel's office had already turned over to the independent counsel. Uh, the emails were not in the arms. I'm going to stop for a minute while this bells are ringing. These emails were not in the arms system, but they were in uh, Betty Curry and some of these other people's, uh, I, I'm not technical enough to t explain exactly what it is, but it was in their computer. And you made copies of them, they were turned over to the White House, and those emails were turned over, uh, and we'll hear later from the uh, White House counsel, to the independent counsel. So the emails were not in arms, but they'd been captured by the independent searches of email accounts of Betty Curry and other individuals. And I think this is an important point because the Washington Times reported that these emails had been withheld. But in fact, that's not true. They'd already been turned over. Now, Mr. Haas, do you have any knowledge about the content of any of the individual emails that were not turned over to investigators? I, again, don't know of documents that weren't turned over. That's, that uh, is not my knowledge. Well, I did read the two Monica Lewinsky emails to validate the incoming and outgoing event uh, that I was asked to uh, check into. So yes, I read two of those uh, reference documents. Whether they were turned over, I don't know. I wouldn't expect you to know. Well, the individual who's been making the most vociferous allegations against the White House is Cheryl Hall, who was a former White House employee. She's the source for the Washington Times article. And uh, I was quoting that article. She gave a deposition about the content of the emails on February 19, 2000. In the deposition, she says that she was told by a Northrop Grumman contractor that the missing emails contained information relating to Filegate, Monica Lewinsky, and Vice President Gore's fundraising. She then said under oath, and I quote, I was told by this contractor that if the contents of the emails became known, then there would be different outcomes to these scandals, as the emails were incriminating and could cause people to go to jail. Uh, you're the Northrop uh, 
groom and employees uh, who knew the most about these emails. Uh, Ms. Salim, let me ask you first, are you aware of any information that would substantiate Ms. Hall's uh, accusations? No, sir. Uh, Mr. Spriggs? The only thing that I can think of that may even come close to doing that uh, is that early on we speculated about possible uh, information but had no direct knowledge of what was in it uh, and you know so we had no information to give her or Miss Lambeth or anyone else. Mr. Berry, do you know? No, I don't. Any new? Mr. Hawkins? No, sir. Ms. Golas? Sure. Mr. Haas? No, sir. Ms. Lambeth? I still stand behind what I said before that I was told that there was other important information, file gate, et cetera. But you were told by Mr. Haas, and Mr. Yes. Haas testified that he didn't tell you that. I understand, sir. I am saying I still stand I... behind what I was, what I stated that I was told. I also object that's not what he testified to, Mr. Waxman. That's false. Mr. Uh, 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 only, only the witnesses can testify and and she, she I'm not testifying I'm objecting well you're, you're not allowed to object Chairman, then, then I, you should admonish your colleague there because that was not the testimony well mr. Clayman uh, your witness is perfectly capable of refuting any remarks that are made mr. Waxman well, mr. Haas let's, just, I, let's get she said she you told her did you tell her that you knew the I contents I never ever intimated in any way shape or form that I knew any content of any emails other than the two Monica Lewinsky documents to that point there was lots of conversation within our group as to if there was ever found to be a large content of anything involving these five or six different events, it would be a different story. But if she may have misunderstood that to say, I saw something in there, but I have never ever seen anything in those documents except for the two Monica Lewinsky documents. Before my time's completely up, I want to go into this whole question of the so-called threats, mm -hmm. uh, jail threat, particularly the Washington Times reported uh, you were told that there was a jail cell with your name on it. If you discussed the missing emails with anybody, this threat is supposed to have occurred in a meeting uh, attended with Laura Crabtree on June 15, 1998. Mark Lindsay also reportedly participated in at least uh, part of these uh, meetings by telephone. Ms. Uh, Salim, you were the first person to discover the email problem, and you, you were at that June 1998 meeting. Uh, do you recall being threatened with jail if you discussed the problems with others? No, sir. I do not remember hearing the word jail from anyone in that meeting. Well, as, uh, and Mr. Haas, my understanding is you have a different recollection. You yes, sir, but I posed the question to her, and she was answering me directly, so I would remember. In your statement, you said the question was sort of flippantly asked. Do you think that the response might have been a flippant response? I did not take it that way, sir. Uh, I didn't want to read any more or less into it. I had sealed my mind that uh, I'd been instructed to treat it in the manner that she instructed. Don't talk to anyone or else. I took it at face value, and I lived up to that face value until I couldn't do it anymore. At the time they were finding, uh, you were all finding about this computer problem, the president was being investigated by Ken Starr for impeachable offenses. There was a media frenzy going on outside the White House. It seems clear that Mr. Lindsay and Ms. Crabtree did not want any of you to talk to the press or to people who might talk to the press about the problem until the nature and scope of the problems was understood. I'd like to ask whether you think this was an unreasonable request. Anybody think it was an unreasonable request? I think in the beginning, that's the way we all felt, but it also became very obvious that they weren't going to do, make any moves to release this information. That's to release conclusion. the information that conclusion. there were emails well, found. Okay, but did any of the rest of you think that maybe there was, uh, it was reasonable not to want to have this information, that the system wasn't working? Available to the press when they're on a media frenzy and people are out to impeach the president? Ms. Salim, what do you think? I believe that that was a reasonable request for them to ask us to keep a lid on this until they could manage the situation. Mr. Spriggs, what's your opinion? From, from my point of view, the, uh, the fact that we didn't know how many messages actually were involved, we didn't know the content of it, uh, while we may have speculated about its implications and what was going on, the reality was we needed to figure out 
what the problem was and how we were going to deal with getting these in the records management system. Uh, when Betty, uh, through whomever directed her to do so, told Bob to get information, uh, he, he proceeded to do that in a deliberate manner, and it took him several weeks to accomplish it. Uh, there was no, from my point of view, any kind of um, uh, question that we were not going to proceed forward with this and resolve this question. Uh, we were trying to get all of the information so that uh, whomever, OA counsel or White House counsel, would have sufficient information to be able to judge the import of the information that they had. As far as I knew personally, and I, my colleagues can speak to, to what they knew, uh, I had no knowledge of anyone trying to stop us from doing any of that uh, or trying to keep any information away from uh, uh, the star or anyone else uh, at that point. I know if my office were being investigated, I was being investigated, and we found that we thought we gave all the materials to the um, White House counsel and all the people that were investigating me, and then I found out the system wasn't working the way it was intended, I'd tell everybody, let's hold off and see what's going on here, and let's correct the system. I, I just have one last question. Um, Mr. Hawkins, people didn't want them to talk to you. Was that because they might have had a fear that you might have come back and said, this is outside the scope of the Northrop Grumman contract and you might not go out and fix it? I believe their intent, uh, because they had a computer failure, uh, they should have at least acknowledged within their own uh, civil service and follow contractual guidelines. I believe, in my own opinion, that they did try to cover up the fact that they had a computer glitch and there were emails involved, and it did include the uh, president, Monica Lewinsky. I had at no time did I ever feel that they were trying to be upfront and open and honest because of my, my discussions with Mr. Lindsay. So you got that opinion from, your, your impression was Mr. Lindsay? From Mr. Lindsay. Okay, well, I guess we're gonna hear from him and we'll find out Ms. more about it. Mr. Waxman, um, I'd like to say that I, agree with what John says. As I said a few minutes ago, I think in the beginning we all felt that they just wanted to get their, um, their act together, basically, how they were going to, to let the public know about this. But as time went on and we couldn't get any decisions of how they wanted us to handle it, what the next step was going to be, et cetera, it became very obvious to us, and we had some discussions on this, that um, they did not want this to come forth. Um, I think one of the critical you things some, that we you need... You had some discussions am among... Amongst our... It, within the team. And so you, in talking to the team and trying to figure out what was going on, you first thought they were trying to make sure you could correct the problem, but then you reached the conclusion that they were really trying to cover it up. But that doesn't sound to me like the testimony of the others on this panel who were part of the team. Am I wrong? May I hear from others on the team? Mr. Chairman, if we could have regular order, I, I think the time has expired and we have some votes. We do have please. votes. As soon as well, they, let's just get an answer to this and then we can I think the time through. has expired. Now well, we'll it has expired. I, I will let these people answer this question and then we'll come back as soon as both. And those who want to go ahead and at the floor, come right back. We'll proceed because we're, we have to take off here real quick. Okay. Um, again, to the extent that, that there was, from my conversations with her and, and uh, with the team, the question arose as to whether or not... We have, regular, we have a vote on the floor and there are members that don't want to miss the questioning and the answer. All right, we'll, 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 we'll withhold answers to the question until we return. Stand in recess.
Here's our programming schedule for tonight and tomorrow morning. Coming up, we'll continue with more of today's hearing on Capitol Hill, looking into the recent discovery of subpoenaed White House email. Later tomorrow morning, entertainer Dolly Parton talks about literacy issues. After that, a hearing on the fiscal year 2001 budget for the National Endowment for the Humanities. Why did these men visit the grave sites of 41 presidents, and what did they discover? For answers to these and other questions about C-SPAN's new book, Who's Buried in Grant's Tomb? Join Brian Lamb and historian Richard Norton Smith this Sunday morning at 9.30 Eastern or Sunday night at 9.30 Eastern on Book TV. 48 hours of nonfiction books all weekend on TV. Book TV on C-SPAN 2. For a complete program schedule, simply go to booktv.org. Who's Buried in Grant's Tomb? This one-of-a-kind guidebook is for history buffs and tourists alike. It's full of facts about the American presidents, how they lived, how they died, and all the information needed to visit their grave sites. From ornate monuments in America's largest cities, to small plots tucked away in tiny towns. Who's Buried in Grant's Tomb is available from your local bookseller, online, and directly from C-SPAN, two easy ways. Call toll-free during normal business hours to 1-877-ON-C-SPAN. That's 1-877-662-7726. Or order it online anytime at cspan.org slash shop. Who's Buried in Grant's Tomb is $14.95 plus shipping and handling at cspan.org slash shop. Now more from today's hearing into subpoenaed White House email. The House Government Reform Committee is investigating the discovery of the email, which had not been archived as required by law, and then provided to investigators looking into White House matters. The committee, led by Indiana Congressman Dan Burton, heard today from employees of Northrop Grumman, who managed the White House email system. This portion of the hearing is about three hours. Do the people at the table recall the last question? There was, you don't recall the last question? Are you? Well, Okay, we're going to allow Mr. Waxman to end his uh, questioning with that question because we were interrupted by the vote, and then we'll go to Mr. Barr. Uh, Ms. Lambeth testified, as I understood it, a minute ago, ago, that at first she thought that the White House was trying to correct the computer problem. But then she came to a different conclusion, and I asked her why, and she said, well, in talking to the rest of the, the team. Now, um, some of you were part of the team. Was this conclusion one you had reached, and was it just one that you all speculated about, or, or do you agree with her conclusion, and do you have reasons to agree with that conclusion, or not agree? When Betty left the, uh, when Miss Lambeth left the uh, contract uh, right before she had left, there was a lot of discussion about. Uh, what had happened and, uh, you know, about what was going on uh, around us. And again, we didn't have her uh, access uh, to Laura and higher up. So a lot of the stuff we would hear uh, would come through her. And, and we were, as far as I was concerned, you know, trying to be responsive and, and supportive of her. We also, I think, because of the things that had happened between uh, uh, Mr. Hawkins and, and Ms. Lambeth, we were all very, uh, you know, aware of that situation. The, the question of whether or not we had arrived at a conclusion that the White House was obstructing anything, 
th there were so many technical issues and problems associated with this. And her having left in July, uh, it turned out many other technical issues were of, of import of importance to us. Uh, at that point, whether or not Betty leaving felt like that, uh, you know, a consensus was that we were supporting her and that we believed that. I, I don't. I did not have that position. Um, although I do feel that at times that Betty, you know, uh, again, had superior other information that I didn't have, so I couldn't really say whether or not anyone was doing anything to, to stop it. Uh, again, from my point of view, we didn't know enough about what was going on to say that the White House had stopped anything. It was more of a technical problem that we were worried about and that that's what we were really after was the technical uh, solution. Uh, before we proceed with Mr. Barr, let me just say that uh, it's been well established early on that all of the people that were in the meeting felt uh, either threatened or felt concerned if they gave any information out about that. Now, let me just say one other thing. Well, I don't uh, think that was established. Yes, it was established. Uh, you may have reached that conclusion, but I don't think that's okay, the well, testimony. Okay, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask Mr. Barr when he questions to reestablish that they all felt concerned or threatened by the comments made by Ms. Crabtree or Mr. Le, uh, Mr. Uh, Lindsay, but we'll let him do that. But I just want to admonish all the witnesses to this, this one fact. We're going to find some additional information, I believe, before the day is out, or if not today, later, about uh, these emails, because we're not going to let this thing drop. And if anybody purges themselves before this committee, I will send a criminal referral to the Justice Department and they will be prosecuted or we will pursue that. So I want anybody that's, that's that, I mean, there's some differences of opinion here. And if somebody's not telling the truth, I want you to know that's very, very disconcerting and you need to think about that and, 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 and get this and, and be as square and honest with this committee as possible because if we find out you're lying, there will be a problem. Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I believe that uh, when Mr. Waxman was asking his last round of questions before uh, we broke for the vote, he was indicating that in his view, uh, and I presume he was talking as a manager, a, a congressman with regard to his staff, uh, he finds nothing wrong with uh, calling people into his office and telling them that they're going to go to jail if they even tell their spouse or their supervisor. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. I, I just uh, about, think he ought to uh, ask his questions instead of uh, trying to attribute to me whether, anything whether one way or, or the other. Let him, uh, let him ask his own questions. I'll speak for myself. Let him speak for himself. Uh, that is not a legitimate point of order. The gentleman has the time. Thank you. Before we, uh, we broke uh, for the, uh, the last votes, uh, Mr. Waxman was going on in an effort to try and trivialize uh, the intimidation that a number of you felt uh, when you were admonished by Ms. Crabtree, for instance, uh, not to speak to anybody under threat of going to jail if you exercise your rights to inform your supervisor of a problem if you told anybody about it. Now, while that may be standard operating procedure for certain members of this committee, it is not for this member, and I think I can speak for the chairman, that it is not for him either. Uh, when somebody calls you for example, Ms. Lambeth into their office and threatens you with going to jail uh, if you tell your supervisor about a problem that you believe needs to be corrected, do you find that intimidating? Most definitely. Is there anybody else on the panel that would not find that intimidating? Maybe I don't understand the word intimidating, but I, I'm somewhat intimidated by Mr. Burton's comments here. Uh, I think that Mr. Burton, I think, did the rightful job that's, to express... That's, that's fine, Mr. Cruz. I'm not, a, Am I'm I not asking you how you feel about Mr. Burton's testimony. I appreciate the fact that you want to say that, and you've said it. Now let's move on. My question had nothing to do with Mr. Burton. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so don't interject something that is not asked for. If Mr. Waxman would like you to go on in support of what he's saying, I'm sure he, will, he is very adept at doing that. My question was simply... Are there any other members of the panel that are here today that if they are called into somebody's office and threatened with going to jail, if they tell anybody about a problem that they have identified, and that includes even going to their supervisor to try and get it rectified, is that not intimidating? When I was called into that office and Ms. Crabtree and Mr. Lindsay were giving me instructions, I perceived that those instructions were reasonable, 
That's, that's, instructions. Okay, that, that's not what were I'm they asking you, Mr. Spriggs. I know, sir. I, I'm trying to get at your, your yes. question. Were they threatening get to at me? It quickly. Were they threatening to me? Yes, they were threatening to okay. me. In, that's, in, that's my in a only narrow question. Context. I have other questions here, and I appreciate your candor. And if you have other things to say, I'm sure you can work it out with Mr. Waxman to say them. I'm not interested in that, and I'm not interested in how you feel about Mr. Burton. Uh, is there anybody else that would not feel somewhat intimidated if they were threatened with going to jail if they told their supervisor about a problem that they had discovered? Okay. Now, uh, Mr. Barry. Uh, it's my understanding that you were asked in January or February of 1998 to locate an email from Monica Lewinsky to Ashley Raines. That is correct, isn't it? Uh, not exactly. Okay. Were you asked at some other time to find an email from Monica Lewinsky to Ashley Raines, other than January or February of 1998? No, I was asked by White House counsel to uh, perform an arms search, a search of the arms okay, system. When you say White House counsel, specifically who? Mr. I, can't Ruff? I can't remember. No, not Mr. Okay, Ruff. by the office of White House counsel. Correct. Who was it that called you up? There's no such person as White House counsel. There are particular people. Who was it that called you from the White House counsel's office? Uh, I can't remember, sir. I get, I get three, four uh, search requests every month, so I, I can't remember back in 98 exactly who it was. But it will be in the record, though. I have emails of all of that stuff. Okay, so if, uh, if in fact we subpoena those documents for the White House or you assert with a subpoena for the production of them, that would be reflected in those documents. That's correct. And you could refresh your recollection. That's correct. Okay. Uh, so that's what prompted you to look for that particular email. Is it no, I was never asked to look for a particular email. I was asked to perform a, an email search, uh, uh, not an email search, an arms search, a search of the arms system. Right. Uh, in 90, in January of 98. For what? Uh, for, I can't remember the specifics of it, but it had to do with the Lewinsky matter. Okay. And that's when you went to Mr. Spriggs to help locate that material? No. Okay. I, well, what if, time if, did you go to Mr. Spriggs? Well, if I could, let me just give you a little bit of the history, if, if I can. Um, I was asked to perform the search, as, as normally happens. I do uh, the armed searches, and... Uh, during the production of those documents, you discovered a problem. I discovered what not. I didn't know it was a problem. I discovered what looked like conversational email between two people, and I only saw one side of the conversation. Right. So there appeared to be a gap. Yes. Okay. Now you wrote an incident report on that, did you not? That's correct. Okay. Where is that incident report? Uh, I believe it was produced. Uh, do you have that with you? Yes, I do. Okay, could I see a copy of that, please? Mr. Barr, <coughs> we'll need to wrap your questions up. Okay. Forget it then, we don't have time. Thank you. Uh, the <coughs> chair recognizes Mr. Souter for questions. <coughs> I thank the chair. I, ha I, w I had a... Um, a few questions. At first, I wanted to establish, because I thought it was kind of <clears throat> confusing, but as I understood, and, and correct me if any of these are uh, incorrect, that the number of, of emails, um, uh, whether they were a small subset or a large subset, there were 525 people. I think that's what Mr. Haas said. Yes, that's correct. Um, and those 525 people that are uh, in doubt here are the 525 people that are at the higher echelons of the White House, uh, uh, not civil service, but political appointees? Uh, it, it's, it's the whole White House organization and some of their uh, less, lesser organizations, but to my knowledge, uh, it, it is the White House. In other words, um, to say it's a small subset is a little misleading since this subset happens to be who we were investigating during the period of 1996 to 1998 and whose testimony we were seeking. So uh, if there were 525 people in the government who we most needed, it was these 525, um, <clears throat> most likely. That secondly, 
My technical understanding of this is, is that the, the, the part that we're, the only thing in dispute here um, from Mr. Barry, I think, was whether he expected to see 10% and he saw 5% based on the number of emails just for 97. If indeed it was 5%, it would, it would have been roughly 400, uh, 205,000 for 97, it have been 400,000, it was 10%. So it's not a small number that we're talking about. The only question you were really disputing is whether it's 5% or 10%. Is that right? No, I don't think that's what I said. I, all I said was that... Um, you said it, you, did, in, you expected to see 10%. Uh, the numbers that had been thrown out when I first asked about it, when I was involved in the technical meetings in July of 98, I, my concern was if there were these missing emails, uh, what impact was it going to have on the ARM system when they were when they became unmissing? And you said that there and was five percent, roughly. You said there was an increase, but it wasn't ten percent. Um, you said no, 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 no. I, I said when you went back in no, to check. I, I think I need to clarify this because when I went back um, and looked at the growth numbers between. Uh, November of 98 and December of 98, which would be the significant ones in this case, um, yeah, I saw months. nothing other than what I would normally expect in the growth between one month and the other, given the trend line that, that we have in place. Okay, so that's a different number than what I was looking for. So th that my understanding is there's been a dispute between whether it's uh, what the number is, but we're talking about hundreds of thousands of emails. And I don't know that anyone know. I don't certainly don't know what the actual numbers are of, of these, these emails. I have no idea. And it was also um, uh, my understanding from the earlier testimony of Mr. Hawkins that if I understood you correctly, you said that you believed that um, there was a, uh, that they were trying to cover up and that there, there was concern about the civil service contract. Could, could you elaborate on what you meant by that? When I uh, first was uh, contacted, of course, about the email, uh, and it, we didn't know it was email, it was through Jim Wright, the, the contracting officer's technical representative, COTAR. Subsequent to that, I was called to Mr. Lindsay's office, and at that time, uh, I was confronted by Mr. Uh, Lindsay, uh, uh, Mark Lindsay, uh, why I got, got involved. And I basically told him because of the contract, it was very specific in the contract that the COTAR gave directions to the program manager and no one else. And therefore, uh, I took the position that I could not support this project and would not do it without an uh, internal work order, which was compliant with our contract. At uh, two or three points in the conversation, it got very uh, tense. Uh, matter of fact, Mr. Lindsay said over and over, I hope you appreciate my position here. And I repeated back to him, I hope you appreciate my position here. What do you think that, what he meant by, I hope you appreciate? I, I took it straight as a strong arm. I took it as a direct uh, assertion that my employees should go do this work and I should not be involved. To the contrary, the contracting officer, which was Dell Helms, Mr. Jim Wright, gave me explicit instructions when we talked, don't quote Crater in. And I never did at any time. And I did feel threatened the whole meeting with when Mr. You, Lindsay. When you uh, do, um, uh, contract employees have any of the protections that civil service employees have? In other words, if patronage employees come wandering in and, and intimidate on a contract, you don't have any protection? No, sir. Matter of fact, in my conversation with Mr. Lindsay, I told him that the Northrop Grumman employees would be the one direct in line of fire. I also told him that I was not going to put Northrop Grumman as a company or Steve Hawkins in direct harm's way. I also made a statement that I did not want my company's name in the newspaper, nor mine, or any of my employees. So I was very, very direct with Mr. Lindsay, and he did ask me, or he did make a statement that he was extremely upset, and he used a word, and I can give you the exact phrase if you want it. Probably not. Can you okay. It? And I said that was my position, and he and we. We ended the conversation, and at which time I left his office, and immediately when I went to, back to my office, Jim Wright was in the office. Dell Helms came in shortly thereafter. Jim Wright asked me if I cratered in, okay. and I said, no, sir, I did not. 
And he said, that's why we hired you to work here at EOP, because we knew you would stand up. I believe even a Gen gentleman's time has expired. We'll, we'll go to a second round, uh, uh, so we'll get back to you in just a minute. Uh, let me clarify one thing before we go to Ms. Chenoweth. Uh, Mr. Spriggs, you said you felt intimidated. Uh, I have made this comment to almost, uh, to a number. If somebody purges themselves before my committee, we will send a criminal referral to the Justice Department. Now, if that's intimidation that you feel, so be it. But I want people to be truthful, and that's why we always make that statement. Ms. Chenoweth? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to direct my questions to Mr. Berry, and just to clarify some of the facts that have been established in the record. Uh, isn't it true that you noticed two ongoing or outgoing emails from uh, Ashley Raines to Monica Lewinsky, and that is what first triggered your your concern that there may be an anomaly in the system? Is that not correct? That's correct, and um, actually, that that's what I was uh, what I referred to in the document that I had written up at, in January of '98. And so then you went ahead and went on vacation right after that um no that's not correct that it was in january of 98 was when i first i was asked to do the search and i saw this conversational email during the production of the search documents of which there was just one converse one side of the conversation i then as it says in my document i went and i i uh, the document i wrote in january of 98 I talked to John Spriggs, first of all, to have him look at the logs for incoming and outgoing email, and to, because I didn't know what was the, the I don't know what the, the problem was, if there even was a problem. I mean, the, the, it's a possibility that the mail never got to the EOP. That was one, the first thing that came into my mind. All I knew was that this piece of, these pieces of email that I thought should be there were not in arms. So what you saw that was out of order um, was you noticed emails from Ashley Raines to Monica Lewinsky, but that Monica Lewinsky's emails were not present. Some of, at least one of them, or two of them, I can't remember exactly, I think it might have been at least two of them. Because it's like a telephone conversation, you could see, you know, an outbound email saying, can you pick me up after work, an incoming one saying, you know, that should have said, yes, I will, and then an outbound one saying, oh, great, I'll meet you at five, that type of thing. And I didn't see the incoming, but it was clear that there should have been something. Now, who who did you give this incident report to? You made up an incident report about this. I documented the problem, yes. And who did you give the uh, report to? I gave it to my supervisor. And your supervisor was Jim Wright? Jim Wright, that's, that's correct. Been established. Now, is that who you would ordinarily refer these problems to? Um, I'm not sure that they, uh, this this is a kind of a one-of-a-kind problem, uh, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, there, there have been problems in the past with the notes arms interface, and I've documented them and passed them on to the appropriate person, who would have been the branch chief. Um, the branch chief of... Uh... Of the either the systems integration and development or the desktop branch okay. chief. Okay, okay. And once you gave this report to uh, Mr. Wright, what happened to the report? Um, we, I, I can't speak for exactly what happened to it. All I know is that I kept it. Well, and let me ask this. Did you follow up and ask any questions about the report? And, and did the White House uh, office uh, seem interested in, in the problem? Well, like I said, I reported the, the problem to my supervisor, and I remember, not, although not vividly, that uh, my supervisor and myself went and briefed the uh, IST associate director at the time, Kathy Gallant, of the problem. But I can't remember exactly when that was in the sequence of things, but it was sometime in the January, February time frame. Um, did anyone instruct you to keep the problem silent? No. Now, well, uh, when you first uh, went to Ms. Lambert's office, were, was there a discussion there? Well, that was subsequent to that. The, 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 um, this, this document was written in January of 98, and I didn't hear anything more about this whole uh, situation until the actual problem that caused what I had seen back in January to occur was discovered sometime in June. I was brought into the loop in July of, of 98. 
So it wasn't clear to me, my, my point is it wasn't clear to me at all. In fact, it said, if, if you read the document, it says in there, it's, you can't tell if this is a systemic problem, if it's a one of a kind problem, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it says it all right in there because I didn't know at that time. Let me ask for the record, did you uh, give your re weekly reports during this time to Mr. Wright? I believe so, yes. Um, do you know what he did with those reports? Um, I have no way of telling what do he did. Do you know who else saw those reports? I have no way of knowing. Mr. Barry, the documents that I've reviewed show that you were very, very frustrated about the lack of instruction or direction that you were getting in this manner. And I'm going to briefly point out a few of those documents and ask um, for your brief comment on them. I would like for you to turn to the White House exhibit number 12, dated January 24th, more than two months after the problem became known. Excuse me, ma'am, exhibit 12. White House exhibit number 12. Do you have the exhibit? Yes, I do. Now look at the entry under the section entitled Additional Activities. And it reads, I continue to be involved in discussions regarding the mail two problem, but there has been no movement thus far on correcting the problems or getting the data over to arms. That's correct. That's, well, that's yes, that's what I said. Okay. Now look at exhibit. Uh, uh, General Lady's time has expired, but we will yield to uh, Mr. La Tourette and uh, I, I thank the chair, and I'd, I'd like to uh, yield such time as she, she might take for uh, Ms. Chenoweth to complete this line of questioning, if that's all right. I thank the gentleman. We'll get the gentleman more time later. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like, I would direct your attention to White, Out, White House Exhibit Number 16, an email from you to your boss, dated 8-13-98. Yes. Okay. In pertinent part, the second paragraph reads uh, as follows. I am very concerned about several aspects of this problem. As far as I can tell, there is no movement underway to fix the problem and recover the lost records from the backup tapes. When I talk to Sandy Golas and John Spriggs or Bob Haas, they tell me that there is no movement on this project from their side, and the last activity was the meeting that we had with Barry before she, Betty before she left on 728, correct? That's what I said, yes. All right. Later, the document says that the only, and I quote, the only people I have, I have been in contact with on this project are you, that's your boss, Kathy, Betty, Sandy, Bob, and John. I have not spoken to any other government person on this, and I am not at all clear what my role should be. I feel the records must be recreated, and any searches need to be re-performed if the requesters feel it is necessary. This seems like a daunting proposition, but I do not see any other alternative. Correct? That's what I said, yes. The email concludes, this is the same document, in the second to the last paragraph with, and I quote, I apologize for the rambling nature of this memo, but I hope it captures my concerns and frustration level, end quote. Mr. Berry, you sound like a real voice in the wilderness. Can you uh, state for the committee you were frustrated when you wrote those emails? Yes, I was definitely frustrated. Would you please turn to White House exhibit number 40, an email from Kathy Gallant to you dated September 25th, 1998? Yes. Mr. Barry, in this letter, uh, Ms. Gallant notes that in her meeting with uh, Joe Vasta, Mr. Hawkins' replacement, uh, Logicom PM, a subcontractor, and John Spriggs and Jim Webster, a two-phase strategy was discussed at that time to respond to the pro problem. But in the second to the last paragraph, C C Kathy Gallant observes that, and I quote, 
contracts is aware of this whole mess and supports the creation of an IWO to clarify what is to be done and when, end quote. And then she concludes, quote, please, no jumping out the window. It's not necessary, end quote. Now, I appreciate the humor here, but why would Ms. Gallant feel the need to say something like that in a memo? I'm not sure. I, pr probably in response to my level of frustration. All right, I yield back the balance of my time to Mr. La Tourette. Thank you. I, I thank you. Uh, I don't know how much time remains on the, the clock, but just a, a couple of quick observations, Mr. Spriggs. I, I wouldn't be intimidated by a, a, a referral by this committee to the Department of Justice. Their performance and other referrals we've made should leave you anything but intimidated. <laughs> and I, I just want to uh, make, make a couple of observations, uh, and that is we're, I want to talk about the two phases of this, sort of for the record's sake. One is we're, we're not talking about some, some exercise that's not important. Uh, and there were two steps. One is you had to fix the problem. I believe it was called Stop the Bleeding. Is that right, Mr. Barry? You had to, you had to figure out why incoming emails to the White House were not being captured. And that, that was done in a, a fairly speedy fashion, was it not? You, you stopped the bleeding, or you believed you stopped the bleeding. Is that right? Uh, um, well, I, I was involved only, again, from the arms perspective, and I was only involved in the, the first two weeks of technical meetings starting in July of 96. Uh, the best of my knowledge, the, the quote-unquote bleeding was stopped in November of 98. Okay, but the second problem is that you had a period of time where emails that were not captured by the armed system are still someplace out there. And, and I think that when Ms. Chenoweth was talking to you, that, that was some of the frustration, that no effort, okay, maybe we stopped the bleeding, maybe we haven't, but no effort is being made to, to retrieve what we recognize as a whole body of stuff that didn't make it into the armed system, is that right? Well, I think my first source of my frustration was that um, I had I had been involved for the first two weeks, starting in June, July of '98, and then had heard nothing after that until November. Can I just ask one more question? May I ask uh, unanimous consent the gentleman be given two additional minutes? He yielded his time. I, 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 I appreciate fair. the courtesy. Thank you. Uh, without objection, so order. I appreciate the courtesy. I I, I just wanted to, to point out that, and anybody on the panel can answer this. The the reason that this is important. Uh, and there's been some criticism uh, from the White House that, you know, you, you, you goofy Republicans, you want us to spend a lot of money and, and recreate stuff from, from files that are locked up, and it's going to cost us a lot of dough to do this. You have to, under the law, not only the Armstrong decision, but the federal public records law, take these emails that have not been captured by arms, put them in the arms system so that they may be responsive to those who may seek these public documents in the future. Isn't, isn't, that, isn't that the law? I, I'm not really a legal person, but... Um, well, then let me ask somebody else. Any of you, are you aware of the public records law, Mr. Haas? How about you? I've just recently been told that. I did not know that, but it makes sense. Well, I, I think it does make sense, and I, I would tell you that uh, I'm not a, a legal expert either, but I believe that there's a case called Armstrong versus the Executive Office of the President that extends federal record-keeping mandate to electronic mail. And the reason that you have the arms system is so that these electronic emails can be captured, and when somebody like a, a court or a, a committee of Congress wants them, you can search by, you know, Lewinsky or, or Filegate or whatever the case may be and pull them up, and you don't have to go through the laborious process that, that Mr. Haas apparently went through. And, and so somebody has to do this anyway, or else the, the, uh, the White House is out of compliance with federal law and the Armstrong decision. I mean, does anybody disagree with me? But is that a fair observation? Uh, right? Okay. I, I'm going to take silence as a scent, which is always a dangerous <laughs> yes. thing. And, and in the next round of questioning, I, I want to come back. Uh, I, I hope we're going to have another round, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Hawkins, I, I want to talk to you specifically ab about where did Mr. Hawkins go? <laughs> Mr. Hawkins will be back shortly. Oh, good. I, well, maybe Mr. Hawkins doesn't want to talk to me, but I, <laughs> uh, I want to talk to Mr. Hawkins about the, the meeting that took place with Mr. Lindsay and, and Ms. Crabtree. And Ms. Golas, you've sort of been ignored here for the, the last three hours, and I, I want to talk to you about your experiences and your specific recollections. And I thank you, Mr. Waxman, for the courtesy and yield back. Uh, <clears throat> we will uh, go to a second round, and I want to tell the panel and the members, uh, we would like to finish with this panel and then break for lunch. Uh, uh, I, I hope we would be uh, concluding more quickly, but there seems to be additional questions that are coming up that, that have to be addressed. So uh, if somebody has to go to the bathroom or something, uh, if you all do, we can take a five-minute recess, but we'll break for lunch as soon as we finish with this panel. Mr. Barr. Thank you. 
Uh, Mr. Berry, during the break that I, I consulted with our counsel here, we don't have a copy of your uh, incident report that apparently has not been furnished to us. Could we have a copy of that, please? Yes, sir. Was a was a copy of your incident report uh, provided? It was produced, to you? Congressman. Pardon? Was produced. And who are you? I'm counsel to uh, the Office of Administration, Congressman. Okay. And what's your name? John Harden Young. Okay. And you're employed by the White House? No, I'm not. But uh, who employs you? I mean, who are you retained Director by? Director of the Office of Administration. The what? Director of the Office of Administration. The Office of Administration. Executive Office of the President. Okay. And you are employed by? The Office of Administration the Executive Office White of House. the President. No. The Office of Administration the Executive Office of the President. Okay. Is that an agency of another government? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I appreciate the office. fact that you're an attorney and, and so forth. I'm just trying to, trying to find out, do you, are you employed okay. by the administration, by an agency of the administration of the White House? The Office of Administration was created by the Reorganization Act of 1977. It is an agency within the executive office of the President. Which is the White House, the administration. I'll leave that for your conclusion, sir. Thank you. That is my conclusion. Was a copy of the incident report uh, that is being copied now uh, provided to you by you, Mr. Barry, to uh, the White House Counsel's Office? It wasn't provided by me to them, no. It was, it was not? Okay. Not by uh, me. Did, did they receive a copy of it at some point, do you know? I don't know. Sir. Okay, do you know even today whether they received a copy of it or whether they have a copy of it? I don't know. Okay. Did you provide them a copy of the, uh, the Lewinsky email or emails that were in question? I provided to them back in 1998 uh, all of the emails that uh, uh, hit on the search that I was running against the arm system. I, Including I the ones that we're talking about here today that, that sort of triggered this whole thing? Yes, the, the outbound ones, yes. That's all I had access to. Uh, at that time, were there pending proceedings in the Congress with regard to these matters? I have no idea. I don't know. Okay, and when was this? Uh, it was January of 1998. 1998. Okay, I think the record will reflect that, that there were uh, at that time. And certainly subsequent, you're aware of the fact that there were uh, matters before the Congress, which uh, at least two different committees of the Congress, the Judiciary Committee and Impeachment Proceedings and the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, were investigating regarding Ms. Lewinsky and the other types of matters that we're talking about here today. I was aware of the, that the impeachment was proceeding, yes, or the impeachment right. process. And, and you were aware that, that at, at, at various points in time, during the period 1988 and 1999, this committee of the Congress also was investigating various matters regarding the president. I, w I wasn't aware of that. I mean, I don't know. I don't... Okay. Are you, is that your testimony that even as you sit here today, you're not aware of that? I'm not exactly sure what the question is. I mean, I don't know what's going on in Congress all the time. I well, a lot of us up here up don't either. That's, uh, <laughs> I, I certainly wouldn't hold you to that standard. Uh, my, my concern is, uh, and I think both councils know what our concern here is, and that is with regard to uh, obstruction of justice, which includes intimidation of witnesses, uh, although some of the federal statutes don't require that a pending proceeding uh, actually uh, be, or that a proceeding actually be pending, various other provisions of Title 18 uh, do with regard to obstruction. And I think the work record will reflect that uh, those that cause the intimidation or the feelings of intimidation, uh, the pressure, the threats, however you all want to characterize them, or however a prosecutor might want to characterize them, uh, in fact took place in the context of pending proceedings. Uh, these are all matters, uh, and I know Ms. Hall is, is here in the audience, uh, although has not been called as a witness, uh, but I believe she also uh, would testify that, uh, that these matters were those under consideration and very likely were the 
perhaps the reason behind uh, the pressure, the intimidation, or the tactics used by Mr. Lindsay and others, uh, and that it was not simply to uh, protect uh, all of us from the, uh, from the media. Uh, and I suppose we'll get into this uh, later. I know Mr. Lindsay will be here, but uh, I appreciate, although Ms. Hall is not a witness, I appreciate her taking the time to be here so that she can benefit from uh, the testimony also. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Micah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses. Uh, uh, let me just say <clears throat> before I start some questions that we appreciate your coming forward. Um, and also cooperating with us, the uh, committee. Unfortunately, we've had uh, uh, history, as you've heard some of the others, other members refer to, of trying to conduct uh, investigations and oversight, which is our responsibility. And I think one of the, goes to the heart of really our structure uh, and system of government being so successful that there's continually oversight by Congress looking at the, what the executive branch is uh, doing. And as you've also heard, we've had a lot of difficulty. <laughs> Sometimes we get uh, pieces of the uh, puzzle. Uh, we've had 100, over 120 witnesses either flee the country or take the Fifth Amendment. We've gone down different paths, as you've read in the paper, only to find uh, that documents uh, disappear and suddenly uh, sometimes reappear and never appear, so we don't get the whole picture. And it, it, it does uh, give us great concern when we hear of uh, missing emails, and uh, there may be some le legitimate uh, technical explanations uh, for the, those documents uh, not being uh, produced. But it does raise us questions. And uh, f the, the major question I have is, and, and some of this has been alluded to, is um, you, you were, all of you that were uh, involved in this process, we're aware that there was an independent counsel. There were congressional investigations uh, seeking uh, materials. Uh, is that correct, uh, Ms. Uh, Lambeth? Maybe we could start with you. you were, you were aware of that? Yes, I was. And, and you were aware of that, Mr. Sprague? Yes, I was aware of it, yes. Uh -huh. And the rest? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Yes. Absolutely. Um, my, my next question would be, um, it, were you, was there any, were, were, were you in the, under the belief that, uh, that there was a, any intent to stop any of this information from uh, being revealed or being provided uh, either to this committee or to uh, the independent counsel or anyone else who was seeking it? D do you think w there was any attempt uh, well, as I had mentioned a little earlier, yes, I do believe. Initially, we felt that they just wanted to figure out how they were going to let the public know that additional mail messages were found. I later, for sure, and I thought the, the rest of the team had, but I definitely felt through the stalling, and as was pointed out a few minutes ago, Mr. Berry even felt that there was some stalling going on in revealing these other documents and that nothing was being done on this particular project as far as where do we go now, what the next direction should be, getting the equipment in. Um, and um, I do, I definitely do feel that there was some stalling. Well, uh, do you feel this was a sort of an evolutionary uh, a sort of uh, getting to a stall? Uh, was it? Uh, Mr. Sprague, you're, you're shaking your head yes and no. Uh. <laughs> the question of a stall, um, we're all frustrated by the complexity of the, the, the technical problems that are required to fix this. Um, the but once you, okay, uh, there's the first part of being technically able to, to provide this. And at what point was that reached? Uh, was that a few months afterwards, or is this still? From my point of view, it hasn't stopped yet, sir. It hasn't stopped yet. Yes, I mean, there, there continues to be technical uh, issues. When we have meetings, uh, in, and when the we were, when White House was informed that uh, there was going to be this newspaper article that came out, we, we gathered to talk about uh, 
what we were going to do to solve this problem. Uh, let's get the technical heads together and let's talk about you know what's going on. And and and, and we be again again to talk about the the technical issues. Uh, obviously, we got sidetracked because of the, the, the article that came out and, and the discussions of timelines, but the technical issues themselves continue to be knotty, difficult problems. Uh, we so have, you're saying before the committee today that you still aren't able to produce these emails as of today? A, as of today, we cannot. You cannot. And uh, how we, ha we had Mr. Haas testify that he did search for certain emails and found, uh, uh, you said you had 500 of one and a bunch of another on a matter. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. That was a manual search just as you would look through your own mail file. That's not acceptable to arms. Uh, the, the return is literally, uh, you see a screen full of documents. Of course, you can print them, but uh, even that When you is, got that information, you gave it to who? Uh, that you had some of this information? To Ms., uh, the Monica Lewinsky printouts that well, went whatever, to... Whatever you found. Yes, that went to Betty Lambeth. And then uh, you... I, I gave the Monica Lewinsky printouts to Mark Lindsay. And you don't know what happened to them afterwards? No. Okay. And any of those emails can just be printed out. But somehow you had the feeling that this went beyond uh, just uh, not being technically able to uh, to uh, acquire the information to uh, a different uh, a different phase. Is that correct? Yes, I did. Um, again, because I could never get my questions answered as being the supervisor, so I could give direction to my team. I couldn't get answers. Um, to questions that I had, um, uh, as I had mentioned previously, um, I was removed from the contract. I was one of the people that had history on this particular um, Project X, and nothing was done by the government people that knew I had this um, information and to continue to do the continuity of um, hey, guidance. At what point were you removed? I'm sorry, uh, the gentleman's time has expired. We'll come back for a second round, Mr. Michael. We'll come back just a little bit. Mr. The Hutch answer at what point she was removed, just for, so we have a complete record. What, what's that again? At what point she was removed was the question I What was the point? At what point were I you was removed? removed in July of? 1998. 1998. Thank you. Mr. Hutchinson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. and. Uh, I just wanted to look back and uh, sort of put this in context or examine it in that sense. Uh, all that was happening in 1998, whenever uh, you were concerned about uh, the searches and the technical problems. In uh, January 98, uh, you all read the newspapers. Uh, I mean, it was an explosive atmosphere. Uh, you had uh, the public stories about the independent counsel, about Monica Lewinsky. Uh, as to what was going to be leading up to August of 1998. Uh, and during that time, uh, you were told to conduct these searches uh, based upon certain subpoenas. Now, did anyone see the subpoenas, or were you all just told uh, this is what you need to search for? When we get subpoenas, uh, if these are subpoenas that we're getting, uh, an email is circulated through to all the uh, EOP, and it just basically states the fact that they're looking for documents related to, in the case of Monica Lewinsky, Monica Lewinsky, and please produce them. We don't see the physical subpoena in, in its true written format. Do they explain to you in that uh, directive as to who this issued the subpoena, whether it be the independent counsel or grand jury or, or a committee of Congress? I don't recall. Uh, reading any information pertaining to that. It, it may state that in the beginning, but I, I cut to the chase and, and try to find the information. Okay. But you knew that you were uh, trying to uh, comply with subpoenaed information either from the independent counsel or for some other body? When, when I personally receive one, yes, but I, as again I state, we don't search our mail files ourselves. That is theoretically done automatically, and in this case it was missed because right. of the glitch. But you felt concerned about it at some point when you understood the glitch that you went through manually uh, to see what you could find in some files. 
I was requested to specifically look for Monica Lewinsky in these specific mail files. I was directed to do that. And who directed you to do that? Uh, Betty Lambeth presented me with a note uh, with some names on it that was given to her by someone, and uh, I proceeded to follow that note. And then at a later point, they suggested I look in Ashley Rains and um, uh, Betty Curry's mail file, and that's when I found the documents within minutes of, of being handed the note, the same thing. And you provide those documents, Ms. Lambeth? I, uh, well, uh, initially I just reported the findings and then after that I was, uh, she took that information, uh, went wherever she goes with it. They came back later and asked me to please uh, set up a workstation that I could print those on paper and present them to her, yes. Ms. Lambeth, uh, and you were, uh, you received this information, what did you do with it? Um, when, when I received this information, I either gave it to Ms. Crabtree or Mr. Lindsay. And, and I don't remember in which case I gave what information to whom, except I know I took Monica Lewinsky's over to Mr. Lindsay at the um, old executive office building. And uh, did you believe that these searches were important? I'm sorry. Did you believe that these searches that you were doing were important? Yes. You knew that they had some legal impact because you're complying with a subpoena. Correct. <clears throat> and you, there are two issues here. I mean, one, you've got to fix the technical problem. Uh, you've got to comply with the law uh, in terms of, of the public records. Uh, and then you also have subpoenaed information in an investigation that's going on by the independent counsel. Um, uh, and was this part of the reason that you were going to Starbucks to meet? I mean, this was not simply an ordinary technical problem, am I correct? That is correct. Now, it, did you ever consider uh, a broader responsibility? I mean, you were told and basically threatened by the uh, uh, Mr. Lindsay uh, uh, that uh, don't talk about this. Did you believe that you might have a broader responsibility to the public to mention this to someone? Yes, um, I did. As I said, though, I was only I was only on this project for a short period of time. I had some knowledge um, because I guess it was basically six weeks. Um, that they left me on the project before they removed me. They, they removed me from that project. But... Um, was sorry. this the nature of some of the discussions at Starbucks? All right, let, I, and I'll go to someone so, else if you want to comment most, on this. Yeah, most of our, our discussions were over in the park. We went to Starbucks a, a couple of times. But it was basically, how are we going to handle these issues? Um, when we found out other bits of information, what was our next approach going to be? How was the best way to handle it? Um, what kind of information did we need to turn over and, and ask the government for? Let, let me interrupt you there, and anyone else can comment on this. The people who participated in these meetings in the park, where you had discussions about, one, you had a technical problem, but I'm interested also just as to what the thinking was at that time. Was there a concern about the public interest, about the independent counsel, and whether this is a, a, a cover-up? Was there some dis any discussions about that as to the seriousness of this matter and the importance of it? That was not typically the purpose of our meeting out there. Uh, we, would, we would go off-site to the park, as she mentioned, uh, to have technical discussions. Uh, and I don't believe at any time during any of the off-site meetings we discussed the fact that uh, the public wasn't going to be made aware of this. We were really working the technical detail of the problem. We weren't out there uh, having off-site discussions about the global problem. We were fixing specific detail. Would everybody agree with that? Yes, we weren't provided any place that we could go to work. And so this was our place where we'd go to have discussions. Um, we didn't have any equipment, so we really couldn't do a whole lot of testing. So it was really difficult for us to come away with any conclusions in any one period of time. So we had a number of meetings. I yield to Mr. Souter for but, the, the but, but it's important because earlier 
on the record they all said that they privately had speculated about the things that mr hutchinson was asking you you said you had private discussions and speculating about what was in these documents whether these documents might be called and you all pretty much said that earlier it's just just to clarify what we were not ignorant of of the things that were going on around us but the focus of our attention i mean we are there to solve a technical problem but we're not ignorant of or are ignoring the broader implications of these things it's it's that can from our point of view we are we have a certain function to provide here and i don't give counsel to the president and i don't you know those broader issues are government issues it's government's responsibility to do certain things and and they task me to do specific technical things for them they don't ask me they don't hire me to be a consultant in a in a broader context as you you seem to be expressing it's my we'll, time we'll, we'll have another round yeah. in just a moment thank you mr chairman yeah we'll, we'll come back in just a few minutes mr waxman uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to make several observations about the testimony so far. Uh, there are times when members of this panel are hoping for specific testimony to be delivered, but we can't reach conclusions based on what we hope you'll say. Uh, we're limited, or we should be limited, by the facts. And the facts are some things we know and some things we're hearing from you to uh, illustrate for us what the facts are. I think one objective fact is that there's a disagreement among the members of this panel as to whether jail was threatened. It's clear to me that Mr. Host uh, honestly believes that he w uh, he was, it was said to him that he could go to jail if, uh, if the information were made public. Others don't recall it. Uh, but I you, recall uh, it. Uh, I've me, stated more. Me, uh, I, I didn't say that you didn't. I said some people recall it, others do not recall it. And uh, others uh, agree that, that Mr. Lindsay uh, wanted some, I, I, let me just put it this way. Some of you think that you were threatened to, and you would jail if you told the information. Others don't. Ms. Lambeth certainly does. Mr. Haas sincerely believes it. As I understand, Ms. Salim doesn't recall it. Mr. Ms. Golas, what was your testimony? I believe that they used the word jail in reference to not complying. Okay. What? Is it fair to say that what all of you do understand is that Mr. Lindsay wanted to keep this matter quiet? Is that a fair statement? Anybody disagree with that? Okay, yeah, you're That's all taking correct. your head. Okay. Now, uh, Ms. Lambeth has said that she thinks the emails involved Filegate, campaign finance, abuse, sales, improper activities by the president. Is that right, Ms. Lambeth? That's correct. And she also said her source for that information was Mr. Haas. Now, Mr. Haas has denied ever telling her uh, that the emails involved Filegate campaign, finance, abuses, sale of Commerce Department, trade secrets, et cetera. Is that right, Mr. Haas? That's correct. Okay, so we have a conflict of testimony as to uh, uh, that whole issue. Now, on the question of the White House response, Ms. Lambeth seems to disagree with everyone else on the panel about whether Mr. Lindsay was dragging his feet. Um, Ms. Lambeth, you were terminated by Mr. Hawkins in July of 1998. That's not correct. She was not terminated in 1998? No, sir, she was not. Northrop Grumman does not terminate our subcontract employees. I removed her from the contract for several reasons, not just this one reason. What were the reasons? Failure to follow management directives, failure to stay within compliance of the contract, failure to be able to work cohesively with her direct manager. And that was uh, July 1998? Yes, sir, it was. I was... I was threatened not only by the government, I mean, I was threatened two different ways. I was threatened that if I did talk, I would end up in jail and be fired, be fired and end up in jail. And I was also threatened by Mr. Hawkins that if I didn't talk to him, that I would be removed from the contract and he would try to get me removed from C exec. Can I respond to that? That is absolutely untrue, absolutely 
positively untrue. She was never threatened with her job. I cannot do that. That was not within my uh, roles and responsibility. Her manager and I had several conversations prior to this event about removing her from the contract, and that is for the record. Several discussions. So this was just the straw that broke the camel's back. When Ms. Lambooth was called back to EOP the evening that I found out, she did not want to come back. I asked her to come back. That is not I, correct. Let me finish, Sorry. please. I then very specifically asked her what was going on. She told me she could not do that. I reminded her of our responsibilities as contractors to the United States government that the COTAR and only the COTAR could direct our workforce, and that had to come through the program manager. Under no circumstances was she told that she was going to be fired or terminated. That was never said. I disagree with that, obviously. First of all, I talked to Sandy before I ever talked to um, Steve, and I told Sandy just to hang tough, I was on my way back. Then I talked to Mr. Hawkins and told him I was on my way back. Well, let, let me ask when, this, excuse me, because my time is just about over, and the chairman said he's going to indulge me because we've indulged other members with a few extra minutes. But what I don't understand, Ms. Lambeth, is you thought you were being told you were going to go to jail if you made any information public. But you also said you thought that the White House was trying just to correct the problem. And then later you reached a different conclusion. That, that sounds to me somewhat inconsistent. Can you clarify now, that? What I said was that we were threatened that um, if any of us talked, we would lose our jobs, we would be arrested, and we would go to jail. And I truly believe that. But you thought in the, the White beginning, House was... May I finish? Yeah, but you thought in, the White in, House... In the beginning, you, you when the I started House, uh, working with Mr. Lindsay on this project, we and I myself, but the team really felt that they were trying to come up with a method of introducing this to the public. I did state, and I still believe it to this day, that they started dragging their feet for any of this to, to take place to um, reveal to the public that this was, um, in fact, that these emails had been found, and um, to allow us to come up with a way to produce these emails. Well, just for the record, if you left in July of 1998, you weren't there when presumably you think the White House was dragging its feet. No, because they were dragging their feet before I left because I couldn't get any answers on this particular project. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Waxman, let, could, I, could I elaborate one point? Uh, to collaborate uh, the truth of any statements, Ms. Uh, Kathy Gallant can substantiate uh, our conversations between Ms. Ms. Uh, Gallant and myself about the reasons uh, Betty was moved from the removed from the OP. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. La Tourette, I, I have not used my first round after the initial uh, uh, 30, 30 minutes. I will yield to you because you have to go manage the floor. You're going to be managing the floor on the house. I, I thank you. So I, we'll yield to you for your second round. Then I'll come back and do my first. I, I thank everyone for the courtesy. I have to to go preside over the budget uh, proceedings and, uh, at two o'clock. I. I we sort of diverted into a discussion about why Ms. Lambeth, and I, I don't care, to, to be honest with you. I, I would like to, to go to Ms. Golas for a minute, and, and then you don't appear to be having watched you here over these the insubordinate type. Uh, and so I'm, I'm curious about uh, how it is you reached the conclusion to be in a position where your uh, supervisor, Mr. Hawkins, considered you to be insubordinate. Could you describe that, how, how that happened? Well, I came out of the meeting. Um, I was in my office working on a problem. Um, the COTAR came in and uh, with another one of the government workers. We had a problem that I had been working on simultaneously. And I, he started to ask me um, what was going on. And I said, I'm working on a couple of problems. And he said, well, I need you to stop and fix this. And I said, you know, I'm working on these 
other things too. And he said, well, what are you working on? And I, so I explained to him that I was working on another something else and something I couldn't ex go into any details with him. And they, then he got really abrupt and said, I want, tell me what you're working on. And I said, I'm not, I said, well, I'm not at liberty to say anything. So he said, I want you to go down, come right down with, to me to the co uh, Steve's office. Excuse me, I got a cold. That's okay. So he followed me down. So I followed him down t to um, Mr. Hawkins' office, okay. at which point he tried to um, uh, uh, explain to Mr. Hawkins what was going on. And then he, of course, Steve didn't have any idea. Nobody had any chance to really say anything. And the next thing you know, Steve was yelling at me because the Kotar was trying to give me orders to do something. And I'm confused and perplexed. Um, I was doing, I felt, what was, I believed, um, investigative work for a, pro for a problem. I didn't believe it was out of scope. Um, <coughs> I felt uncomfortable that the Kotar was in my office trying to give me direction. And so now I've got the Kotar, who I'm not supposed to tell what I'm doing, and I'm, I'm, I have Steve standing in front of me yelling at me, and, and I just finally, he said, you know, you're bordering on being insubordinate. And I just said, well, if it's a choice of being insubordinate or going to jail, I guess I'll be insubordinate. Okay, and, that, and that's, that's what I want to get to, that, that you felt compelled as a result of this set of circumstances to say, I, look, I don't want to be insubordinate, but if I got to choose between being insubordinate to you or going to jail, I'm going to pick being insubordinate to you. And, and how did you, you came to that conclusion as a result of the conversations that you would have had with, with Ms. Crabtree and Mr. Lindsay? Yes. That yeah. what, what you were concerned and fearful that if you discussed with... I was very with, concerned. Um, I've worked in environments before where things were classified. Right. Um, <clears throat> it's not necessary for, all, for your manager, if he doesn't have the same classification, to know everything that you're doing all the time. Right. So I didn't find it unnatural to be in this kind of a situation. Okay, I, and, and I, have I misread you? you I don't, you're not the insubordinate type, are you? This was a tough spot for you to be in, wasn't it? No, I'm not usually, I don't believe. <laughs> okay, well, Mr. Hawkins is shaking his head, too, so I guess we'll take that that you're not. And I, Mr. Hawkins, that, that takes me to you, and obviously you then became concerned as a result of this and, and maybe some other things that occurred, and concerned enough to go see Mr. Lindsay and, and Ms. Crabtree? I was summoned to Mr. Uh, Lindsay's office by uh, Mark Lindsay. Okay, and, and was this the subject of the conversation? That is that, you know, hey, what the heck's going on? Uh, the people that are under my supervision are, are saying they can't talk to me? Uh, I'll characterize it as uh, they wanted to know why I interfered. Uh, Miss Laura Crabtree was in the room at first, and she basically accused me of interfering. Well, and, and, and let me stop you there. When you talk to the, the majority staff, I believe that a com you call a comment being made to you by Ms. Crabtree that everything was fine before you stepped in? Absolutely. Is that a direct quote from Ms. That Crabtree? That was a direct quote. Okay. And, and at this time, were you aware what the problem was, that there was this email e-server problem? No, sir. I didn't have any idea other than I had a COTAR breathing down my neck. Uh, I had a CO, uh, the contracting officer, uh, telling me to stay in bounds of my contract. And first of all, as I told Mr. Lindsay, my contract was with the United States government, and it was not with Mr. Lindsay, nor was it with Ms. Posey. Did you ask either of these folks that uh, if, if they had threatened these employees with jail, and if so, why? I did not go into that uh, at, at that time, no. Okay. I, I thank you very much. All right. Did you go into it at any time with them? Uh, no. Uh, after I stood my ground with Mr. Lindsay, uh, we didn't talk. You never said anything to them about the threats? I did say it to uh, 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 Jim Wright, the COTAR. And what did you say to him? I told him I didn't like the employees being threatened. Uh, I also mentioned how, 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 how was your understanding that they were being threatened? Uh, well, Mr. Bob Haas, when he came down to the office with uh, Sandy, and, and I'll, I'll go on the record, Sandy uh, would never been cited for insubordination. She was yeah. put in a very difficult yeah. situation. But Mr. Haas was the, the person who told me that uh, these emails were, uh, were very important to the the uh, political and the subpoena issues going on at the time. And I personally uh, had the discussions with Dell Helms, this, the contracting officer, and Jim Wright, and telling them that uh, I felt because of the, the importance of, of the, uh, uh, 
the subpoenas that we had been requested to turn over all our documents pertaining to the president and Monica Lewinsky, that this could lead to further replicate or uh, further problems for Northrop and our employees. And and I stood my ground. So you told him, I don't want you threatening my employees. Absolutely. Okay. But you knew that there had been a threat of jail. Uh, that came from Mr. Bob Haas. I did not, and I have no personal knowledge of the threats being given to them by either of the parties. But you heard that from Mr. Haas. Yes, sir. Mr. Haas, did you uh, ever go to the office of Cheryl Hall to discuss Project X? Yes, sir. Did you ever tell Cheryl Hall that you were afraid for your life? Afraid for my life, no. <laughs> afraid of going to jail, yes. You never told her you were afraid or feared for your life? No, sir. Okay. Did you ever provide her with any documents relating to Project X? Yes, sir. And she why did, why did you requested. get... She requested the documents? Yes. I, in a working relationship uh, such as we've had around the EOP, this was after the uh, disclosure uh, of with Northrop Grumman's lawyers and, and more or less pulled us out of the point where we didn't have to believe we were uh, under threat of jail. And uh, Laura Crabtree had departed. Uh, Cheryl had asked me some questions and called me to her office and was asking about this because it seemed to be falling back under her uh, preview, if you will. And uh, at that point in time, she asked me for copies of the list, which is the 525 uh, type list, and I gave her what I had. So you gave her what, 525? It, uh, this. This uh, list that's here uh, is... But, but, but she asked for the list and you gave it to her? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you ever uh, save any search responses or records on another electronic media, such as a zip drive? Just the stuff I saved for uh, the people with the subpoena right now uh, last week. I've never saved it on a zip drive for anything. Never saved it on a zip drive or anything, any kind of a, uh, no, electronic sir. device that you might have had at home or something? No, sir, I don't have a zip drive. I have a zip drive at home uh, that is currently broke, but I don't have any. I just recently got a zip drive at work to record these documents last week, but I don't well, have The a one zip at home, though, it doesn't have any information on it. No, sir. And no, you sir. never took any information home with you or anything, Captain? No, sir. Hmm. Did you ever offer to Cheryl? I don't have that computer at the time this happened, by the way. Yeah. Did you ever offer to Cheryl Hall that she could view any of the search results from searches uh, that you performed? No, sir. You never the, did? No, sir. The uh, documents in which that uh, I searched, well, I, as I related to you, I read those two documents. The rest of it was turned over in paper format and went to wherever it went. So you never offered Cheryl Hall that she could, uh, so she could uh, read any of the search results to... Uh, from the searches you performed? No, sir. Did you ever tell Cheryl Hall anything to the effect that if the results of the email searches became known, the results of the investigations would be different and other people would go to jail? No, sir. I, I, if anything related to that, we may have had conversation, as we commonly did in her office, that if any of the uh, stuff that was subpoenaed, uh, like Filegate and that, were to show up in the search after all the documents were uh, unloaded into the arm system, that it would be a real boondoggle or something like that. But it was conjecture. It was not, matter of fact, I know of no documents that exist in that format. Does any email actually reside on the PCs of the White House users, or does it all actually reside on the servers? There was at one point prior, right prior to finding the problem, we were running out of disk space on Mail 2. There was an active project to replace Mail 2 for uh, improved disk space. And at that point in time, uh, a group of programmers that worked with me uh, were put together a methodology for archiving your, these huge files that were on the server to their uh, local C drive and then deleting some of the mail off of uh, the server copy so that they could still have their more or less referential copy available but, to them. But, but the vast majority was on the outside server, not on the PCs, right? That's correct. Uh, one of the very first things that happened when we discovered this issue about uh, the non-records management mm -hmm. was I suggested that they stop immediately allowing people to archive uh, to their hard drive because that 
followed with deleting the documents off the server, and I didn't want that to happen either. Well, therefore, if someone searched their PC in response to a subpoena, uh, they wouldn't capture uh, any of the email that was on the mail to server. Is that correct? Other than those people that had made archive copies on their ma uh, machine, which there were a few, mm -hmm. uh, that should have searched it as well as part, uh, part of the requirement, they would not normally search their server. So the fact of the matter is then that uh, there, there's a, a lot of this that was not on the, on the, the personal PCs that these people have. It's all on that outside server. Yeah, I would say 98% of it's on the server. Okay. Thank the gentleman. Uh, who's next? Um, I think Mr. Mr. Souter. Thank you. I have a, um, a couple of follow-ups that I've been trying to keep track of on Mr. Haas. Um, you said early on that um, you, when you had done the, the uh, Monica requests on her downloading her PC, that it would require uh, special programming to cross-reference, that that was a very complicated thing that would require special programming? To, to search more than one file at a time would take programming, yes, sir. And as I understood, you said you were surprised that that request never came. Uh, well, consider uh, the timeliness of the Monica Lewinsky search that I did manually coincided with uh, just a few days before I believe she testified, uh, I, I'm not sure, but it, it was coming up that somebody was testifying in the Monica Lewinsky case. And I thought it was pertinent uh, that uh, it, somebody would ask us to go in depth. Once we found one, let's find them all and, and come up with some method, but it never came. Because you suspected that there might be things there that wouldn't be backed up elsewhere in the system? Yes, sir. Um, could you explain why something, how that works, why something would have been that you might have come up with something in that programming that wouldn't be backed up anywhere else? Well, if they were willing to accept the type of printouts like we had done uh, when Betty was requested to print it out, that's not an arm search. Uh, if you can imagine, uh, if we searched that one file and found five, uh, four or five hundred documents, let's say we found 25 people. Uh, that's a lot of paper somebody has to read. And I don't know, I, I assume that you have the resources to hire people to read it, but it, it's not the kind of format you want. But I suspected if they went through and looked for it and they found a huge amount of it, it would be pertinent to the testimony. Because it wouldn't be anywhere else. Uh, I have no way of knowing that it's not anywhere else. All I can refer to is the fact that in all these mail files I looked through, I found significant numbers of documents showing in a view that said they never made it to arms. If they made it through secondary and, and third level processes, I have no way of knowing that. We are going to hear apparently in the second panel that, uh, that all this stuff was uh, available elsewhere. Um, how would they know if, they, if your search on that limited number of Monica documents is the only thing that they checked? I would have no knowledge of how they would uh, sit here and testify to that. Um, is it plausible that everything, in other words, what you described as a programming method that could have checked Monica and campaign finance, you know, traced different names, John Wong, Charlie Tree, anything we wanted to, to is it plausible that everything, all this, this missing gap, which I understand is small, that's incoming emails mm -hmm. um, that aren't CC'd to anybody else, is it plausible that every one of those incoming emails is backed up somewhere else in the system? No, sir. Uh, they, they are on that server, and unless there's a process to uh, search them, uh, they won't be recovered, uh, you know, taking all the criteria you gave me. And uh, there's no other system that will reach in and pull them out. Mr. Berry? I, I think, Bob, you're, you're missing something about the fact that if, if the email is in Betty Curry, for instance, is email file, and she gets the memo on her desk to, to search for relative to the subpoena, we, I know I always go through my email file and search relative to a subpoena apart from an armed search. So she would, uh, I'm assuming, we are getting, uh, maybe Bob's overlooking that, I'm it, not we sure. We are getting to a crux of a, a real difficult question, but I want to ask another, uh, another thing here. And that is, is that 
is it possible based on the fact that instead of following the normal kind of chain of command inside a civil uh, a contracted out service that previously had been civil service um, and schedule C employ appointees that is political appointees of the White House have now interjected themselves in a contract process and clearly now in retrospect certainly stonewalled during a very critical time of, of 96 to 98 is it plausible? Because the way I understand the backup system is, is that instead of the system being scooping up these emails every few minutes, they were being duplicated at night in the individual computers many hours later. Is it plausible that given the fact that political appointees had come in and now we're knowledgeable of this, that other political appointees in the White House realized there wasn't a backup system for a number of hours and in fact could hit a delete button? In other words, if there was an email you did not want to get, and you didn't want to keep it in your personal file that Mr. Berry was, was talking about, and you had knowledge that all of a sudden a system was down, and you weren't going to be backed up if you deleted it in a short period, is it plausible that that information could have gotten out? The plausibility of that is, uh, I, first of all, the general knowledge of being able to delete it before it was backed up. I don't know that that information was disseminated outside of the, our floor of the building. If oh, it even but what about the uh, Mark Lindsay knew? Okay, uh, well that's it wasn't disseminated by any of us. No, I'm and, not accusing that. It, I'm saying is it political appointees. It's plausible that a person could receive a document and hit the delete key, and it, if we just even talk about one single document, absolutely, is because it's a possible. fundamental question that the American people are having, and we in this panel, is, is as I read the, the government's documents that came over here, and what we're going to hear later today is, trust us. And I'll tell you what, the problem we have is the trust is gone what, because it doesn't prove anything, the fact that somebody could have deleted something. But in fact, based on the history of what we're frustrated with, we're no longer willing to accept the trust that if in fact there was the ability to delete documents, then it is to me very disturbing because the political appointees in fact all of a sudden have a potential motive for what happened in 96, 98. That's different than proof. But the fact is, is that we don't know. Thank the gentleman. If the I'm gentleman from Florida is. Could I say something? Uh, very briefly. Yes, I was just going to say, if I remember correctly, I think that there's like up to a 13 minute period in here that um, mail can actually be deleted um, before it is um, arms managed. Well, that's the normal. But when the system's down, wasn't it, not, wasn't it going to be a whole day, roughly, till that evening? Uh, to, to the extent that, that there actually were instances where we received email messages from a postmaster account saying, because of disk space limitations, please delete mail messages, please delete files. We, we knew we had a disk space problem on mail too, and, and, and others, I mean, I'm on mail five, so in, in, in our situation, we were actually given instructions, please delete these things because we're running into disk space problem. Well, if you are on mail two and you receive that instruction and you delete it, whether you're a political appointee or what, you just complied with the directive to delete mail messages. You thought they were records managed, but in fact they weren't. The uh, gentleman from Florida is recognized Thank for five you, minutes. Mr. Chairman, well, uh, it, it appears to me that you all had uh, two basic missions. One was to fix the problem that had been uncovered. That's correct. And some of you were technical and were trying to fix that problem. Is that correct? Yes. We have never, f we've, we've stopped the bleeding. We have never fixed the problem. But, okay, but there was a problem. It wasn't recording these. That problem was fixed. That problem was fixed, okay. Then it appears that you had a, another role, which was to find, the, it, we're, we're pumping out subpoenas or requests for information, independent counsel, the Senate, and others. So some of you were involved in the find mission, and Mr. Haas has testified that, that you, and, and uh, Ms. Lambert, you said you had given him specific request to, get, to find documents, is that correct? That is, that is correct. And so far the only thing, now, and then we were, we were, we've been requesting different documents like uh, Filegate, uh, you, you've said uh, Vice President campaigns, uh, finance problems, 
that we had asked. Uh, uh, Waco, I guess, is another one. Uh, the sale of commerce. It's, um, did you, and you, you have testified that you only in, were involved, Mr. Haas, in retrieve, uh, retrieving data on one that you're aware of. That's correct. I've never received a request to look for anything but Monica Lewinsky. Uh, did you, Ms. Lamberth, ask anyone else to, to look for any of these, or was, were they all on the fixed mission and only Mr. Haas on the fine mission? Mr. Haas was on the fine mission, but uh, Bob had stated a few minutes ago, and if I recall directly, there were four other names that were given that we were supposed to um, try to find some information on, including go into their mailboxes to find some information on Monica, and one of those was Betty Curry. Um, uh, okay, we, okay, that's agreed on. But here we have uh, the different folks asking for information. Were you just involved in fi uh, fixing and nobody else beside Mr. Haas in finding anything? Mr. Haas and this technical team that was involved with this, Mr. Haas was the correct person to do the find. He, is, he was the notes. Um, so the only thing that you were doing, Mr. Haas, then uh, these requests were coming from us, and you only... No, sir, no, sir. You're misunderstanding this. During the beginning of the event, when we discovered an error, short on, they, d they asked us, someone asked Betty to ask me to look in this specific place for these specific files, which was the Monica Lewinsky, I found that, and I've done no other searches, I've received no other requests to do any searches, even to this day. Or anything else, Filegate? Other than my own personal searches of my mail file that we do receive through the mail, but I've never been asked to go back through anything else uh, other than my file as part well, of this project. What happened to the request? I don't... I don't remember it that way. I definitely remember the Monica Lins uh, Lewinsky uh, request for searches, but I, I still believe that there were other requests for searches not too long after that period. Um, you know, we get about 20,000 mail messages, mm -hmm. approximately 20,000 mail messages a day. That's a lot of mail messages. So there, there may be, now the, the body from 96 uh, from, August of 96 to November of 98, there could be a huge body then of emails that we've never seen or been requested or gone after. That's correct. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, That's um, correct. Yes, that is correct. Uh, are we talking about thousands? Uh, Hundreds of thousands. Nobody's ever counted them. We don't know. But you were able to go by hand and get some things that were specifically requested. So there is a capability of going back. Did those records, are those records still someplace where somebody could go get them? We don't know that, sir. They're on, we suspect they're on tapes. Uh, the tapes have not been loaded and verified to see that those files still exist. But understand, what you're going to get in a given tape is the data that exists at that moment. Again, that body, that huge body, there's only a small number of requests that were complied with that you're testifying to. There could be this huge volume uh, in that time frame, right? 90, uh, August 96 to 98. Now, after 98, uh, we're, uh, well, after 98, I guess it didn't, November of 98, it didn't matter. And I think Ms. Nolan's testified that there are 3,400 tapes or something in here. Is that where that, that information would be? I would suspect so. And we the, think that that would have all the backup information. But it is possible to go back and get some of the things we requested, even if it had to be done, say, by hand. It would be a very laborious process, but I, I suspect if you're willing to take it in paper but, format, it I is mean, doable. But you could also take these tapes and key them for certain words and, and uh, pull that information out like we do on our computers now? One by one, hand, by hand, yeah, Ms. sure. Ms. Golis? Yes, I think the, the thing that hasn't really been brought out is that the mail's messages aren't individual files. Okay, they are managed by Lotus Notes and they're in a database and each user has a database of their own. So it's not as easy as just go but, executing a search. So do we have two uh, bodies? We have all these tapes and then what we have on the individuals too or are they well, combined into one? Each individual's mail file, uh -huh. da mail database is on the tape as a, a file. 
And you would think that would be complete. They didn't have the ability to no. uh, delete them, or they did have They the did delete. before it was backed so up. So there may be a huge body, and then there may be a body of sort of missing. And the gentleman, Thank you. time has expired. Thank you. Uh, the uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from California for five minutes. Thank the gentleman, and I think I'm on the same task that Mr. Micah has been asking you. Let me get it in another way. Are the 500 people in the White House, OMB, et cetera, are they all connected with your particular servers and all? Is that correct? Mr. Haas, let me ask you that. Yes, sir. Uh, it's not OMB, first of all. It's uh, OMB it's is on a separate of, server. But, executive uh, Office of the President. Uh, well, we have five servers, and different organizations are spread across those five servers. We're mainly talking about the Mail 2 server at this point. Now, let's just take one person that is in the email thing. Now, how much of a memory do they have in their particular computer? Or it, do you have the memory storage capacity? We have the we have the grand total memory storage, which is shared among all users on the server, and it's totally uncontrolled. We have uh, recently had people that exceeded a one gigabyte mail file just for their personal mail file, and has caused this great uh, problem. The White House has decided not to restrict the mail space. So you're telling me that the person that has the email capacity to your program they have how much memory, if any? They get it everything they want. It, it, uh, at the time uh, that we, the server was put up, I think we had 14 gigabytes total, and now we're somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 gigabytes of, of total disk space on mail, too, and it's up in the high end of the 80% well, full range. Do we know and have? A, do you have a general idea as to how much memory each person has and how much memory do they have in a file under your control? I, I have no clue what they have themselves uh, on their personal machine, and, but on the uh, computer, on the printout that I submitted from that de uh, that they have in here as testimony, there is uh, a basically a report that tells you how many messages they have in there, but it doesn't tell you in disk space size how big it is. Now, do we know on your system the way it's constructed? the degree to which you need a backup tape every night. Uh, I'm from California. I'm used to earthquakes shaking computers. <laughs> the, the Lotus Notes system and the backup tape system that is used on it uh, aren't totally compatible. So in that extent, every time you run a backup on the mail system, you get a complete backup. There is no such thing as, if you're familiar with the term incremental backup, an incremental nightly backup of a mail system is everything on that mail system. Right. And they were, they were scheduled to be run every day, from what I understand from the server group that does that. Uh, problems came about with uh, tape drives being bad and all that, so there, there are gaps in there, but I don't have direct knowledge of that. Now, if they had a file in your system, would that be backed up in the evening before they go home? Yes, sir. That, uh, well, no, before they go home, no, sir. It's, they're backed up. Uh, it usually takes almost a 24-hour cycle to back the whole server up. So they're going on during the day, during the night. Depends on what time of day the backup system got to your particular mail file. Okay, but that's basically your process to have a backup system and to run it, what, every 24 hours? It's not my process, but it is an uh, established process at the, at the EOP to back up the mail servers every night. And uh, my understanding is if they can be done in a 24-hour cycle, they will be done. Now, presidents usually like to uh, have build a presidential library. Uh, to your knowledge, has the president said, hey, I want all of these things maintained? This is, could be way before any of Travelgate, whatnot. But uh, wouldn't they uh, be saying, I'd like to see things, documents saved, whether they be electronic or written? Uh, my, understanding is, capacity? my understanding is that backup tapes are not used for that purpose at the White House, that uh, the arms records are the record for the presidential library, and that uh, these tape backups, the whole tape backup scenario is only there for catastrophic failure of hardware. It has nothing to do with uh, uh, NARA and, and presidential libraries or anything else. It's there for recovery of a disaster. Uh, well, okay. So, Say you had uh, real problems in the electrical system in Washington, D.C. 
uh, is the only thing you have those tapes that you run systematically or do you have them in a cave somewhere which is what a lot of corporations do uh, I don't know I, I, we don't take none of us at this table administer that system it's done by what we call the server group at at the EOP, but they're not in a cave to my understanding. I believe they're uh, either in the basement of our building or that they're stored uh, at an off-site site that is considered safe by standards. Could a White House member scrub all of their files if, they're, if they have the key of access to the file in your particular contract? Any mail user on our system can go in and delete their entire mail file at will, any time, day or night. Now, what happens to that file? Say they delete it and they go and they've retired, they want to do something else. Uh, can a new party take in a specified file or is that too massive to identify? Are you, are you talking about where a person replaces yeah, another person, person in their job? decides to get out of there, right. they don't want to see that system again, right. and they can take their file with them. And no, sir, we don't allow that. No, we have no I mean, way to transport well, it. Well, they could, uh, you know, run a paper printout on yes, their file. They, they're entitled. But I'm wondering, in the space of your computer operation, the next morning somebody's hired, could they take that amount of space at all? No, sir. They, uh, typically, there is a departure slip filled out by the person leaving the agency for whatever reason. It goes through the normal uh, processes, and it's submitted to the security group to delete the account uh, uh, when they get to it. Sometimes they delete the account in a day. Sometimes it sets out there for six months before it gets deleted, and only then uh, it takes 24 hours after that before that space becomes available again. Well, uh, could I point? Could that, uh, as I understand it, the Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Horn, your time has expired. Uh, we'll we'll have an, we'll have you one more round here, Mr. Could I add something to some known missing backup tapes? Sure. Um, shortly after Project X um, was made known, as far as we discovered the problem. Um, we were told, I was told, and I did confirm by going back and, and looking at tapes, that um, there were six months of backup tapes that had been overwritten um, by some previous um, backup uh, processes. Explain and, uh, why that was done real quickly. I don't know why it was done, um, but there was a six-month period of time in 1997 backup tapes that were overwritten and I believe that those dates were from June or July of 97 to November of 97 those backup tapes were overwritten the other thing that the committee might want to be aware of is that there is a very short um, shelf life and when I'm saying short shelf life on tapes I'm talking a couple of years to two and a half years of shelf life on tapes before they, they start to disintegrate. So that, that needs to be known also. Mr. Chairman, I, just, I think that dialogue shows that the FBI does, and I know has the capability to find out what was on a previous tape. And uh, it seems to me if you can find some of the tapes there, they could be gone through. We, we will pursue that. We will see if those tapes can be looked at even though they've been overridden. Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, going back, uh, Mr. Barry, to the uh, incident report dated 1-30-98, uh, and I would ask unanimous consent to have that made a part of the, the record, Mr. Chairman. I'd ask unanimous consent to have the document uh, handwritten at the bottom, which was delivered to me by Mr. Barry just a, a little bit ago, dated 1-30-98. Uh, 2.59 p.m. Uh, be made a part of the record. Without objection. Uh, I believe you testified, Mr. Barry, that this report you sent to Mr. Wright? Yes, sir. Uh, at OA? Yes, sir. Okay, and that was in late January of 98? Uh, the, actually, the date that's on the document is what's called a modified date. I'm not sure exactly when it was created. Approximately that time, though? Approximately, yes. Okay, in, in early 98? Yes. Uh, there is another document here that was sent over, uh, and maybe, Mr. Young, you can tell us what this document is. Uh, White House uh, W3, Exhibit Number 3, Talking Points. Uh, 
who prepared those talking points dated March 7, 2000? Are you asking me to testify, Congressman? I yes, have sir. no idea. You have no idea? No idea, sir. Okay. Uh, according, uh, Mr. Barry, to a White House exhibit number three on page five by this uh, apparently unknown author, there is a question posed to an unnamed recipient. Were people within the White House office ever notified about this problem? Answer, yes, within a couple of days after OA became aware of the error, Virginia Abuzo, head of OA, sent a memo to Chief of Staff John Podesta. Uh, obviously, at least some people in OA, we don't know who, were aware of it before then, because the memo that uh, is referred to by this unknown author to an unknown recipient, uh, for which uh, uh, Mr. Young uh, professes no knowledge whatsoever, uh, even though he is from OA, uh, is dated June 19th, 1998, White House Exhibit 1.3. I am familiar this, with that document, sir. Pardon? That document I am familiar with. It's not your question. Hallelujah. Uh, the White House did address this issue, at least to some extent, in June, some five months later. What's also interesting is, is my information that just a few days before this memo on the record dated June 19th, which purports to address the problem, just a few days before that, on June 11th, there was in fact uh, a message that instructed people to delete old, unneeded emails. Uh, this, I think, uh, if I might speak for some of the other members here, is why one highlights one aspect of this that's so disturbing to us. Uh, even though uh, OA was aware of this problem uh, early in the year, very early in 1998, uh, apparently, for some reason, and it might have to do with subpoenas that were being issued or the Office of Independent Counsel's work with regard to Ms. Lewinsky, uh, and I think Mr. Satter was getting to this also, the problem with deleting uh, information and emails at this particular, during this particular window in time where there uh, is no backup. Uh, in June, on June 11th, uh, White House people are directed to delete old, unneeded emails. Now, under certain circumstances, that might just be a coincidence. But it's very suspicious because then just a few days later, despite the fact that OA knew about this problem for many months, then they put something on the record. Uh, reporting to say, hey, we have a problem and we ought to do something about it. Uh, does this strike you as odd, Ms. Lambeth, the, the timing of all of this? Well, I think it's odd, but we were definitely running out of disk space. And um, I personally had gone to OA and after talking with um, Bob and some other people, um, the fact that we were in critical um, way as far as space. One thing you've got to realize about a server is if it runs out of space, you can't turn it off and bring it back up because it's still out of space. So everything on that server is lost. Um, we, it did take some doing to get permission to send out the email and it was worked uh, before Virginia um, would uh, even allow the email to be sent out. If I remember correctly, I'm not sure it's on this one, but there were several that there were, um, when we would go in and finally um, were allowed to delete some mail messages uh, for the people, we could only do it um, if it was prior to a particular date. I don't remember what any of those dates were, but we were in a critical situation. If anything, I would say is, um, knowing what the, the situation for storage space was on the mail servers and knowing that there are no rules about um, people can only have a certain volume for storage for email, that they can only keep um, so many email messages, et cetera, that there should have probably been a little bit more done to um, secure additional servers or for storage space, because again, if you run out of space, you've lost everything, and, right. and you won't and be Mr. able to Haas, get it Mr. Haas, when did you do your search of the usernames uh, for emails from Monica Lewinsky? 
the act, oh, for the documents, that was, um, we started this project on, I guess, uh, the 15th, uh, 12th to 15th, that time frame when we actually started working. Uh, and it was a couple of, uh, June, June of 98, I'm sorry. Ju June of 98 yeah. also. Yeah, and I would guess it was probably two or three weeks into my work that they asked me to do it. So it was, what, the, somewhere around the June 30th that, I, mean, that I was Somebody wanted to find out what was there. Yeah, specifically, I guess. That, I mean, why they came down with a request to look for these and look here. So and I did. Around the yeah. same time, files were being regular told order, to Mr. Be Chairman. It seems like members have five minutes and they ought to stay within it, so we can give this panel a break and get on to the other two. Okay, I, I think the record will will reflect those dates that they're the, approximately the gentleman's the same, time has same expired. Time period. Well, well, I have uh, some time. If uh, if we need, uh, I'll uh, yield you my time, uh, Mr. Satter. Mr. Chairman, I've had two rounds. I've had two. All right, do you have further questions? This is the third round. Do you have any further questions? If not, uh, yes, we'll I do have. I do have a couple of. of uh, okay, this this is going to be the last round with this panel, Mr. Sauter. Um, I wanted to uh, repeat for just for the record on the f the 525. I was going through the names that this includes. Uh, Bruce Lindsay, Cheryl Mills, Betty Curry, Erskine Bowles, Douglas Sosnick, Rahm Emanuel. Nancy Heinrich, uh, John Podesta, Bruce Reed, Marcia Scott, Larry, Lanny Brewer, Sidney Blumenthal, Paul Begala, as well as the presidential files. The 525 are not insignificant. We've dealt with these for the last number of years. In particular, we've been seeking information in 96 to, to 98. Um, I also uh, am, am uh, looking for my notes here. I was working on something else. The, um, uh, was particularly disturbed about this, this um, uh, backup system and trying to understand it, and uh, I'm sure we're going to debate that in the next uh, couple of, of panels. I also wa wanted to follow up on one thing that was said earlier today that I didn't uh, fully understand, and um, that is it seemed that the panel uh, uh, seemed to feel that the request by the White House counsel to uh, let you look at the um, to, to give them some time, maybe uh, Mr. Hawkins could could. Well, you weren't you weren't directly involved. Now let me ask Ms. Lambeth, and then I think several of the others of you said that you felt their request was not unreasonable, um, that they wanted some time. I know Mr. S uh, Briggs said that. Um, given the fact that, um, uh, why would that not be unreasonable? In other words, why wouldn't that be immediately reported? Uh, that there was a problem with the system. Why, why would you have felt you had to go to a park across the street or to, to Starbucks anyway? I mean, if there's a problem with the system, who would you be hiding from? I didn't feel that it was unusual, knowing the circumstances of all the subpoenas, for them to say, okay, we acknowledge that there's a problem, as I said a few minutes ago, let's give us some time to see how we want to approach telling the public that we have found these additional emails. I've also reiterated several times throughout the day that to me especially it became very apparent that that was not what the intent was. The intent was to basically stall this whole process. Um, to keep it from happening because I couldn't get various things done. I couldn't get meetings when I requested meetings with the people that were supposed to be the only ones that could give, even give me direction So as this, this time period drew out, you had, had doubts, but um, let me go back to the beginning. Why, I, I still don't fully understand why you felt you couldn't discuss this on White House or, or in your work ground, why you had to go across the street. Well, Sandy said it, Ms. Golan said it a little bit earlier. We really had no space in which to work. We had none of the equipment that we really needed to do this, even though we had been, we had given them specs. Oh, wait, wait a second. And I, I'm sorry, I need to follow up. You're saying that there was more space at a Starbucks and across the street in Lafayette Park than in the White House. I mean, this isn't plausible. I mean, people are watching on TV, they're going to watch the C-SPAN of this, and you're saying that in the entire White House and executive office building, they don't have a room that you could go to, but that you could get a table at Starbucks or a space in a public park where out there that you couldn't get in the White House. It's just not plausible. It had been, it had been stated before that we often went to a very large room on the second floor um, and had meetings, but it was also stated that that was 
inside of the smoking area and people would stand outside the windows and watch. Most of you, if you've ever been to the new executive office building where our offices were, the walls are very thin and anybody can be standing outside the door and hear what's going on. And we were specifically told that nobody else was supposed to know about this information. And so we thought for confidentiality that we couldn't go into my office. People stood, could stand outside the door. It was also a very small office. John and Sandy's office was a thoroughfare for people cutting from one hall to the other hall, even when the doors what were closed. It, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't that you couldn't find space somewhere in the, these big It was for buildings. security more than not finding space. And that, so that you were, you were afraid of who seeing you in the White House. That's what, see, that's what's hard. For it me. wasn't who seeing us. It was who was going to hear this. We who, had been. Who, who were you afraid in the White House would hear you? In other words, um, if, if what you're doing is just trying to fix a system, uh, what White House personnel or executive office personnel would you be afraid of hearing you? If, if we were talking about specific mail records that were lost, and somebody says something to a friend of theirs over a beer that night, oh, I heard today that there are other additional, and that leaks to the paper, then that comes back to us that we leaked this information. We'd been threatened. If we, let, if we leaked any information, we would lose our jobs, we would be arrested, and we would go to jail. It was a very legitimate concern on our part. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Micah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, when I uh, ended my questioning, it appeared that we have basically hundreds of thousands of emails that are somewhere and that never been seen. We have the possibility of individual uh, user files that could have information or could have had information uh, deleted. Um, is, that, is that correct? Again, um, I mentioned we get in excess of 20,000 emails a day. So over that period of time, even calculating roughly, um, it's over 100,000 email messages. But uh, uh, my concern also is um, that, of course, some of these records were under subpoena. And you're saying you felt that this was being stalled uh, to provide the information. You all sort of at, were told in secret to, I mean, to, to be secretive about this, not discuss what's going on. You have Mr. Hawkins, who's the contractor responsible for the billing and all, wondering if these folks are off the reservation. It could be embarrassing to, it could have been very embarrassing to your company to have uh, uh, well, you, you were trying to make certain that they were on the reservation and complying with the contract, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Could have been very embarrassing to Northrop Grumman, <coughs> Grumman if the public knew what, what, what they m might have been involved in. But you did, at some point, you did seem to find out what they were involved in, didn't you? Yes, I did. You did, even though it was secret. Oh, well, I made that point uh, when I met with Mr. Lindsay. He told me he wanted to keep this a secret, and I said, some secret we've got here with about 10 people I knew had it. And, but uh, you were also sort of cut off by Mr. Lindsay, and he told, uh, you, you, know, you didn't go back to Mr. Lindsay after your conversations, is that correct? Uh, no, sir. Good. I, I, I had the uh, proper uh, counsel working it. Uh, well, we, we may never know what we didn't get. <laughs> Uh, in this, uh, some of it was to fix the problem, some of it was to find, but we, it appears that we only found a limited amount. Last Friday, the committee received a letter from the White House counsel, Beth Nolan, in which she wrote there was a new unexplained problem with the email in the office of the vice president, and that's exhibit to GR2, page 6, second paragraph. I've got it right here if you want to put it on the screen. Uh, it just says that uh, in the course of gathering these preliminary facts, I'll read it, concerning the configuration errors, we were informed this week that the emails on the server of the office of the vice president have not been fully managed by arms. We are still in the process of determining the scope and time period involved. 
the Office of Vice President does maintain a backup t uh, tapes of its server. So now it appears that there's also a problem in the Vice President's office. Are you aware of this, uh, Miss? Are you aware of this? Yes. You are? Yes, I am. Uh, everyone else is, a, is aware of this. We're aware that they uh, that they are doing something different with records management. We don't aren't directly charged with records management of the OVP. Now, if we wanted information from the vice president's office, is there a possibility some of this is could be missing? Uh, it says the office of vice president does maintain a, a backup tapes of its server, so that's everything's going to be there. Uh, would that be the case? You would have to contact the vice president's office for that information. You wouldn't know. I don't know. Uh, would anyone know if he has a similar system, or are we going to find another case in which their documents uh, not available? Do, do you know anything about this, Mr. Spriggs? Yes, sir. I, I do some, somewhat. Um, the office of the vice president, uh, when they deployed their Lotus Notes server, uh, decided to employ a uh, um, a non-standard, if you would, non-EOP uh, records management uh, system using tape backups. And uh, when was that? That was as early as uh, my understanding. The server was created in 1994. When he, okay. Yeah. So, so the, their server predated uh, the EOP OA servers. Um, but at that point, the uh, the records management system that they chose was was again this tape backup methodology. Um, again, what they have on their side, on the OVP side, was not our concern for a number of years, uh, up until um, in March of 1998, I was put on a project by, by Betty Lambeth uh, specifically to move uh, the Office of the Vice President's uh, server called OVP underscore one uh, into uh, OA, IS, and T control facilities. Um, I worked with Ms. Crabtree uh, and others uh, to put together a plan to move that equipment into this OA space. Um, and at that point, uh, when we executed it at the end of March of 1998, the server was turned on, the users were up and running on it. Uh, the question of records management uh, apparently had not been resolved at that point. Uh, we, uh, OA, began to do the backup systems for um, the OVP1 server. Um, but at that point, I, I'm not aware of any instructions to do records management by that same method, method for the OVP. Um, my understanding is that by July of 1999, um, we were given instructions, or Jim Wright gave instructions to actually start doing a um, three-week cycle on the backups. Uh, for all of our servers, which included the OVP1 server, so that now we're on a three-week cycle. Every three weeks, they overwrite the existing tapes. Um, and so if, if OVP is doing records management with tape backups, then they have a problem. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, who do we have next? Mr. Horn. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to ask you, Ms. Lambeth, you said there were 20,000 emails a day. Now, was that limited strictly to the executive office of the president, or could outside parties within the government or outside send emails into that system? There were approximately, if I remember correctly, um, there were 20,000 or so email messages that came in um, through email each day. That was not limited to just within. Um, okay, you're saying the 20,000 come, could come from people, or was that put into a different email system? The, there were different email systems that, for like the president, um, people sending through the internet, their internet mail, what we called um, uh, POTUS, well, the, the president, the vice president, and the first lady 
um, got emails from outside that basically was um, came through um, the file was um, then sent over to their various offices and they then the files ran through if I remember correctly a word perfect process that allowed them to view and search those files in other words uh, those three categories the, the president the vice president the first lady had an email system that didn't necessarily go through your system is that correct uh, the internet mail did not go th through that yeah, system well, if, if I remember correctly friends, I, I assume they gave a code to the personal friends as to how to reach them I can't answer to that okay I, well, I don't know let me ask you on firewalls within the system obviously with hackers all over the world and the country and foreign governments also <coughs> did, did you have protections to keep hackers from getting into the system well, we had, um, yes, we did have a firewall, and I'm having to really think back about the structure of this. We had um, Storm, which basically helped um, keep certain types of email messages from coming through or numbers of email messages coming through to set, shut the system down. Um, Sandy and John basically were the ones that handled this particular area and kept a close watch on it um, and were notified if there were problems with this. I yield the rest of my time to the chairman. So I, just, I just have one uh, real quick question for Mr. Haas. Uh, Ms. Hall did not uh, have anything to do with Project X, as I understand it. So not at the beginning, no. So, so why did you go to Mrs. Hall's office and talk to her about that? She was asking questions about it, and in, in the direct line of uh, the 10 years I've worked there, uh, in the period of time she's been there, she has been more or less the, the top of my working food chain, if you will. And uh, she was asking me about it, after, as I said, after we made disclosure to uh, the Northrop Grumman, we're told we could now work on the project and talk to whoever we needed to talk to with that. When she asked uh, the questions, I assumed it was in an official capacity, and I answered her questions to the best of my ability. So, so she asked you to come to her office, then you answered the questions? Yeah, I, I commonly stop by there many times a day. It's, it's right in uh, line with what I normally do. Okay, I'll uh, yield to my counsel. You've been here a long day, so I'll be very, very brief. Thank you. I've spoken with most of you. You've been very cooperative. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, it has been a long day, so I'll try and get to uh, resolve three things. Mr. Barry, uh, when we spoke, and, and you were very forthcoming, we appreciate that, uh, you mentioned to us that in January or February of 1998, you had identified this anomaly in the, in the Lewinsky email traffic, and you had suggested that you wrote a report. Uh, and, and we have just been furnished this. Now, um, I wanted to ask you, do you know whether this document's been produced to the committee? All I know is I turned it over to uh, counsel's office. Okay. Now, I, I only ask this. We'll go back and check. We, we've checked three times now, and we're having a hearing today about failure to produce documents, and we sent a subpoena out last week that was very, very clear. It, it wasn't uh, broad. It, it said specifically, because you told us that you had this document and, and you knew where it was, we asked specifically for the incident report uh, that you prepared, and that is this document. And it appears to us that, um, although documents have been produced to us by the White House. We've not received this copy, and I notice you were able to turn to your counsel and get a copy from him uh, immediately. Uh, so if, if there's anything you can help us with this issue to, to tell us whether uh, you know anything about why this document wasn't produced to us. Like I said, I turned the document over to OA counsel. That's all I know. I don't know where it went from there. Okay, well, we'll, we'll follow up on that on our own time and um, just double check to, to ensure Excuse me, would counsel? I'd like to just note for the record that contrary to all of the other documents the council uh, has reviewed and, and we have had available, uh, this document, which I introduced into the record because we just received it today, uh, does not bear any of that, the identifying uh, marks such as would indicate that we had received it. None of my documents would, Congressman. Without objections, order. Uh, the, the second thing I wanted to follow up on was something that you said, Mr. Haas, uh, and it relates to a letter we received from the White House at the end of last week. They explained to us, uh, White House counsel explained to us in great depth that uh, many of the emails from outside of the White House complex would have been reviewed or searched in other ways and basically indicated that there probably wasn't much of a problem because 
uh, many of the emails that we're talking about today, these hundreds of thousands of emails, have actually been scrutinized. And, and one thing you said struck me as very important. You, you indicated that the emails that um, are on the, the, the personal computers of users in the White House uh, don't stay there for a very long time. And you said, I believe, 98 percent of the emails w would not be reviewed if somebody were going back to uh, look at I think you got. I think you misunderstood. Uh, there, 98 percent of all the emails are on the mail server and were subject to the error of the glitch of not being recovered. Any person that had made a personal copy of their mail file, not they don't move. There is never ever any mail, active mail as I call it, on your computer. You're looking through a window using your computer at our server at all times. If you choose to make a copy subsequent to looking at it, it's always delivered to the server. If you choose to make a copy down to your C drive, and that is your local file, and you choose not to co uh, not to search it under subpoena, that's right. your no, thing. That, yeah. that point I understand, but okay. that takes the affirmative step of actually copying the yes. email to preserve it. Oh, absolutely. It. If you it's haven't taken that affirmative step, it's not going to stay forever on your computer. It'll go away. So if somebody comes back six months later and asks you to search for a particular type of information, it's not, there. It's not going to be there. So any representation given to us that uh, all of these um, documents would have been searched in another way uh, would only be correct if people were able to had affirmatively copied all of the information and gone back and done these searches. Is that correct? Or if they had actually done a mail search manually on their on the server of their mail file and then printed them off. Right. Which and most people would not have the ability to do that. I, I am under the understanding you do not search your own mail file and many other people that I've talked to over the ten years I've been there said we don't have to search our mail files. That's done for us. We search everything else. And just one last question, Mr. Hawkins, if I could follow up on something you said. Um, we heard the story about how Ms. Lambeth uh, and, and you locked horns on a number of issues, and uh, it became clear that she would not tell you what the scope of the, the problem was that people were working on, and you were dissatisfied with that. Is that correct? Yes, it was. Okay. Now, now you said, and I'll, I'll read back the direct quote that, that you said, um, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Is, is that right? Absolutely. So just, I just wanted to establish one thing, and that is that, um, that Ms. Ms. Lambeth did have a, a, a personnel action taken vis-a-vis uh, -vis her remaining on the contract that, that you supervised. Is that correct? She was removed. She was removed. Right. And so it, it seems that the position that she was put in, uh, being uh, sort of made not to tell people and her supervisors what was going on actually had a, a relationship to what happened to her in her employment. Is that correct? Uh, I mean, let me characterize. I would uh, suspect uh, anyone that's got any experience in a management role on a government contract, they understand compliance with that contract. Numerous times during the employment history at EOP, Betty was had, had to be counseled of stepping out of bounds, taking direction from a government employee. It's very, very clear in the EOP contract that they take directions from the COTAR, which is given to the program manager. These were many, many times in my staff meetings, I had to continue to remind the employees there because they lose sight from day to day. They get alliances with some of the government uh, employees. Right, no, I, I understand that. I think you made that very clear. But in this case, it, it does seem that it's clear Ms. Lambeth didn't inform you of the full scope of a problem, and that did have a, ba a bearing on how you reacted to her. And it seems justifiably, is that correct? Had we not had any prior problems, that would not have been enough to have her removed from the contract, period. Plain and simple. Uh, Mr. Wilson, I do um, believe that the document you referred to is, and I understand in documents you can lose sight of where they are, is E as in Edward 2496. But thank you very much. We'll check that. Thank you. Could I? say something? Mr. Chairman, I did want to make that very same point. So if I might ask, E2496 is a do as identification of documents that were submitted to this committee? I'm, I'm told that that is, the, that is the document to which uh, uh, Congressman Barr was referring. That okay, well, that's the record. That's so my understanding, sure. but I will double check. Ms. Lambert, do you want to conclude? 
Yes, in my defense, I would like to say this. I was often accused of aligning myself with uh, one of the government supervisors. In reality, that particular government supervisor, Laura Crabtree, was the branch chief who I got who had most of my projects. About 95% of the work that I did for EOP fell under her direction. And I basically was keeping her informed of processes that were being done, trying to allow her to know about issues so that she did not get broadsided. Um, and she was giving me other direction as far as other things that they needed done on a particular project or why a project might slip. And it was only in the course of my work that um, I was um, as was stated um, so far, such as taking direction from a supervisor. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Souter. Uh, may I have unanimous consent to ask a, a brief questioning to Ms. Ms. Golas? So there's something directly related that I may have yes, misunderstood briefly, sure. to ask Mr. Lindsay. Um, you stated, uh, under questioning, I think, from Mr. LaTourette, that uh, you had dealt with classified material before, therefore you didn't, weren't surprised necessarily by the request. Um, did they imply to you that this material was in any way classified? No, um, just really sensitive. By really sensitive, in other words, one of the problems we've dealt with in this committee is that things that were more really sensitive in political terms were treated as if they were classified. So you just, you, you, made your own personal conclusion that this could be more like classified material than anybody suggesting that to you? Yes. Yeah, no one ever used the word classified to me. Thank you. Well, let me just conclude by this has been a long, uh, arduous task for all of you. Uh, we appreciate uh, you coming, and uh, hopefully uh, we won't have to uh, bother you again, but uh, we do appreciate you being here today. Uh, I'm going to call Ms. Hall, uh, Chairman Burton. We, we will take that under advisement. We have another panelist uh, due right now. Uh, if members want, do any members want to take a break here? If not, we'll go ahead with the next panel. And uh, if, uh, if there's any need for any break for anybody, we'll uh, allow that. But if not, let's go ahead with the next panel. That's right, we'll take, we'll, we'll wait five minutes. Uh, we, we have a couple of uh, people, the council, that needs to take a quick break, so we'll be just no more than five minutes, so we can move ahead, no more than five minutes.
sworn in my, my correct name. It's Laura Callahan. Laura Callahan. It Cal has been since September of 1998 when I was married. Would you like it to be Laura Callahan or Laura Crabtree Callahan? It's Laura Callahan. Laura Callahan, okay. As Laura Callahan. Thank you. Raise your hand. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you got. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Callahan. Thank you. Okay. Before I ask any questions, I'd like to uh, make uh, one real quick comment, and that is that the committee has conducted a lengthy investigation of campaign finance scandals. Over 120 people have fled the country or hid behind the Fifth Amendment when we wanted to talk to them. When we found out about the email problem, we asked people to come in for interviews, and uh, both of you agreed to come in. Then you suddenly changed your mind and backed out. I was very disappointed that you decided to do that. People who work for the White House, uh, Mr. Lindsay uh, and others, uh, we believe should cooperate voluntarily with the Congress. And uh, you should Chairman, play. If, if I could interrupt no, for a moment. No, you, that, mean, you mean, counsel, well, it's incorrect, counsel you may not speak before the committee. You can speak through your client. You cannot speak before the committee. And I'm making an opening statement. You, your client can respond when we get into questions. Just so you know the statement. Mr. Accurate. What is your name, sir? Patrick. You're not allowed to speak as counsel to the witnesses before any congressional committee. You can confer with your client. You can ask, tell your client what to say, but he's the one that's supposed to respond. We believe that the people at the White House should try to cooperate and, and, and not keep information from the Congress or try to uh, uh, stonewall us. At any rate, we sent you a subpoena, and we're happy that you're here. And I look forward to the answers uh, to your questions. Uh, Ms. Crabtree, first of all, let me address you. When did you have your first conversation with Betty Lambeth about the problem with some incoming White House emails not being properly managed? Uh, Chairman, uh, if I may please uh, set the record straight. Uh, first of all, to, to the best Would you of my pull the microphone closer to you, ma'am? Yes, sir. First of all, to the best of my knowledge, no one has ever approached me to ask me any information up until this time. Uh, so I just want to make that very clear that I have not declined any previous requests for information because no one has ever approached me prior to this time for information. Okay. Do, you, do, do either one of you have opening statements you'd like to make? Yes, just Mr. Chairman. Okay. Well, Mr. Lindsay, we'll let you go first, then we'll get back to questions. I, I would like, sir, just to first address your first comment, and that is the refusal to provide um, or to cooperate or come in for an interview. I was more than willing and have been and was very surprised when I received the subpoena because there was a statement or belief on my part that I was going to have an appointment to come in for an interview. I would have had no objection whatsoever to coming into an interview, and it was my understanding that my counsel talked to, when I acquired counsel, they talked to the committee's counsel, and then the, only, the next communication was that we were going to be, where should service be provided for the submission of a subpoena. I would have been more than willing to come in and engage in an interview and looked forward to it. There must have been some miscommunication because the way our, the way our counsel understood it, was that you said you would come in, an appointment had been set, and then the White House informed us that you had retained counsel. That wasn't my understanding at all, and I would have, I had no objection to coming in and well, talking Well, then, then if that's the case and you had no objection, then we'll retract what we said, and we're glad you're here. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, my name is Mark Lindsay. I'm the assistant to the president for management and administration. I've been with the White House since June of 1997. Before working at the White House, I worked as a staff member and counsel to Congressman Lewis Stokes, a member whom I've had an enormous amount of respect, and one of the last projects I worked on was the Ethics Reform Task Force. Because of that experience, I was brought on board to help the White House deal with and developing a relationship with the Congress and improving how we were dealing with matters as it relates to our information technology infrastructure. When I came to the White House, one of the major issues that I had to deal with is that we had major infrastructure problems in terms of our status of our technology. 
as a result of in, engaging in that investigation and looking into how those things were being done, we actually were able to develop a, a what I would consider a good relationship with our subcommittee and Treasury Postal that was able to work out our appropriations issues so the White House could help move forward past having our funds fence and moving towards getting the kind of relationship that the presidency and the kind of support the presidency should receive from the Congress. And I'm very proud of that interaction. As far as the matters that are related in this committee hearing today, I first became aware of the computer glitch in June of 1998. It is the best of my recollection that Ms. Crabtree, a very trusted and valuable employee for the Executive Office of the President, brought that matter to my attention. When I became aware of that particular issue, my first instruction and my first belief was to do whatever was necessary to fix the computer problem. Please keep in mind, Mr. Chairman, we had been faced with numerous and countless problems with system failures and systems that were being lost. One of the things that we we're constantly concerned about is making sure that we maintained the integrity of our computer systems and made sure they continued to operate. On the point of providing any kind of instruction and intimidation, I did say to Ms. Crabtree that this was a matter that I believed that needed to be kept in, in bounds with those people who needed the information to perform repairs to the system. I believed that very, very much. I knew that in many cases there were investigations being conducted about individuals who were at the White House. I preferred very much that those individuals not hear about the way they were being treated by people who were talking around at the water cooler, but they learned in official processes and procedures. I felt very, very strongly about that. But on the point of whether or not I issued any kind of threat to employees, I can state to you quite emphatically and quite clearly, it's not something that I did, it's not something that I would condone, and it's not something that I would ever permit to happen if it came to my knowledge. As a matter of fact, Mr. Chairman, it's something that I find very, very troubling, and I would have done something about it right then. I was also the ethics officer for my agency as general counsel at that time, and following those kinds of rules were very important to me. And I think that my record will show that in my interactions with Congress, the time that I spent here, the people that I worked with, the one thing that they would say about me is that that kind of behavior is out of the lexicon for Mark Lindsay. Let me go on to state that once we did find out about this particular glit computer glitch problem, we then moved forward, or I believe we we're moving forward, towards fixing this particular issue. The very first instance, that very first day when I was informed, the first thing I did is place a call to my boss, Ada Posey, the director of the office administration, her boss, Virginia Puzo, the assistant to the president for management and administration, who then directed me to communicate directly with the counsel to the president and to let them know that this computer glitch had been discovered. Once we conveyed that information, I directed my staff to prepare a memorandum which prepared and transmitted that information in writing to the counsel expressing the concern about what was included in that email or what wasn't included in the email. One other thing I would state is that at that particular time, I was particularly, when I first heard about it, at least best of my recollection, it was my understanding that emails weren't being put into the armed service system. I was relieved to learn that it was just emails that were coming to the inside as opposed to all emails not going to that system in the relevant time period. It was very important to me to make sure that that information was conveyed to the appropriate authorities. It's important to also understand that the office administration is a custodian of the records for the White House office. We maintained that information for the White House office. We did not and never during the time that I was there did I direct any particular search of emails, nor would I have without the direction of White House counsel. I would not have directed the reconstruction of any kinds of emails without the direction and, co and, and cooperation of my colleagues in the White House. It just would not have happened. It was very, very important to me to follow and conduct ourselves in a way which was fitting with the circumstances that I tried to establish with our Treasury Postal Subcommittee. And that is one basic principle. I believe very strongly that open and clear communication on what was going on was the only way that we could move from the position where we were, where in 19, fiscal year 1998, we had all of our information technology funds fenced. And during that time period, we were unable to make a lot of the improvements, address the, you've heard people talk about in the last panel about server space problems and whatnot. 
That was because we didn't have the proper resource. And Mr. Chairman, some of that was, was our fault in terms of how we went about going out doing our information planning. We developed the strategy working with a partnership with Congress for how we're going to move forward and how we're going to build a much more robust system. And I'm very happy to report that in November of 1998, we were able to develop a, a solution for this computer glitch. And then we got our funding for our Y2K money in that particular year. Unfortunately, we were very much behind schedule. We were faced with my computer experts came to me and said, essentially, you will fail to meet your Y2K deadlines. You are not going to make it. You're starting too late. And you don't have the appropriate resources in place to be able to achieve the goals you need to achieve. What you need to do is focus on your mission critical systems and on those systems which are mission support and critical to taking care of those needs. Because of that requirement to address the Y2K glitch and to redress those issues, the reconstruction of the email was a matter which had to be placed in the context of maintaining the total email situation. What we did after we were able to address the Y2K problem at, at the end of February 29th of, 19, uh, of 2000 is we were able to then continue the efforts. Please keep in mind that during this relevant time period in October of 1998, we'd received information from Northrop Grumman stating that it would cost us $600,000 just to assess what the scope of the problem was just to assess what the scope of the problem was. I can report to you today that that $600,000 worth of work has been completed by the White House staff or the Office of Administration staff that were tasked for working with this, and they are moving forward with taking, for, taking steps to address the reconstruction issue, which is moving forward and would have moved forward even given the circumstances that we have here. With all of that, I say it to emphasize the fact that, number one, there was no particular point in providing any kind of quote-unquote cover-up of this particular information. From my perspective, because I didn't review the document requests that were provided to this particular uh, committee or to in other investigative bodies, I would have no knowledge and did not have any knowledge of what information would have been produced and what wouldn't have been produced. We responded to subpoenas and document requests that were passed through the council's office and passed those documents forward. I never reviewed those document requests and reviewed them for responsiveness, reviewed them for privilege, or other kinds of assertions which one could assert at one particular time. We presented it and provided that information to those authorities. Well, 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 well you've created a number of questions we'll get to in just a few moments. Ms. Crabtree, uh, do you, how do you want me to address you, Ms. Crabtree, or how? My correct name is Mrs. Callahan. Mrs. Callahan. Okay, we will address you as Mrs. Callahan. Mrs. Callahan, do you have an opening statement? Yes, Mr. Chairman. First of all, again, I'd just like to rearticulate the fact that um, up until this event today, no one has made any attempt to reach me um, unless my attorney has, has reached, read, had such requests given to him. But to my knowledge, there has been no attempt to get a hold of me. Um, so as a result, I would like to be able to start out, first of all, by introducing myself to you. And I'm pleased by the reaction to correct the name. Um, so I would like you to get to know who I am because, again, we've never had an opportunity to talk, so I don't think anyone here really knows who Laura Callahan truly is. Just real briefly, I'd like to let you know that I'm a career civil servant. I have almost 16 years of federal service. I started my career civil service back in 1984, and I have been working in various different capacities. I came to the Executive Office of the President on September 30th of 1996 as the Lotus Notes Windows NT Project Manager. At the time that I arrived at the Executive Office of the President back in uh, that September 30th date, uh, the position of the Desktop Systems Branch Chief was vacant. The position was empty. Mr. Paul Myers was acting in the capacity of the branch chief at the time when I arrived back in 1996. In March of 1997, the position of the desktop systems branch chief was announced, and I competed for the position in which I was then selected as the desktop systems branch chief. As the desktop systems branch chief, uh, I was responsible for the customer service support activities the help desk, as well as the developmental activities for the desktop systems and the Windows NT file servers. 
Prior to my coming to the EOP, I worked at the Pittsburgh Research Center for the Centers of Disease Control, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. That particular research center was previously known as the Bureau of Mines Pittsburgh Research Center, an agency that was abolished and the functions assumed under the responsibility of the Centers for Disease Control. For the time that I was at the Pittsburgh Research Center, I spent three years there as the director of the Information Systems and Technology Group, responsible for the computing and networking needs there at the Research Center. I'm a graduate of Thomas Edison State College in Trenton, New Jersey, and I have numerous certificates and a series of awards and recognitions that I've basically been able to achieve over my almost 16 years of federal service. Um, I do have available for you, if you would like, a list of those accomplishments because I think it helps you understand who I am because those accomplishments number over 40 and they include recognition from not only uh, commands and agencies for which I worked for, but they also include recognition from outside entities. What I mean by that, to give you an idea of who I am, the outside awards include the 1995 Supervisor of the Year Excuse Award. Excuse me, Ms. Callahan, I don't mean to be implied, but uh, your entire uh, record of accomplishments is, is, is not necessary at this time. We really want to get on with the questions uh, pertinent to the uh, hearing. Uh, if you would like to summarize, we'll be happy to have you summarize. And we're impressed, obviously, with your credentials, but uh, we'd like to get on with the questioning. Do you have anything else you'd like I to say? I would just like to know, sir, if you'd like them for the record so you understand. Sure, we'll be I happy am. to put those in the record for you. Thank you. Uh, and then I would also like to say that uh, at the Executive Office of the President, um, both in my capacity as the Lotus Notes Windows NT Program Manager and also in my duties as the Desktop Systems Branch Chief, um, from what I've heard today being my first exposure to these activities, um, I have to say that um, I'm rather ambivalent at the moment. Um, I am here voluntarily and willingly to help you with any information that you need and then provide any data that you so desire. Um, I'm just uh, quite frankly a little perplexed as why it took today's event and a subpoena. I would have been more than willing to be here at any previous time or help you with any information prior well, to this. Thank you. Well, we, 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 I think we covered that uh, my counsel contacted the White House, uh, an agreement was reached that uh, you and Mr. Lindsay would, would come down voluntarily, and then we uh, understood that that was withdrawn and you hired counsel, and uh, that's why the subpoenas were issued. Nevertheless, we're glad you're here. Excuse we're me, Mr. Chairman, I just want to uh, make sure that people understand um, this is all very foreign to me. Um, I hired counsel because I need someone that understands the process, and being that my counsel um, himself was the chief counsel for the Ethics Committee, I'm in following him, his, his guidance, just to help me get through the process, and that was the reason for securing that, that, counsel. That's fine. We appreciate that. Now, let's get back to the questions. Uh, Ms. Crabtree, when did you have your first conversation with Betty Lambeth about the problem with some incoming White House emails not being properly managed? Mr. Chairman, it's Mrs. Callahan. Mrs. I know Callahan. that's a hard habit to break. Mrs. Callahan. Thank you. Maybe this will help. <laughs> when did you have your first conversation with Ms. Lambeth about this? My first conversation is when uh, Betty Lambeth approached me in June of 98 to advise me that we had yet another problem with email. Okay. D during that conversation, did she show you an email from Robert Haas or Yemen Salam describing the problem? No, sir. It was a very brief interaction for her to advise me that they have yet another problem with the email system. Okay. Well, which was not she did not show, she did not show you the memo. No, sir. Okay. Would you pull the microphone a little closer, please, Ms. Callahan? Uh, how significant did you understand the problem to be when you heard about it? Did you understand it to be pretty significant? The initial report from Betty Lambeth was to the effect that there had been uh, some kind of a discrepancy noticed with the email system. Uh, this was uh, something that had been noticed and there was no data as of this time to tell us as to what degree and depth the problem really occurred. Well, did, did, did you tell Ms. Lambeth uh, at that time not to tell anyone about the problem? Not at that time, sir. But you did later? 
Later on, sir, there was a different series of events that occurred. Okay, well, we'll get to those in just a minute. Did you instruct her at that time to tell her subordinates working on the problem that they were not to tell anyone about it? No, sir, not at that time. Did you specifically say that they couldn't talk to their bosses at Northrop Grumman? No, sir, not at that time. Not at that time. Well, uh, when did you tell them that, and what did you tell them? Perhaps it would help, sir, for yourself and the committee to understand the series of events. Uh, Ms. Lambeth first reported that there had been a detected problem with the email system. We can't hear you. Can you pull the mic a little closer, please? Sorry. Okay. Um, we had learned about the problem through Betty Lambeth advising me that we had an anomaly with the email system. My first reaction to her was what it has always been uh, while I was employed at the Executive Office of the President, and that was the fact that, okay, this is not new. We've had numerous problems with the email system. It was very poorly designed and very poorly constructed by a contractor prior to Northrop Grumman. So as a result, anomalies were fairly common. And as our normal process, when an anomaly occurs, our first order of business is to figure out what we're dealing with. What is the situation? What is affected? What is the sky, size and scope of the problem and the depth so that we can figure out what the situation is and figure out the appropriate corrective measures. So that was the focus of the first discussion with Ms. Lambeth was to figure out indeed what was this anomaly and I instructed her to do some diagnostic and research activities to find out the scope and depth of the situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when, when the meeting took place with all the people who were at the first table here today what did you say to them during that conversation about the confidentiality of the records well mr chairman prior to that there's a couple key events i think well that I, I, the i'm concerned about that meeting at this point i can't answer sir without giving you the appropriate context because then you won't be able to understand the reason for the meeting uh, if i may <laughs> okay give me the context Th thank you mr chairman i appreciate that um, I had notified Mr. Lindsay immediately that we had an anomaly situation and that we had begun the research efforts. Very shortly, within a period of, and I'm working off of memory, bear with me, approximately a day or two of time passing, Betty Lambeth returned back to me very anxious, very nervous, uh, and concerned. She brought it to my attention, the fact that uh, Mr. Bob Haas had found email messages pertaining to Monica Lewinsky and Ashley Raines. Uh, the reasoning for this activity I, was unclear to me and it was rather perplexing because I had not instructed the contractors to do any type of subject matter search at this point in time, nor had I and did I have any role to do of any of those type of searches during my employment at the EOP other than functioning as a normal employee responding to normal document searches and requests. So I was very concerned why all of a sudden we had specific email being brought to my attention in a very, very short period of time when we did not even fully understand the size and the scope of the situation. So I had talked to Ms. Lambeth and asked her very specifically what was the situation, why did Bob take it upon himself, Mr. Haas, to do these searches. Um, she was unable to answer that question for me and re-articulated something that was a regular pattern at the EO and that regular pattern was the fact that Mr. Haas um, was a very talkative individual and a very inquisitive individual, um, similar to like a, a child on the first, you know, on the day of Christmas, waking up first, running down, opening up all the presents to see what's inside before anyone else had a chance. So as a result of her concern and her repeated issues working with Mr. Haas in the past, and the fact that he had somehow taken it upon himself through whatever means I am not sure to do a search and had already found these documents dealing with Ashley Raines and Monica Lewinsky was the concern of both Betty Lambeth and myself. So we had discussed options on how to approach this, in which case we decided that we would get a meeting together with all of the team members, including Mr. Haas and Betty Lambeth, and basically walk them through the standard procedures of how we handle these type of events at the EOP.
And what I mean by that as far as the standard procedures and what they were advised at the meeting was the fact that the normal procedures are if you're in receiving any inquiries from folks such as the press, to please refer them to the Office of Public Affairs. And if anyone else had any, any particular questions or had a need to know, to please refer them to either myself or Mr. Lindsay. Uh, so Betty and I had made the decision jointly to have that meeting, and I in turn left and went and advised Mr. Lindsay of the situation, that Mr. Hawes had found this information. We did not know what uh, his motivation was behind that. And there was already people in the hallway starting to, to discuss this. And obviously, as we're all aware from the newspapers and the media, the other events going on, uh, when I advised Mr. Lindsay of this, he concurred that this was a situation that we needed to be careful of because it was sensitive. And as such, Mr. Lindsay participated in the team conference call meeting in which all of the members of the team were present, and Mr. Lindsay was there via conference call and re-articulated the standard operating procedure. And in absolutely no way did I ever make any personal threats to any individuals uh, during that time frame. We had... Uh I think five people there, uh, three of them indicated that uh, they had been told to uh, be quiet, to keep a lid on this, that there was a threat, that uh, they might even go to jail if they said something. Uh, there were three of them that recalled that. Now, one of them even told her supervisor that she couldn't tell him anything. Uh, even though he threatened her with reprisals because she said she didn't want to go to jail. Now, how, how did they get that idea, do you think? Mr. Chairman, first of all, from what I've heard today, there's very different recollections of those individuals. Well, and, excuse and me it, for interrupting. Three of them have referred to the jail comment. Two of them said they don't recall that, but they didn't refute it. So no one has refuted it, but three have said that they felt that there was a possibility they would face jail. Now, how do you suppose they got that feeling? Well, Mr. Chairman, I could tell you and the other members of this committee, I did not threaten them with any sense of jail uh, for several reasons. And first did you threaten them with dismissal or any kind of reprisals? No, sir, because they're, they would be idle threats. I have no authority, first of all, to carry out those type of threats. Mm -hmm. uh, and number two, it's not anywhere in my demeanor, or my past practice, or my character to do those type of threats. Okay, well, let me ask Mr. Lindsay a couple of questions. Mr. Lindsay, do you recall the phone call in question? No, I don't. You don't recall the phone call with them in Mrs. Uh, uh, Callahan or Crabtree's office? No, I don't, sir. You don't recall? Well, during that, uh, <laughs> the selective memory loss of people that come to us from the White House just mystifies me. This was a pretty significant conversation. They were talking about emails that, uh, that had been lost, which had been subpoenaed by myself, the Independent Counsel, and the Justice Department. And there were all of these people from Northrop Grumman in... Miss, then Miss Crabtree or Miss Callahan's office, and you don't recall talking to them about that? No, sir, and I think that one of the things that places into context is that at that present time, I was handling two other investigations directed by Congress over the handling of classified materials, which I considered very, very serious, mm -hmm. and I had numerous conference calls over those materials where I worked with um, uh, Chairman Solomon's committee and the House Select Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Mm -hmm. I also had investigations that were going on dealing with those things. Those were investigations that I was tasked with dealing with members and dealing with other individuals. Or resolving those issues. Were you, were you aware of the subpoenas that had been issued uh, by the uh, uh, House, this committee, and the Independent Council asking for documents pertaining to a whole series of investigations involving the FBI files, the travel office investigation? The, Absolutely, sir. Then, then, then if you were aware of those and you knew the emails were relevant to our investigations, why wouldn't this click on in your brain? Because, as Ms. Callahan stated, 
the, my instruction from the very first instance was to fix whatever problem was there, but to also identify the scope and breadth of what the problem was. Uh -huh. This was very early in the situation in terms of what was going on. I didn't know for sure that information had not been provided to you or any other committee. I knew that document productions had been made, of course, that was very obvious and common knowledge. Okay, but well, what I didn't know was that the information contained in these emails was emails that was responsive to the document request that you're referring to. Well, let, let me interrupt you. You had emails that had been lost since September of 1996. The campaign finance investigation uh, dealt with that time frame. Money came in from all over the world into campaigns. There was a serious investigation going on. And, and, and the emails that were lost during that time frame, you didn't even, that didn't click into your mind that they might have been relevant to that investigation? Well, first off, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would say that whether emails were lost or not is a conclusion that was a, a technical conclusion that had not been reached yet. What I asked be done is that there be an investigation to find out what the nature of the problem was. Okay, so well, I could, I think it was, pre, it would be premature for me to say that. And as Ms. Callahan stated, let, let, let me just let me just ask one more question here, and then yes, we'll sir. yield to my colleagues. You do not remember saying anything about this in a telephone conversation to the people that were at that meeting. All five of them remember, but you don't. Uh, no, I, like I said, you Mr. don't Chairman, remember. Okay, I don't that, remember. You don't remember, and Miss Crabtree or Miss Callahan, you don't uh, remember making any kind of a threat to any of these people, even though they all remember being concerned about what was said at that meeting and so concerned that they went to Starbucks and across the street to a park to talk about these things. You don't remember making any kind of a uh, of uh, any kind of a threat of any type to them. Mr. Chairman, I did not threaten anyone. I advised them of the standard practice and the procedures to handle sensitive situations. Uh, well, and, uh, we have 30 minutes on this thing. Okay, well, Mr. Waxman. Um, Mrs. Kellen, uh, you uh, said you worked for the federal government since 1984, is that right? Yes, sir. And are you a career civil servant or a political appointee? I'm a career civil servant, sir, with absolutely no desires or aspirations for the politics. In fact, I understand you're, you are a registered Republican, or at least you were at the time all of this happened. Is that right? Yes, sir, I was, and I still am. What's your area of expertise? My area of expertise is in the computer science arena. I've been working in that capacity since my entrance into the federal civil service back in 1984. Have you received any uh, federal awards for federal your federal service? Um, yes, sir. I've, in fact, I've submitted for the record here. I have over 40 different awards. Most recently, or two from last week for exemplary achievement. I also have awards uh, from independent parties, such as being named one of the nation's top webmasters in 1996, I believe was the year. And in 1995, I would receive the award from the Federal Executive Board, the Bronze Award for being Supervisor of the Year. And I have a litany of other accomplishments and achievements for which I've been recognized for my work. Uh, how long were you employed at the Executive Office of the President, or EOP? I was employed from September 30th of 1996 until uh, about the October 10th or the 11th time frame of 1998. And uh, what were your duties at the EOP? Uh, my initial duties, I was hired to be the uh, Windows NT and Lotus Notes program manager. That's what I started out at. And uh, then I competed for and was selected into the position of the desktop systems branch chief in March of 1997, where I then took on the responsibilities of customer service support, help desk, as well as the uh, development activities for the desktop systems, which included uh, the desktop themselves and computers on the people's desks and what they saw, as well as the Windows NT servers. And where do you work now? I currently work at the Department of Labor. I'm, uh, just to give you a little bit about myself there, I am in oh, the senior good. executive service at the Department of Labor. Yeah, briefly, I'm, because I have questions I want to ask about certainly. And the I'm issue the special under investigation today. Certainly. I'm aside the from investigating your background. Yeah. 
And thank you. And I'm the Special Assistant for Information Technology, where I perform the duties of the Deputy CIO, and I'm the Director of the Information Technology Center. Now, I believe you learned about the Mail 2 problem in June of 1998. How did you find out? Miss Betty Lambeth brought it to my attention. And what were you told about the nature of the problem? This was uh, very, very much unknown. We just knew we had some type of an anomaly. We didn't even know the size and scope or, or of the situation. We didn't know at that time if it was strictly one of the mail servers or all of the mail servers. We just knew we had a problem. And what was your reaction to the problem? I go into my normal diagnostic behavior. I, I instructed her that we have a situation that we need to figure out what it is. I asked her to go back and look at the situation and research it to find out the scope of the situation, uh, how large it was, did it affect all of the email servers, some of the email servers, all of the user accounts, some of the user accounts, certain types of email, and basically diagnostic type discussion. And you talked to Mr. Lindsay about it at that time? Yes, sir. I just advised Mr. Lindsay that we had yet another anomaly. Um, again, understanding that um, when I came to the executive office of the president, uh, the Lotus Notes email system was uh, built and in, uh, in very bad shape. It was not designed very well, nor was it operating correctly. What did he say to you? He basically just reiterated um, a lot of the things that I had already discussed with Ms. Lambeth, figure out the size and the scope of the situation. And he was very concerned that we go and do some research to find out whose email was affected, um, how many people, and basic diagnostic information. He rearticulated the fact to find out. I understand one of the first things that you did was to call a meeting in your office on June 15, 1998 with the Northrop Grumman employees who were responsible for the Arms Lotus interface. These were the same individuals who testified on the first panel. Uh, there have been allegations that you threatened them with jail, and Mr. Burton's already asked you about that, but they, they told us, they, uh, some of them anyway, said that they thought you were threatening them with jail if they talked about the email problem. Mr. Haas uh, claims that you told him there would be, quote, a jail cell with his name on it if he mentioned the problem to his wife. Uh, others who were present for this meeting, like Miss Salem and Mr. Spriggs, have said that they don't remember you making any threats. I want to ask you about this meeting and what you said. At that meeting, um, did you tell anybody to destroy any, any, any emails or cover up the problem? On the issue of destruction of email, I've never given any instruction to destroy any email messages. I want to make sure that that's very perfectly clear to everybody. Um, in regards to the meeting, what prompted the meeting was the fact that a Northrop Grumman employee, Mr. Robert Hawes, um, had brought to Betty Lambus attention uh, that he had found an email pertaining to Ashley Raines and Monica Lewinsky when there had been no direction, to my knowledge, given to him to conduct such a search. And uh, why, quite frankly, it perplexes me. I'm, I don't understand his motivation at this point in time because we are in a diagnostic mode, trying to understand, first of all, what servers were involved, and then which email users on which server were impacted. And then when we found, could figure out that, we had to find out how many emails for each of those users were indeed affected. We did not know that at this time. And I'm also a little perplexed, uh, quite frankly, if I may. Um, I've heard allegations that have been made, and I've read them in the Washington Times, and it makes me, quite frankly, a little angry. Um, well, it makes me a lot angry uh, for several reasons, because uh, they are strictly allegations. But in addition to that, I find it um, rather mystifying that someone like Betty Lamboth can make a statement today about being threatened by myself and feeling so concerned that she's going to jail by this alleged threat that she felt it uh, to make the decision herself meetings off-site, but yet this is the same individual who, after leaving the EOP in July, uh, accepted an invitation to my wedding and attended my wedding in September of that very same year, in September of 98, bringing me a gift and wishing me well. I'm just, quite frankly, perplexed by all of the, the different behaviors. Let me ask you this about Mr. Huss, because he made the accusation, and I thought he was pretty sincere. He did tell us he made a flippant comment to you, and the res your response might have been a flippant response, because sometimes when people say something flippant, they get a, re a response, but he didn't take it to be flippant. But he said you responded, 
he, he, I think he asked something, what will happen if I tell my wife or tell people, and you said, oh, there'll be a jail cell with your name on it. Could that have been uh, the way th this whole thing took place and you just don't recall it? I do not ever remember, nor is it what I have ever said anything about a jail cell. Um, and quite frankly, um, I think Mr. Haas characterized himself with his flippant comments. I would suggest um, that uh, he may be either having bad recollection or may have an overactive imagination with regards to the threat being made to him. Um, well, you could have said that if this information gets out, it would be in violation of the contract, the law, something like that? Uh, Mr. Waxman, um, first of all, we didn't know what the information was. We we're still trying well, to... Well, you knew that the information was going to be while the president was being investigated and the Congress and the Independent Council and everybody was trying to get documents and email that there were a lot of things that weren't on that, on that uh, a whole system that was supposed to enable people to get all the documents. You knew that right away, didn't you? At that point in time, we did not know. The only knowledge that I had was the fact that Mr. Hawes had found some email messages, uh, four, that dealt with Ashley Raines and Monica Lewinsky. Um, and as a result of that, I had the meeting in order to advise them not to, to have any open discussions about this, because I had Betty Lambeth approach me and tell me she was concerned that Mr. Haas was unable to control himself and was talking about this openly, and she wanted some reassurance um, you know, given to her team about the standard practice and procedure for this, and that was the focus of the meeting. Um, and also, so you can understand, I was only involved in this process for a period of um, maybe one to two weeks. My memory doesn't recall the exact number of days. Um, but as soon as uh, my boss, Kathy Glant, returned, uh, the project was handed over to her and she saw it through from that point on. So my involvement is very limited at the very early stages of this. Uh, but you did ask them at that meeting not to talk about it publicly, is that right? I advised them of the standard procedures and the fact that if they were approached by the press to talk to the Office of Public Affairs, and if anyone had any specific questions, so please address them to, to myself and Mr. Lindsay. Did you think that was a reasonable request of them, given the circumstances? Yes, sir. And uh, uh, did, 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 was Mr. Lindsay present at that meeting? Mr. Lindsay was conference called in. It was, an, it was during a time where it was extremely busy and there was a lot of activity going on and his availability was very, very limited. So did we he, conference called him Did he threaten in. anybody in that conference call? Oh, absolutely not. I never heard Mr. Lindsay make any threats. I see my time has expired. We have a vote on. We'll stand in recess. Let's follow the gavel. <clears throat> Here's our programming schedule. Coming up, we continue with more of Thursday's hearing on Capitol Hill, looking into the recent discovery of subpoenaed White House email. Later this morning, entertainer Dolly Parton talks about literacy issues. After that, a hearing on the fiscal year 2001 budget for the National Endowment for the Humanities. This morning on Washington Journal, a look at the day's news with John Parker, Washington Bureau Chief for The Economist. Also, columnist Thomas Oliphant from the Boston Globe and Betsy Hart of Scripps Howard News Service. That gets underway at 7 Eastern on our companion network, C-SPAN. This morning on our companion network, C-SPAN, a Senate hearing on oil prices and the Clinton administration's response to rising energy costs. You can see live coverage beginning at 10 Eastern. Now the final portion of Thursday's hearing into subpoenaed White House email. The House Government Reform Committee is investigating the discovery of the email, which had not been archived as required by law, and then provided to investigators looking into White House matters. 
The committee, led by Indiana Congressman Dan Burton, heard from the director of the White House Office of Management and Administration. This portion's two hours and 40 minutes. problem is we had a uh, had the speaker of the house making a point of order on the floor dealing with uh, with the chaplain and uh, uh, unfortunately uh, that uh, had to be attended by a lot of the members but now I yield to uh, mr. Souter mr. Souter I thank the, the chairman and I want to make it uh, clear mr. Callahan if I mistakenly say uh, crab to you, please forgive me. I know Mr. Lindsay made that mistake twice in his opening statement as well. Nobody's deliberately trying to make any mistakes. When you get mentally on one track, it's very easy to do that. Um, I wanted to start over and go, uh, you laid out kind of the, how you saw the perspective of the meetings, but I want to go back through some specifics with that. Um, did you, uh, I understand you informed Mr. Lindsay immediately after the first um, meeting with Ms. Lambeth. Uh, was Paulette, Chicon, then Deputy Director, White House Office Administration, present when you informed Mr. Lindsay of the problem? Uh, no, sir. Pa Sorry. Paulette C. Sean was not available at the time. I remember stopping by her office and she wasn't there, and that's when I was able to find Mr. Lindsay. Was anyone else there when you talked to Mr. Lindsay? Would you pull the mic close? Your voice is uh, very soft and it's very difficult to hear you. Thank you. Was anyone sorry, else sir. present when you gave the message to Mr. Lindsay? Not that I recall, sir. Um, did he give you a message to convey back to Miss Lambeth or anybody else who was working there? Did he say, please communicate this to them? Not at that time, sir, no. When you say not at that time, you're saying he didn't give you a message to convey to them at any point? What time would he have told you? I, you've said that a number of times. Mm -hmm. Well, the first time I advised Mr. Lindsay of the problem was the fact that we had yet another email problem. That was the um, first notification, um, which again is not unusual given the fact that email problems were frequent at the Executive Office of the President because of the very poor design of the system and the severe constraints of the hardware. So I had given him the first notification that we had an anomaly, and he basically told me, well, we need to find out what's going on, and, and went through the discussion as mentioned earlier about diagnostics and uh, at that point I left his office at any point um, in future meetings did um, what well, you've maintained that he that you you didn't use did he use the word jail arrested or anything like that I've never heard mr. Lindsay use those words in this code that you said you told the employees about is that mm -hmm. what you refer to it as a, a code it's standard operating procedures. In standard operating procedures, what is that if somebody uh, disobeys you? We didn't talk about disobeying. I just gave instructions to the staff on what the procedures were and articulated to them that if anyone is inquiring from outside the EOP, such as the press, they were to talk with the Office of Public Affairs and refer them to that office. So neither you... To your knowledge, nothing came from Mr. Lindsay or yourself that said if they didn't follow these standard operating procedures, they would have any problems? No, sir. So it was just kind of like being friendly to them and just saying, look, this is the way we do business and do it I that just re-articulated the standard operating procedures, and none of the individuals involved ever came back to me up until what I heard today to even express a concern that they had even felt threatened to begin with. Um, Mr. Lindsay, yes, I sir. assume that's your testimony as well, that, that um, you did not tell uh, Mrs. Callahan uh, that there would be any punishment? A absolutely. There, there was, I had no power to punish. The statement I found very perplexing well, about... Can I interrupt you sure. just a second? None of us are alleging that you or Mrs. Callahan had any, any power to punish. Mm -hmm. uh, you can make a, a threat or an implied threat that someone else can have the power to punish whether or not you do. So I'm not accusing you of, of saying you had the power to punish. The question is, is did you imply back that if any of them leaked this information or let anybody outside or didn't follow standard operating procedures that they could be disciplined? No, they did not. Um, 
Mrs. Callahan again, did you convey a message from any kind of message from Mr. Lindsay to Mrs. Lambeth? The only thing I conveyed was the fact that we needed to go through our diagnostic process. And how do you think they interpreted that? In other words, uh, given the fact um, that you had talked with Mr. Lindsay, you clearly were going up the chain of command uh, and then coming back, uh, how do you think they interpreted that? Uh, and could they have, in fact, felt intimidated by the way it was delivered? Or do you think they just behaved irrationally in their concern? Well, first of all, sir, the, the first interaction was between myself and Ms. Lamb, but the other staff members weren't involved. Uh, and in that regard, I just communicated back to her the need to do the diagnostic activities. It wasn't until after it was brought to my attention that we had an individual on the team, Mr. Hawes, talking about this, uh, and there was hallway chatter going on that the second meeting was prompted. Did Mrs. Uh, Ms. Lambeth request to meet with Mr. Lindsay? She requested a meeting when she talked to you? I'm not aware of that. Um, did she indicate that she wanted a meeting to hear the message directly, any kind of message from Mr. Lindsay? I don't recall that at all. And I, I do want to correct one thing that you had said in the record. You said you, you were confused that uh, because she had uh, given you a present, I think, for your wedding after uh, the period of time where supposedly she felt threatened. Um, uh, Mr. Hawkins communicated to us that he felt she was in your pocket. In other words, in the first panel, he, he was accusing her of being too close to the contracting officer. She said on the record that she wasn't so close to you that it would be dependent. But just to make the record clear, she was hardly viewed by this panel or the members of Congress here or anyone else as hostile to you. Uh, and uh, she was relaying the facts as she heard them, but in fact, she was accused by another witness on the panel of being too close to you and listening to you rather than to her direct supervisor, um, which is a little bit different uh, implication of that. Now, Mr. Lindsay, did, did you ever meet uh, Ms. Lambeth uh, to hear her message or to give any messages to her face to face? I don't have any recollection of a specific meeting with her at all, nor on the normal course of things. The thing to keep in mind is we had over 200 folks who work for the agency. As I mentioned before, we had numerous investigations, we had other matters. I was the general counsel, and frankly, this whole genre was a little bit out of my, my bailiwick. So frankly, my information, or I used the conduits that I had and the people that we'd been able to work with and had a trusted relationship, Laura being one of those people, to act as a conduit and the associate director for information systems. So it would be, uh, it was impractical for me to go and have individual discussions with every single person uh, in a particular matter. In addition to that, uh, I, the because when I talked with Mr. Hawkins at a later date, when he raised an issue of whether or not we were properly acting within the scope of the particular contract, I believed very much that we that it was within scope and their attempts to acquire additional funds to perform this work um, was inappropriate. So we did have those kinds of discussions about those matters. No discussions of intimidation or anything else came up. Uh, I want to I repeat something I said earlier. And one of the difficult things as a member of Congress as we get into this is um, both of you seem to be very skilled public servants. You both seem very nice and very pleasant. The truth is, is so have most people who've been in front of us. Um, this isn't anything personal with anybody, but over, yeah. over time, over five years, we've lost a tremendous degree of confidence in the uh, ability to get truth. And that isn't a reflection on any individual, but we're trying to do our job of getting to the bottom of this. I, I have a very significant degree of respect for the congressional process and what happens based on my experience and the time that I worked here. So I very much respect that and process. And we've had a big conflict over the period of time at hand in 96 to 98. We've had a very difficult time um, with witnesses fleeing the country, with, with trying to pursue that. And both, uh, both of you have talked about how busy you were. And I understand trying to recall conversations when you have multiple investigations going, you don't remember uh, necessarily particular meetings or, or what, you, what was, was, was said at something, but uh, particularly early on. But however, uh, we have a memo that was sent to John Podesta, assistant to the president at that time, deputy chief of staff, from a Virginia Apuzo that appears that they, there's a handwritten note to, to Chuck, who we believe is, is uh, Charles Ruff, 
that's warning them about this and clearly i mean i don't know how often a this kind of memo would go up to this high level in the white house as well as to the legal counsel the white house saying look this could be a super big problem i mean to me the impression i'm getting is is that you had two more important investigations than this one uh where the but is that unusual to have a memorandum go to john podesta saying that arms is a a information system designed to provide comprehensive archives that in fact a lot of these archives aren't there describes a description of it uh why would something like this go to the very top echelons of the white house and his top of his legal team well, I, I can't answer the specific reason as to why the assistant to the president for management administration transmitted that memorandum to the chief of staff. What I can, to the deputy chief of staff, what I can say is that I conveyed this information. You have to understand, I mean, I've, I've practiced law and I understood the circumstances that the folks in the counsel's office were in. And I knew, too, that it, for me to try and act on their behalf in these types of matters was, was inappropriate. I knew what we needed to do is to convey, try to collect the information as soberly and deliberately as we could, and then present that information. And I'll be perfectly frank with you, as soon as we provided this information, I provided it to my superiors, I could put a bit of a sigh of a relief because, frankly, we had conveyed it, and then it was up to them to provide the, particularly the legal folks, to provide the legal analysis based on the information, the evidence, and the materials that they had, which I didn't have access to at that particular time. You're also used to working with politicians, and I think we can all understand that uh, what we heard today is it's not even plausible that there was a backup for most of these incoming emails, which is a limited universe, but critical incoming emails that could have been coming from John Wong or Charlie Tree or the Democratic Committee and, and taken out. And the obvious politicians and the legal attorneys at the White House realized this was a potential nuclear bomb. This isn't just kind of a, oh, this is a little glitch in the computers. This is potentially hundreds of thousands of relevant, uh, not all of them relevant, but buried in that, uh, that may have been, in fact, deleted because there was no longer a backup system to catch it. I have no information to support that supposition. Other than it went to the top echelons of the White House immediately after you'd had a meeting. I know that there was a transmission of that information, but that was in the normal course of things. I met with Chuck Ruff at the council's meeting twice a week, yeah. and we would discuss computer types of issues, and this was the proper form to do it and to convey that to him so that they could make the appropriate determination. The gentleman's time has expired, Mr. Chair. Waxman. Mr. Chairman, I, I'm, I'm surprised and very disappointed to have learned uh, just walking into the meeting a few minutes ago that you have unilaterally disinvited Beth Nolan, the White House counsel, to testify today. She was on the agenda to testify. If the gentleman yield. I, I, I won't yield at this point, but I will okay. when I'm completed. Okay. I'm disappointed because as basic here, a fairness, both to, in treating the minority and in this hearing, we should have Beth Nolan here today to testify. She can give us information about Monica Lewinsky and the emails and to clarify all the innuendo that's been raised. What, what the gentleman Not you? yet. Okay. And for us not to even have been consulted about taking her off the schedule, even if she's going to be invited next week, there's this huge gap where you have out there statements that were made, a lot of confused statements that were made with all sorts of uh, uh, accusations, which I think could have been cleared up and should have been cleared up in the same day at the same hearing. I'll yield to the chairman. I, I, I let, let, let me just say that we have information that we have received about emails involving uh, the vice president, and we had some other information that was conveyed to us today. The staff and I talked about it, and we agreed that rather than have Ms. Nolan come up twice, once today and again next week after we reviewed the vice president issue and the other things that we received today, we thought it would be better for her and for the committee for us to do it all at once. Well, reclaiming my time, I think what's happened, Mr. Chairman, is that you haven't been able to establish your case with any clarity that anybody did anything wrong, and therefore you're trying to find another set of arguments to come in with so you can make some other accusations and then have her answer those accusations. Today we've had testimony from people who said they were threatened. They were told to keep quiet. Uh, uh, we had a witness who said she heard from somebody else about what was in these emails and uh, how, how damaging they were. Of course, that was 
that was contradicted by other testimony, but the person who could give us information that would clarify whether, not whether the emails were on this unified system or not, but whether the emails were actually given to this committee and to the independent counsel was Ms. Dolan, the White House counsel. And I think it's, uh, you may have consulted your counsels, but you didn't consult the minority, and I don't think it was a, 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 an, in, an, a, an, a, uh, an improper way to treat the minority on this committee, and certainly an improper way to conduct a hearing that should be fair. And I think by this action, it's clear that it is not fair. But I want to pursue some questions with the witnesses that are here today, so maybe we can get to some of the facts. Uh, Mr. Lindsay, um, yes, sir. just by way of background, just uh, you uh, summarize your career very quickly in the uh, executive office of the president prior to your current job. I, I've had several posts within the executive office of the president. I started when I left as being working for Congressman Lewis Stokes. I joined the executive office of the president as the general counsel for the office of administration. Uh, in that position, I worked on many legislative matters and legal matters within the Office of Administration, which primarily comprised most of the business functions that went on in providing administrative support to the White House. Uh, after a period of time, I was promoted to be Chief of Staff and General Counsel within the Office of Administration, uh, performed that position for a while, and then was moved to be counselor to, for Senior Counselor for Management Administration within the the White House office, where I worked directly for Ms. Virginia Apuzo, the Assistant to the President for Management and Administration. Uh, at some point after that, the Director of the Office of Administration left, and I was requested by my superior to rejoin the Office of the Administration as its Director because we had pending uh, testimony date before Congress that was coming up. I was familiar with some of the issues, and I was tasked with rejoining the Office of Administration and testifying before Congress, which I, I believe went quite successfully. Is the Office of Administration part of the White House? It is not, sir. It is, the White House office is a separate agency which receives its own appropriation. Does the, it play a political role? The, Does it, the Office of Administration play a political role? No, the, the objective of the Office of Administration is to provide common administrative support for the Executive Office of the President. Most of the people, the vast majority of the people, all but at that time, probably six individuals who worked for the Office of Administration were career individuals who had worked for the administration, administration after administration, and served the presidency and not a particular president. At the time of the discovery of this mail two problem, what was your position at the Office of Administration? I was the Chief of Staff and General Counsel. And how did you learn about this problem? Uh, Ms. Crabtree came to me. And what, me did, what did you do uh, uh, after you learned about the problem? Well, the, the first thing was to gather more information as to what was going on, and I remember asking her to do to look into it a little bit further and providing her with instructions that we need to fix it. We want to get this stuff squared away, whatever it was. I didn't know or have any real detailed understanding of what it was necessary to do that, but I saw as as a administrative manager there that one of the things that was important for me to do, and I saw as part of my duty, is to, at least from the very beginning, push towards resolution of the problem, whatever its scope. There have been allegations that you or, or Mrs. Callahan threatened Northrop Grumman employees, telling them that they could face jail if they discussed the mail problem with anyone. Did you threaten any of these employees? Mr. Waxman, absolutely not. I didn't, and I'm not aware of any threats being made by any government employee to any Northrop Grumman employees. What did you tell the Northrop Grumman contractors? I'll be perfectly honest with you, I don't have a recollection of having specific direction and conversations with them. My conduit for dealing with the contractors were government employees. The contractors did not report to me. They did not provide work reports, none of those things. They all went to the technical staff that was there, and then those technical staff people would then, where appropriate, bring matters to my attention. Did you want to limit the discussion of the problem to the people involved in making the repairs? Absolutely. And was that an attempt to cover up the problem? Absolutely not. Did you instruct them not to tell their managers about the problem? No, I did not. Did you yourself brief Northrop contract manager Steve Hawkins about the problem? Yes, I did. 
Uh, now, after hearing about the email problem, you also specifically instructed that backup tapes containing the non-archived emails be saved. Isn't that right? That is correct, sir. And why did you do that? I did that because my state of knowledge as to the volatility associated with the systems that we had, I wanted to make sure that we made, took whatever steps necessary were there to preserve the information. That's one thing that I saw as a primary responsibility of mine, is to preserve information, to make sure that their records were kept at least in one of those three places where they could reside, on someone's computer, or on the server, on the ARM system, or on backup tapes. I understand you informed senior officials at the White House about the email problem. In fact, I have a June 19th memo to John Podesta, then the Deputy Chief of Staff that you helped draft that describes the problem. I want to ask you about this. Uh, who do you inform at the White House about this problem? Uh, my immediate superior, the director of the Office of Administration, and also Virginia Puzo, who is my boss also, and the assistant to the President for Management and Administration. Did, did you inform the White House Counsel's Office? I was directed by my boss to contact uh, the counsel to the President immediately. And what did you tell them? told him essentially the material or the information that's contained in the memorandum, that there was a glitch with the computer system where incoming emails may not have been collected by the arms records management system. And what was the response of Mr. Podesta and Mr. Ruff, then the White House counsel? Uh, Mr. Podesta's response was just to ask if I'd, con if I'd had any conversation with Mr. Ruff, and frankly, I didn't provide any other briefings or other information for him. I talked with Mr. the counsel to the president at that point afterwards. Did anyone at the White House tell you to hide the problem? Absolutely not. Did anyone at the White House tell you to destroy any emails? Absolutely not. My understanding is that you were requested to perform a test of the system to figure out the extent of the email problem. Is that right? I, I didn't understand it. I didn't take it as a test at that particular time, but I did receive a set of names that were provided to me by folks in the White House Counsel's Office, which I conveyed to our technical folks, and they did perform an analysis of those names, and the results were then provided back to the Counsel's Office for comparison with other documents that have been produced. And, and tell, tell me more about this test. How was it conducted, and what were the results of that test search? And did you think the problem had been fixed as a result of it? Uh, I, I couldn't tell you based on that information. I, I made it a habit as to not to look and review documentary productions from email searches myself. What I did, because we were the custodian of the records, it was not my job to review those records for responsiveness or whatever. We received the search language from this particular case, it was provided directly to me. I conveyed that to my technical staff, and then they performed the search of the information. It was my belief at the time that they conducted the search of a, the database or the information, a manual search as I remember it, outside of the ARMS records management system. Subsequent to that, I've learned that that may not have taken place, but my understanding at that time was that that was the information that was being provided back to me, and I conveyed that to the counsel's office, and then, and then them and only them could actually perform the review and the comparison with what other documents had been produced and what came up with that particular search to check and see if there was a problem. My recollection is that after that was done, um, some time went by, and the word that I got back was that, hey, these are duplicates. Um, it probably isn't that big of a problem because um, this information has already been produced. It was produced by a separate search of individual email systems? That's what I would surmise. Yeah, Thank time you. Has expired. Uh, <clears throat> was the president or the vice president told about the problem, to your knowledge? I, I would have no knowledge of that. Well, Ms. Apuzo is, I guess, one of your superiors? That is correct. Oh. And uh, you don't recall the phone conversation that uh, you had with uh, Ms. Callahan and uh, the people that were in her office. You say you don't recall that phone call. No, I mean, it was over almost two I, I, years yeah, ago. Yeah, I know. You don't mm -hmm. recall the phone call. And yet, just a matter of a couple of days later, uh, you assisted in writing a memo uh, to Mr. Podesta from Mr. Ms. Apuzo about, uh, and it was a pretty com com complex memo going into some detail about the problem, but you don't remember the phone call. I, the, as I said, the conversation on the phone call took place over 
two years, about two years ago, and it was a very short duration but, at but that you, time. But you remember the memo, though? Uh, yes, because I've seen the memo. Yeah. But I'll be perfectly honest with you, when this matter was brought to my attention for uh -huh. the first time, I didn't remember the memo. Okay. Now, I want to make sure I've got all this straight. You don't remember the phone call, and yet five people from Northrop Grumman all sat at that table just a while ago, and they all remember the phone call. Mr. Chairman. Now, let me just finish. Yes. They all remember the phone call. Three of them felt that they were threatened with possible jail. Uh, all five of them said they felt some kind of threat or intimidation from Ms. Crabtree, then Ms. Crabtree, now Ms. Callahan. But she says that never happened and doesn't remember anything like that. That, that just didn't happen. I, I just can't believe that five people would all come here and, and lie because they can't figure out why they would do that. Can you tell me why you think they'd lie to us? Mr. Chairman, I can only speak under oath to those matters for oh, which I, I have knowledge. Yeah. I cannot speak to what was in the content of other people's intent or what their thoughts were at sure. any particular time. How about you? All I do know is what my own conduct was and, and what I did. And you don't recall the phone call? No, I don't. Okay. Mrs. Callahan, can you, can you, you worked with the, these people. In fact, you said that one lady came to your, your wedding and uh, uh, you said that, uh, and she indicated that you were fairly close. In fact, I think the, the supervisor there said that uh, one of the problems he had was that she confided in you too much. So that evidently she, she, she was fairly close to you at some time. Can you figure out why she and all these other four people would lie about that meeting? Well, Mr. Chairman, after listening to the discussions earlier this morning, first of all, I don't recall all five of them saying Three of them that there did. was a threat. Three said that they recall either being threatened or referred to being threatened with jail because the one lady, and I don't recall her name right now, but we can look it up, she said that uh, when she was asked by her supervisor to tell him what was going on, she says, I can't tell you. And he says, well, if you don't, you're insubordinate. And she said, well, I'd rather be insubordinate than go to jail. So she felt like there was some threat there. Uh, Ms. Lambeth said the same thing. And uh, uh, the, what was the gentleman's name? Uh, Mr. Haas said the same thing. So three out of the five alluded to a threat of jail. The other two said that they felt like they uh, had better keep their mouth shut because it was pretty clearly stated to them that uh, that uh, there there might be some their jobs might be in jeopardy. And and if you didn't hear that, then you weren't listening to the same five people I was listening to. So the the, the thing I can't understand is they they all don't recall the jail threat. Three of them pretty much do. Two remember being, uh, feeling intimidated and threatened, but you're saying that none of that happened. Mr. Chairman, uh, what I am saying is what I heard this morning. I heard two people say that they had heard a threat I, and make that allegation. I heard one person start by saying no and then evolved as the day went on into saying yes. And the other two had no feeling of that there being a threat of jail. I also heard Mr. Haas and Ms. Lambeth contradict each other um, as far as what their roles and responsibilities were. That had nothing to do with that phone conversation in that meeting. What we will do for your edification is we will get a transcript of the testimony that took place and I will be happy to send it to you so you'll recall very vividly what they did say. I'm just disappointed that, uh, that, uh, that uh, five people, either five people lied or you are. It's one of the two. I just don't understand this. Mr. Souter. I thank the chairman. Unfortunately, many people were are probably going to watch this and C-SPAN will also be able to see. Um, what I'm uh, confused about here also is, is that uh, I, I want to reconcile something. Mrs. Um, Callahan, did, what did, you, did you tell the contract employees present that they couldn't talk to their supervisors? I instructed the contract employees at the meeting that this was an extremely sensitive situation. All of us were aware of the activities going on in the press at the time, and the fact that there had already been discussions of this brought to my attention, that it was going on in the hallways, was not acceptable, and that our current procedures and our practices at that time were to deal with the issue in a purely technical sense, as it was a technical problem that needed to be resolved, and that's where we needed to put our energy and time and focus and deal with the issue. So the answer is yes. You told them not to talk to their superiors. I told them that if they had any questions, they were to, uh, if anyone approached the them. The answer is yes. Is that not correct? Did you tell them they shouldn't talk to their superiors? Well, their superior was in the room, so 
Um, that was Betty. You wanted Miranda. it limited to just those in the room. Those in the room, yes, Mr. sir. Mr. Hawkins in the room at the time. No, sir. Uh, is not he their superior? Uh, he was Betty Lambus' superior. So you told Betty not to talk to her superior. I don't recall that, sir. You just said you did. I told Betty. You said you wanted limited to that room only. To that room only, but I did not single out Mr. Hawkins. But that um, I, I hope people can realize that one of our frustrations here is is that uh, you're making us answer ask the question so precisely rather than the intent of the question. The intent of the question is: Could people have walked out of that meeting assuming they weren't supposed to talk to their superiors? And the obvious answer is yes, because Mr. Hawkins wasn't in the room. Then you say, well, I didn't ask you precisely that uh, whether I said, did Betty Lambeth get asked? My intention was, is could, would they have gone out of that room thinking that you told them not to talk to anybody outside of that room, including their superiors who weren't present in the room? And if some of them had their superiors present, that certainly uh, answers my, uh, my basic question. Let me ask Mr. Lindsay the same question. Did you tell them, uh, and I know you, you at this point don't recall a lot of the phone conversation, but from you, did you ever imply to any of them that they weren't supposed to talk to their superiors? Did I ever? Y yes. Is that the question? Yes, not at a particular phone call. In other no. words, would they have gotten a feeling from you at any point that they weren't supposed to talk to their superiors or anybody beyond their group? I, I, my recollection of any conversations that I had with people at this time was that my number one objective was to make sure that this problem was resolved, that I got the information so that I could report that information to my superiors so that we understood what was going on. I, I had no particular interest in, not ha in having this matter. Uh, I think Laura's characterization is correct. This was another problem. The problem was to be solved. That's what I wanted to have it done. The technical niceties in terms of how they went about doing it and whether or not Hawkins was involved with it or whether or not 20 other people were involved with it didn't matter to me. As a matter of fact, under the contract, I would have been perfectly happy for the contractor to bring in an expert team of people from the outside who are familiar with the system to solve the problem if they were going to perform that under the contract. I would have been ecstatic let me, to have hey, that Let me happen. ask you a question. Just a minute ago, in answer to Mr. Waxman's question, you said you absolutely wanted to limit it to that group. What's that? You just, you just said a few minutes ago you absolutely wanted to limit it to that group. When Mr. Waxman asked you a question, you said you didn't want the information going beyond you. Quote, I wrote it down. I absolutely wanted to limit it to that group. I wanted the information to be limited, but the definition of group is the group of people who were necessary to solve the problem. That means if Northrop Grumman chose to bring in 20 people who were going to actually solve the problem, that was fine with me. So I would want that, 20, that group of 20 people so to not tell other staff what was going on with that problem. So Mrs. Callahan was incorrect to communicate to them that they shouldn't tell anybody outside that room? I, I don't know what she said to no, them. No, but if she told them that, she was incorrect? To not to tell anybody outside that room? Yeah, that's what she said just a minute ago. I, I don't know what she understood from me at that particular time. That would be inconsistent with my philosophy, and I think I corrected that at a later date when I talked to Mr. Hawkins and made the point very clear to him that I was perfectly willing to entertain or to have people talk about or bring this matter into the question. I asked him to ask me any questions that he wanted to ask me about it. I, it, just, it just wasn't, that portion of it wasn't important. The concern was the conveyance of the information to individuals, as Mr. Uh, Ms. Callahan stated in her testimony to people who are extraneous to resolving the particular matter. Take back to Mrs. Callahan then, since you told me that, uh, for example, you told, um, uh, uh, losing my, uh, to, uh, you told the group that it was supposed to say limit that group and, it, and, and to Mrs., um, sorry, uh, Lamba, is that uh, right, Lambeth, uh, that she wasn't supposed to talk to Mr. Hawkins. Um, didn't you consider, because certainly if it was supposed to be just to that room, that this could present a big problem to anybody in that room in their relationship to their superiors outside that room? Or if, for example, as happened uh, with one of the witnesses, they were called in by Mr. Hawkins and uh, taken over the coals, that you could be putting them in danger of losing their jobs? 
Well, Mr. Sutter, first of all, I communicated to the group the standard practice, and at that point in time, I had known that Mr. Lindsay was going to talk with Mr. Hawkins, and that's where the briefing to Mr. Hawkins occurred. Um, and also, too, you understand, and I think Mr. Hawkins uh, addressed it earlier, that there had been uh, numerous conflicts between Ms. Lambeth and Mr. Hawkins on a regular and routine basis. Because of her closeness to you. The Excuse me? He said because of her closeness to you, he had had conflicts with her. The gentleman's time has, has expired. We'll, we'll, we'll get back to you. Did you have anything? I do. Mr. Waxman. Thank you. Uh, to go back to where I left off, Mr. Lindsay, you found out you got a problem. Yes, sir. You wanted this problem corrected. Uh, sir. And did you think it, it might have been fixed when you heard that they were going to do some test on the individual emails of the computers as opposed to this, um, what do you call it? The, my analysis at the time was this. Arms? There may not have been a legal problem in terms of whether or not documents were produced or whether or not that was completed, but I still had a problem. And that was, I still had a technical staff that reported to me that there was a glitch. Even if that test came back in a positive way, I may not have had a production problem, but I had a technical problem with my email system and my ARM system and how they work together. If that, that was the issue that I needed to resolve. So, at first, some people thought maybe the problem was corrected, but you came to the realization that the ARMS issue wasn't corrected. Well, my technical staff didn't report to me that it was corrected until November of 1998. Um, when did you learn there was a continuing problem with the production of the emails? With the production? Probably, I mean, I don't know of a problem with the production of emails to this day, other than the information that I've received from this particular committee and the concerns that are expressed by the chairman and the members of this committee. I'm not aware, because I'm not aware of, and I haven't seen a technical report from my staff, which has defined what emails were not included in the Armstrong uh, in the arms um, collection system. Until I have that information, I, I could not make a conclusion as to whether or not information was provided or not provided. Well, one of the questions that many of us on this committee have is why it took so long for the White House to notify the committee that some emails may not have been produced. What's your explanation for this delay? I couldn't provide an explanation for that situation other than the fact that I knew that this was a problem that was very complicated. It's one that, that frankly, I didn't completely understand at the time, and it is one where, frankly, Northrop Grumman had sent me a proposal for $600,000 to assess just what the nature of the problem was. So it one was fairly complex. The transmission or the responsibility for transmissioning that information to the committee would be for the council's office or other individuals to do and not for my office and the office of administration to do. Uh, uh, Mr. Hawkins testified that you and he had a, sounded like a heated exchange. What was that all about? Well, I, I worked very closely with Chairman Colby on the, on the uh, Treasury Postal Appropriations Committee. They had made comments to me about the requirements to making sure that appropriated money, we got dollar for value. One of the things that we had done in, in our attempt to retrieve our money from the fence funding is I was very, very open with them in exposing our weaknesses and explaining to them the fact that we had one of the major problems that we had was administering and making sure that we got dollar for value from contractors. And the ad appropriations committee essentially said to me, you know, you need to make sure that you get that kind of value out of the out of the agreements. So frankly, from my perspective, when I had a valid contract with a contractor that I had contracted specifically to manage our email system, and I had a problem with that email system, I believed that the work to correct any problem associate with, associated with that system was within the scope of the contract and their responsibility to correct without additional remuneration. And what was his position? His position was that they re required additional resources. So, so this is a different picture than what we were presented earlier. Absolutely. Mr. Hawkins acted like you were telling him to keep it quiet, but what he was really saying to you is, if you want this system fixed, you have to pay me more money to fix it. Yes. Because 
what the problem that you now found yourself in was outside the scope of the contract absolutely and i believe that it was well within the scope of the contract so and you I were telling them to fix it so you can be sure to have all those emails in this arms uh, set up so that those emails would be available to any committee or any uh, buddy who had the right to get those emails absolutely and he was saying to you well that's your problem buddy we've done what we can do but uh, you have to, it's not within the scope of the contract for us to go back and fix it absolutely and if he had communicated his frustration with me with his superior the president of the company to say that they believe that that I would have no objection to that because I was very much dead set and believed and had been advised by my counsel's office in the office of administration that this work was within the scope of the contract and taxpayers should not have to pay more money to have this problem corrected. Um, I, I don't know enough about the fight between Mr. Hawkins and Ms. Lambeth, but it sounds like he was angry at her for not telling him that there was going to be more work to do and he wanted her to tell him there might be more work to do so that he could say that there wasn't, that wasn't part of the contract and they would have to renegotiate the contract. Do you know anything about that? I, I really don't. I do, I do remember that there, were, there was friction between the two, but I don't have any other recollection uh, about what specifically was the basis between the differences between those two individuals. Mr. Callahan, uh, you don't look very menacing to me. If um, I said to you, can I tell my wife about this problem on the emails, say back to me as fiercely as you possibly can, if you do, you're going to have a jail cell with your name on it. I can't even say that, sir. I don't behave that way. I guess but I... Even if you said it, I must tell you, I don't think I'd be too afraid of you. But that's my own subjective uh, sense of you as a, as a witness and these other people who seem in their testimony say they were terrified that they may go to jail. Um, but they also said, not only were they terrified they were going to go to jail, but they understood that you wanted the problem fixed and they were trying to work with you to fix it. Was that your understanding of what was happening when the problem was discovered? Yes, sir, that's my understanding. It was very imperative to us that we find out what the size and the scope of the problem was and it was critical that we figure out what we needed to do to fix it. Let me just give you an opportunity. Is there anything you want to say? Anything you think we, we, we need to know about from this hearing and all the things that have been talked about today? Any points you think uh, that you should uh, bring out mm -hmm. to us? Well, there are a couple things I would like to address. Um, pertains Let me extend that to both the uh, witnesses. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, in regards to Mr. Sauter's concerns, um, there was a tremendous amount of friction between Ms. Lambeth and Mr. Hawkins, and it, it was, it may have been perceived by Mr. Hawkins as a relationship with myself and with Ms. Lambeth. However, if, uh, I believe if you talk with them specifically and look at the record, there was numerous different occurrences that prompted their friction. Uh, Ms. Lambeth had confided in me that she was pursuing EEO action against Mr. Hawkins, and this was all happening prior to the anomaly being discovered. Um, in addition to that, um, as far as being in, in, in I, think, I think you might have referred to it as being in somebody's pocket, um, I, I am uh, quite frankly a career civil servant and I'm not in anybody's pocket. Um, never have been and I never plan to be nor will I ever put myself in that position. And as far as Miss Lambeth attending my wedding, I was very happy to see her, and there had never been any acknowledgement of her f being threatened or fearful of me prior to when I read it in the Washington Times. Um, and also, just for fairness, too, Mr. Hawkins attended my wedding shower on September 3rd as well. The only Lizzie, thing that you want to add? Most certainly. The only thing that I would like to add is that uh, I worked very, very hard as general counsel to try and create the institutions within the ex executive office of the president and when in the office of administration so you'd have safety valves for people if they did feel uncomfortable through our EEO office. One of the things that we did is we elevated the EEO office from within human resources to its own division so that it would have its own ability to be able to stand on its own so individuals would be able to go and communicate any kind of concerns that they had with them quite freely. The EOP security office was also there where individuals could have raised issues or concerns about any kind of threats or intimidations or fear. 
both of those offices are run by career staff who frankly spent more time working in other administrations than working in this particular administration. I did everything I could to create that kind of environment where they could feel free to do it. There was no information, absolutely nothing that came to me, my boss, or anyone else who was around me who reported to me that Mrs. Callahan's conduct was inappropriate or that that I had done something that was inappropriate because the first thing that I would have done at that particular time if it would pertain to me is I would have handed it over to the EOP security office and asked them to do an investigation as to what was going on. And the reason why I would have done that so readily is not only do I believe as a matter of principle it's the correct thing to do, but I didn't fear what was happening because I knew that I didn't say or do anything wrong in that respect. That time period is one where there are lots of difficulties in addressing the Y2K issue and working out our relationship, the bad relationship that we had with Congress. I believe that that was completed within the spirit of what I truly believe in terms of the respect that I have for this institution and for the institution which I worked over there. And I was very proud of the fact, and I think if you were to go and talk to uh, folks, on the Republicans on that committee, I think that they would say, and if you look at the transcript of my testimony, that they believed that I was very forthright and direct with them. And so one of the things that pains me the most in this process is the fact that my reputation, which I worked very hard for, is being sullied by these kinds of charges. I can't provide you with an explanation for what would motivate people to say those kinds of things about me, but all I can tell you is what I do know, and that they are indeed false. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman, has expired. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Uh, point of personal privilege. Uh, Gentleman will state his point of personal uh, privilege. Mrs. Callahan uh, made a reference to something I said, and I wanted to make sure the record was clear. I never accused her nor did anybody else of being in anyone's pocket. The, the charge was is that uh, that someone else was in your pocket. I, miss, I keep forgetting the witness names. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm sorry. Um, that um, and that if she was in fact confiding in you that she was going to possibly sue her superior, I think that kind of proves uh, to some degree to him today why he thought that. But nobody was accusing you of being anybody's pocket uh, in that sense, and if that was misunderstood, I apologize. Thank Mr. you, Barr. I appreciate that. Would, would the gentleman yield to me briefly? Briefly, certainly. Thank you. Uh, I have just a couple of questions. Uh, Mr. Hawkins said that uh, he went to a meeting and uh, they were talking about this issue and uh, Shut the clock off until this is. is it, would you like to comment, Mr. Well, I, Mr. Chairman, just so we have a clarification, and you should start again. I thought we were doing three ten-minute rounds and then five-minute rounds each. Are we doing? Are doing something else? Are we giving everybody ten minutes? If so, we ought to have what the rules are. But this is what we were told on our side was the agreement. Uh, if we'll we give had, you ten minutes, Mr. Waxman. What is your understanding of how you're going to conduct the hearing? The understanding was that we we're going to do 10-minute rounds on this, uh, this. Every every side, each side will get, or each that, member. That was my understanding on this this time, yeah. And and that is unlimited rounds. Well, I don't think we have too many more rounds to go. Well, that's what you want to do. Go ahead and do it. But yeah, that wasn't you. what we were told. We also were told that Beth Nolan would testify, and then that was yanked from the agenda without our approval or even in, in, even being advised of it. Thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Waxman, I explained the issue of Beth Nolan. You can continue to beat on that horse if you want to, but uh, we've explained it. Now, Mr. Hawkins said at a meeting that you told him, Ms. Uh, Callahan, that everything was fine before you stepped in. Did you say that? No, sir. So. I worked with Betty Lambeth so, on the so, situation. Okay, but, but you said everything was fine. He said that you said everything was fine until you stepped in, referring to Mr. You didn't say that. No, sir, I don't understand. So, so not only not only are the five people lying that testified earlier about what was said at that meeting, but also when Mr. Hawkins talked to you separately at a meeting, uh, you didn't say that. So he's lying as well. I did not have a meeting separate with Mr. Hawkins. Did you ever meet with Mr. Hawkins? I worked with Betty Lambeth. Did you never met with Mr. Hawkins? Mr. Hawkins worked with Mark Lindsay and Paulette Seashaw. Did you ever meet with Mr. Hawkins? Not on this issue. Did you ever meet with Mr. Hawkins? There may have been a few occasions during my year there. Hey, did you ever say to him everything was fine until you stepped in? No, sir, I don't So Mr. That. Hawkins is lying. 
and the other five people are lying. And you're telling the truth. All five of them and Mr. Hawkins are now lying. Mm -hmm. Now, let me, let me uh, ask uh, you a question, yes, sir. Mr. Lindsay. You said everybody wanted the problem fixed. That was two years ago. Yes, sir. Two years ago. Yes, sir. We had a subpoena out in 1997, 98, and 99, all pertaining to various investigations that these emails would be relevant to or could be relevant to. Now, you said you want, everyone wanted the problem fixed, and here we are today still at ground zero. Nothing's being done. Why is that? Uh, first off, I would beg to differ, Mr. Chairman, with the characterization that nothing is being done. A lot was done. One of the first steps in the reconstruction process was to fix the glitch in the first place. And I will tell you this, I was not uh, happy or glad that it took from June until November to fix the glitch. I would have liked for that glitch to have been fixed a lot sooner. Uh -huh. The reason why that date in November is very significant is that in November, that very same month, we received the money that we needed to engage in our, in our activities but, but, for Y2K. We, we, we are now at March, middle of March, late March of, of the year 2000. The documents that we have requested or demanded in our subpoenas, as well as the independent counsel and the Justice Department, have not been given to us. So the problem has not been solved. We don't have those do documents. I think we're talking about two different problems. I don't think so. The legal problem of producing the documents that you're looking for, I have no knowledge of what information was provided to you. So I could not testify or provide information to you as to whether the information that is in question was provided or not provided. You said that everyone wanted the problem fixed, and yet Mr. Barry, in his emails that we quoted from today, said he was frustrated. He testified today. He was frustrated because he had contacted, I guess, you and others, saying, hey, this thing's got to be fixed. It's a mess. I don't have any recollection of Mr. Barry communicating with me about that, but I, I, I shared and share his frustration with mm -hmm. the fact that it wasn't fixed at a more expedited fashion. I, would, I had every desire that, that that would happen. I had every desire and would have welcomed the contractor bringing in whatever the best and the brightest was in their company to address this problem. But we handed the resolution of this issue so to our contractor. So you the best and the brightest, whoever they were, you would be happy to have them brought in. And yet Ms. Crabtree, now Ms. Callahan, told them not to tell anybody, especially their superiors, about the problem. It's my understanding of Ms. Callahan's testimony is that she believed that I would communicate with their superiors, and I did. And you did? Absolutely. And that's why she said, don't tell anybody about this. I don't, I don't want you telling anybody about this, especially your superiors. Like I said, her understanding, as I recollect her testimony, was that I would communicate with their superiors, which I did. I not only had communications with those particular individuals, but I had communications and received a letter, it's a September 16th letter, I believe, uh, which made reference to this particular matter, which showed that they had knowledge and information about the whole thing, essentially well, raising the same issue again the about bottom payment. Line is we subpoenaed documents three, over three years ago. Uh, relevant documents are probably and possibly in those, or possibly in those emails. You've known about this, and Ms. Callahan has known about this now for almost two years, and nothing has been done or delivered to the Congress of the United States. And when the people who are charged with the responsibility of dealing with this problem testified, they testified that they were threatened about keeping their mouths shut, and yet you folks don't remember anything about it. You don't remember the phone call. She says the five people are lying, plus Mr. Hawkins is lying. Mr. I Chairman. just tell you, it just, it just boggles my mind that you can't remember a phone call. She says the other six people are lying, and this was two separate incidents. You know, it just it stretches credulity. Mr. Chairman, my recollection is extremely vivid on the fact that I wanted to have the problem resolved. My recollection is very vivid with the fact that I did convey the, this information to the appropriate individual. Yes, you did. My you information... Did. You, you, you did. You, you don't remember the phone call, but within just two days after that, you sent a memo or participated in writing a memo to uh, Mr. Podesta 
uh, giving him all the details. And I can't, that's why it just boggles my mind. You can't remember that phone call. Well, I remember conversations, and I certainly remember it from the time I worked on the Hill. When Congressman Stokes had a conversation with me, who was my superior, I remembered it. There are plenty of other people who may have come through the office that I may not have had a specific recollection of. And if you were to ask me of the many hundreds or thousands of conversations that I had with individuals during that particular time period, I would not be able to necessarily provide you the details of those conversations. There were numerous, and there were plenty that were very, very important. We, we, we understand. Mr. Barr. Thank you. Uh, both of you um, went on at some length uh, uh, telling us about uh, awards and background and so forth, and I might have missed this. Do either of you have a, a law degree or a legal background? I do. Okay. Uh, Ms. I Callahan, uh, are these lawyers with you? They haven't been identified, and they've been rather quiet. Are, are they lawyers uh, with you? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, who are they, and who has retained them to be here today? Mr. Lindsay? Uh, Peter Kadzik, and I retained him to be Personally? here today. Yes, sir. And Ms. Callahan, who's this gentleman? This is Mr. Ralph Lodkin, and I retained him personally. Okay, thank you. Uh, you may, you may, Mr. Lindsay, be familiar with sort of a common misperception. You may not, uh, uh, Ms. Callahan, but for example, one of the statutes in Title 18, which is the U.S. Criminal Code on Obstruction of Justice, uh, is entitled Tampering with a Witness, Victim, or an Informant. Uh, and there's a common misperception that there has to be a specific legal proceeding pending so that when a person who might be charged with obstruction uh, tells a person not to tell somebody something or intimidates them in some way not to disclose information or a document or to alter or destroy or mutilate or conceal any documents, uh, that there has to be, in order for obstruction to occur, a specific legal proceeding within the context of which that tampering is, takes place. That's not the case. Uh, so if anybody's advised you that uh, there's been no obstruction here simply because there may not have been a specific request pending for these particular documents at the time, uh, that's not true. Uh, and we do have evidence uh, that uh, you all uh, indicated to persons not to share information, not to disclose information, to withhold information. Now we're arguing, as your administration is very, very adept at parsing words, uh, was a person in the room? Uh, did a specific representation or admonition be directed to a particular person at a particular time or to a group of people? Uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, that there is evidence that both of you uh, told uh, individuals, some of whom were here earlier today, to say nothing to anybody else without your explicit authorization, uh, that you were prohibited from disclosing information to other people, uh, that you were to write down as little as possible relating to uh, this matter, uh, not to work on networked uh, computers or to send further emails. Uh, and one question that came to my mind in reading the background of this case and listening to the testimony today, uh, the independent counsel is certainly not an employee, an employer, or supervisor of these people. Uh, neither was uh, or is Mr. Burton, the chairman of this committee. Uh, neither is Mr. Hyde, who chaired the impeachment proceedings. All of those things were ongoing. There were consideration of impeachment proceedings. There was this committee conducting a series of investigations. The Office of Independent Counsel, Judge Starr, was conducting a well-known investigation of these very matters about which brings us here today. And. Mr. Barr, I'm not. the uh, time of the uh, gentleman from Indiana that was yielded to you has expired, and I'll recognize you now for 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the fact of the matter is that it does appear that steps were taken to limit very severely information surrounding a very serious glitch in the White House computer system. 
that related specifically to matters well known to be under investigation by at least three different bodies namely the office of independent counsel this committee and the judiciary committee and notwithstanding the fact that any one of those particular proceedings might not have been pending at the time although the work of the independent counsel certainly was pending at that time that you all took steps according to testimony which you dispute I understand that you are disputing the testimony of other witnesses just as much under oath as you are today and this is this is disturbing to us and frankly to say that all of this is simply to be sloughed off as a I think that you're all one of y'all's quote was a major infrastructure problem or because there were just too many hearings up here that occupied your time and it might have been a little confusing to deal with this or to remember something relating to this or and this is the granddaddy of them mr. Lindsay apparently saying that Hawkins was trying to extort money from you or something it was far from extortion he was exercising his rights which were perfectly legitimate and I did not have an objection to him making the claim that this was outside the scope of the contract that was 100% of his percent of its of his rights to exercise no argument with him as to y'all y'all agree famously we didn't agree on the conclusion he had a perfect and 100% right to make the assertion that he did and to communicate and to get whatever support from his counsel at Northrop Grumman or whatever superior you wanted to make that particular assertion and I do not argue with him on that point one iota okay let me go back to the earlier testimony and I know we've gone over this but I think it bears going over again both of you instructed the employees that we've heard from today to say nothing about this matter without your explicit authorization is that correct that's not correct I gave that you just be a mission Callahan to no I'm just I'm just that you dispute that yes okay the others are lying and you're telling the truth is your testimony today I can only testify about information which I know about I cannot testify about what the state of mind or what their intentions are in saying whatever they're saying I know the truthfulness background of what I said ever miss Callahan you did you instruct these individuals not to say anything to anybody without your explicit authorization I instructed the individuals to follow the current practice that was in place at the time which was to focus on the issue at hand and get to the word did you instruct these individuals not to say anything without your explicit authorization I instructed them to refer questions to me you can answer no I want a yes or no that's all did you did you instruct these individuals to say nothing about this matter without your explicit authorization no I did not okay very nice did you both of you or either of you specifically prohibit them from disclosing these matters or any matter any information relating there to to co-workers or spouses miss Callahan yes or no did you so instruct them no sir I just instructed him on the procedures mr. Lindsay no I did not sir okay did either of you instruct these individuals or any of these individuals collectively or individually to not write any information down or as little information down on a record about these matters did you instruct anybody along those lines mrs. Callahan no sir okay and mr. Lindsay okay did either of you indicate to anybody not to work on any networked computers or send any further emails relating to this project no sir miss Callahan no sir okay neither of you though I presume instructed these individuals to be as forthcoming and truthful as possible if anybody asked them about any of these questions or are you going to go so far as to say you encourage them to talk about your statement is anybody any of these individuals not anybody I mean they would have any of these individuals that we're talking about here today mr. Lindsay what I wanted them what I the information that I conveyed to mr. Hawkins or the Northrop Grumman leadership and to Laura was that the individuals who needed to have information about this matter to solve the problem I had no problems with them communicating with it what about it what about at the independent council had asked about it or a congressional committee 
I've got no objection whatsoever. They had, they were perfectly free, and there was nothing at all that I could do if, if, or would if, do to stop them we, from communicating. If we believe that. you, excuse me. If we believe you, that you, that you did not do any of these other things, which I, the witnesses have said that you did. The truth is, is that I would not have had within my power or uh, stop them or had any means to stop them from communicating with whomever they wanted to communicate about the work that they had. It was my desire that they communicate this information to those individuals who were necessary to solve the problem. It was my hope that they would respect that in the interests of the individuals who could possibly be harmed by sharing of this information and idle gossip. What idle gossip are we talking about? I didn't know we were talking about idle gossip. If someone were to say or to convey that, hey, your name showed up on this particular list, and this is what emails, this is what information was contained I really in don't emails. think that that's what we're talking about here at all. Uh, we're talking about something a little bit more systematic than, I, than, than idle gossip uh, here. Uh, what we're talking about here uh, is a serious problem with a computer system that appeared to technical individuals charged with responsibility for it uh, was missing perhaps a great deal of information. Uh, I don't think we're talking about idle gossip, and I, and I really don't think that that's what these individual, individuals came away from, that you simply told them not to engage in idle gossip. My testimony was and continues to be that I have no, have no, had no, will have no objection to them communicating to any individuals no, no, and, that are necessary and to resolve the problem. Forgive me if I say, you know, that, that's all fine to talk about that today, uh, but there is testimony under oath on the record that is quite contrary uh, to that. Uh, and uh, uh, the fact is, I mean, I know you all keep saying this, that simply because you had no legal authority to fire somebody or to terminate a contract, therefore, of course, you couldn't have even made such a statement. I mean, that's, that's just not, That's not the only reason, sir. I didn't say that that was the only reason. Uh, what I'm saying is both of you all have made those statements, and, and uh, they're absolutely meaningless. People make threats all the time, even though they may not be in a legal position to carry out those threats or have the legal authority or power to do it. But uh, thankfully for federal prosecutors, that is not required uh, under the obstruction statute. You don't have to actually have the power to follow through on your threats or the legal authority to do so to be uh, to be guilty of obstruction. Sir, the and, and obstruction statutes wouldn't be the reason why I wouldn't do it. The, the, my my uh, moral code again, I, I would be the in, reason why I wouldn't like do it. Just like you can't get into the minds of the other witnesses, I can't get into your mind. So, I mean, certainly I, uh, that, that's, I hear what you're saying, and, and they're very self-serving statements, and they're delivered very eloquently and repetitively, and I understand that. But my concern, as a, uh, perhaps as a former prosecutor and somebody that uh, unfortunately had to spend a great deal of time over the last two years looking uh, at these uh, obstruction statutes uh, that uh, were faced with a situation very similar to some of the uh, uh, considerations we looked at in the, the fact situations that we looked at in the Judiciary Committee, uh, where uh, there is pressure uh, brought to bear on people with information that is or might be relevant uh, to an investigation or an official proceeding. And it's not idle gossip, Mr. Lindsay. What we're talking about here are matters involving people of interest to the Office of Independent Counsel, to an impeachment proceeding of this House, and to the oversight responsibilities of this committee. These are very serious matters. Absolutely, uh, And sir. when we're faced with several witnesses who state under oath, both in court proceedings and before this body, uh, that there was pressure, that there were threats made, and we hear that from several different people, we're not going to disregard it just because you all come in here with very long pedigrees that, that you tell us about and expect us to think that just because you have all these degrees and have all these awards and some people came to your weddings that none of this ever happened. Uh, we, we're going to look at it a little more carefully than that. I would hope, I mean, I, I believe that there is more than that that supports what I'm saying and what Ms. Callahan is saying. I believe that the record is replete with examples of 